All right, all right. All right. Hello, Patrick. Good morning, Luke. How are you, man? Doing well. I'm ready to roll for another day. And the Let's 30 do it. plus companies we're going to hear from today. Yes, 30 plus companies. We've got some cool, cool content today. Um, yesterday, we covered cancer. We covered COVID. Today, it's all new stuff. Unmet medical needs, emerging and innovative therapies, right? This is, this is going to be your, your psychedelics companies, your cannabis companies, all medical related, of course, um, and, and a whole slew of other stuff. I got to shout out the guy in the chat right now, Luke. L Money is his uh, or her, I guess I should say, um, moniker. And they're asking if this is the Bazooka Festival. The Bazooka Festival. So, I mean, yeah. Why not? We'll be the Bazooka Festival, but but Benzinga is our name, yeah. But Bazooka Festival, sure. Why not? And, and, and I'll pick up on that and and say everybody who's here today, you know, we're we, we're doing this for for you guys, right? As much as Patrick and I enjoy the content, yes. you know, we we we're, we're going to hear from sixty companies over over the two day period, but we're doing this for you guys. So so make sure you take advantage of it. If you're on the event platform, make sure you, you go into the networking section, set up the one-on-one -on -one meetings, really ask the questions you need to know to, to understand these companies, understand the investment, et cetera. If you're hanging out with us on YouTube, drop, drop your questions into the comment section. We're here for you. We're going to pull them out. We're, we're going to ask the companies so we can all make some very informed decisions. Yeah, and, and today's the day to do that, right? Because there's there's going to be companies up here that maybe you've heard of, right? Tickers that are, are doing very well, have a lot of volume, but there's going to be folks that, that maybe you don't know about yet, right? And you're going to want to know where they are in their clinical trials, what the timelines are, what the, the upcoming catalysts are going to be. So ask those questions. I'll do my best to moderate those questions to the companies as they come through, but I'd love to hear from each of you, right? Uh, we, we'd love to know what you want to hear from these CEOs that are presenting today. Yep, absolutely. Um, and, and Patrick, I, I think it's time for me to do my notepad tip. Yep. All right. Yep. Uh, uh, especially for, for the retail crowd out there with me. Um, but I have one recommendation every event we do. It's have the legal pad out, have the pen ready. Uh, because again, we're going through 30 companies today, just today between now and nine o'clock Eastern, 3 p.m. Eastern. That's quick. Make sure you're jotting them down. Put the tickers down. We'll have them in the chat section so you, so you can do more research. Uh, you know, we'll have the videos chopped up so you can go back to them. But as you're hearing things that are interesting, you want to know, hey, here's where I do more research. Here's ideas that I want to share, et cetera. Have it ready because I'm telling you, I've, I've tried before. You're not going to remember it all off the top of your head. I've, I've you tried won't. many times. You failed. won't. It's going to be great. And, and the, listen, the good thing, too, is that this footage will be available after the fact for, for you guys. But here's the thing. When it comes to this particular conference and why we're bringing this to you, it's because we think some of this information will be timely as well. Right. So so keep that in mind as you're watching today. There will be things. There'll probably be some announcements that come out today um, and would certainly love for you guys to be aware of those as you listen to the content today. But listen, here's a few few tickers that, um, you know, just to prime the pump and get you guys ready for today, right? One panel specifically, I, and there's gonna be several of them, one panel specifically I'm really excited about, right? Because this is a really hot topic. It's a Nash panel and somebody, it might be Luke uh, moderating this, right? We've got Hepion, H-E-P-A. We've got Excella Health, A-X-L-A. But that is a really, really hot topic uh, in biotech right now. And I'm excited to hear those companies dive in. Um, on the cannabis side, Clever Leaves, CLVR, Avacana, AVCNF, Psychedelics, you've got NovaMind, NVMDF, CyBio, PSYB, uh, a whole slew, Amrite Pharma, huge company, AMYT, uh, and Vivos Therapeutics. They were on our show the other day. I know you guys know them, VVOS. So um, obviously tune in, you guys. This is going to be a really, really cool day. Yeah, and, and so there's a point that I brought up yesterday, and I, and I want to reiterate it because I think it's important, is what, what's neat about this event in particular, or this topic rather, right? We're, we're talking biotech today. And again, today is all things emerging, right? Yesterday was cancer uh, and COVID treatments. T today, it's, it's all new technologies, new treatments, et cetera. And, and what I think is especially compelling 
is is there sort of two two sides to the coin here, right? You you on on one side you, you have companies that are solving the world's problems. I mean, major major health issues that that a lot of them don't have any treatments right now, or or, or treatments that exist aren't very effective. And then on the other side, right? I, I start my morning every single day. The first thing that I look at is what are the biggest gaining and losing stocks of the day. Um, it's always the, the these biotech stocks. I mean, these always. are the, the 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 companies where hey. If, if they get good data out, uh, if they get a big FDA decision, et cetera, they, they start moving. So two sides here, uh, especially important. And I think, you know, why, why it benefits us to pay attention to the space. Absolutely. And so, so half the day is, is obviously education. You know, we want to get these, these companies and their stories in front of you guys so that you can make informed decisions. Um, and the other part of it is just making sure that we're evaluating these companies properly, right? We'll go through, you know, how do you diversify your portfolio? How are you looking at these FDA announcements? Those are the questions I'd love to hear in the, in the chat, right? So we can pose them. These, these companies are going to help educate us, right? They're going to let us know, hey, this is the best way to look at, you know, if we're in a phase one trial or phase three or late stage, early stage, here's what it means. Here's what those catalysts are in between. What can sometimes be a very long period of time right before that data comes back. So um, it's, it's going to be interesting to hear from the hear from the horse's mouth. Yeah. And, and, and throughout the day sprinkled in where we are going to have uh, tidbits of education, right? You're going to hear from people who, who trade these stocks, who, who invest in these companies professionally. It's where they specialize in and, and they'll be sharing, you know, hey, here are things that I learned along the way. Here are opinions that I have, et cetera. Again, notepad, you need it. I'm telling you, uh, along with all the company presentations that, that we're going to have. Yes. Yes. And listen, guys, Benzinga is here to do exactly this, right? We want to inform. We want to educate. Those of you who listen to our live stream shows um, or, or read our content on Benzinga.com, you know that this is what we're here for. We're here to provide information, connect you to the companies who are moving uh, and, and making news. So, so that's the entire point of being here today. Uh, Luke, you know, what, what about Benzinga Pro? What about the folks who may not know about Benzinga Pro? Anything that uh, that we should say about that? Yes, always, Patrick. You you know that that I'll take any chance to plug and run with it. I can't. I help figured myself, you would. Okay? I figured you right, would. That, that that's the deal. Um, but guys, ch check it out. Pro.benzinga.com, P-R-O.benzinga.com. That is your real-time news solution. So, so if you're active and you're trading, uh, you, you want to catch news as it's happening. You, you, know, you want to see the Benzinga news team break stories. Uh, you you want to see real-time alerts of, of key things that are being said at this conference and other events, right? Not non-Benzinga events. Pro.benzinga.com. There is your solution. Two-week free trial. I, I like to say nothing in the markets is guaranteed, but you know, hey, if you don't like it after two weeks, it's guaranteed you don't have to spend anything. So there's no reason not to give it a go. There you go. Right. There, there's your plug, Patrick. Your friendly Benzinga Pro plug. Thank you, Luke, for that. Reminder, you guys, just one more bit of housekeeping here. Uh, those of you in, in YouTube, obviously, you're, you're going to jump in the comments and, uh, and throw your, your questions there. Um, those of you in the networking platform today, the chat is on the bottom right of your screen, right? If you're, if you're looking at the session and watching the video, uh, throw your questions in there. We've got some great moderators in that chat that will let, uh, that will let me know and Elliot on, on the other track uh, if there are interesting questions coming in. So please, please, please do use that um, and, and jump on there and take some one-on-one -on -one meetings with, with these companies. Yep. And, and, and before we, we introduce our first speaker of the day, Patrick, again, I'm, I'm just going to remind everybody, you know, today is, is, is all about new, right? It, 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 it's new treatments, it, it's innovative technologies, it, it's things that, that really we have not seen at a wide scale commercially in the world yet. Uh, there, there are two tracks. If, if you're right here with, with Patrick and I right now, uh, that this, this is innovative and emerging technologies, uh, and, and then track two, unmet medical needs. That's great, man. And so what, without further ado, why don't we go ahead and introduce uh, our keynote speaker this morning. Uh, I, I'm really excited about this. Um, th this person has been featured on CNN and the Joe Rogan Experience, the Daily Beast, the founding executive director of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, um, the New York Times best-selling author of The Immortality Key, The Secret History of the Religion with No Name. This is Brian Murarescu. Brian, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? 
How's it going, Captains of Industry? Oh, pretty good. Captains <laughs> of Industry, too. I mean, look, I mean, thanks, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, it. Well, it's a Thursday. It's a Thursday. Yeah, well, listen, any day that we can start with Captains of Industry, I'll take it. All right, Brian, we'll, we're going to let you take it away, my friend. We're excited to hear from you. I'm sure the audience is, too. If you guys have questions, throw them in the chat. Otherwise, Brian, take it away. Sure. Um, so, hello, everybody. Um, I wrote a book about drugs. And I'm going to talk about drugs for about 15 minutes until Patrick pulls the mic. But I just want to stress, I am an ordinary human being. I had a real job at some point. Um, I went to Brown undergrad and Georgetown Law School. I started my career on Wall Street at Millbank Tweed as a structured finance attorney and later moved to Washington, D.C., uh, two blocks east of the White House, um, and got into development financing, microfinance, and more structured finance. So with all that as a quick proviso, um, I took time out of my practice and my career to write a pretty thick book about drugs and went on Joe Rogan's show uh, to launch it. So without further ado, um, and with all due respect to the novelty and the innovation of today, my book very much stands for the proposition that the human relationship with drugs is not just old, not just ancient, but I would say perhaps um, archaic. Um, and I put this all together um, and I'll open my slides here for you so we can take a look at it together. I'm assuming we're sharing and people can see this and I'm going to start presenting the immortality key. Um, so this came out in September of last year. One of my favorite quotes to date is there at the bottom from a podcaster based in Texas. Um, it might be too early for profanity. So I'll just read the first part of his quote. Absolutely. One of the most fascinating podcasts I've ever done. Uh, for me, one of the most fascinating conversations. Um, before we head into the antiquity, and what I dug up over the past 12 years of my life, um, I'll do credit to Johns Hopkins, Roland Griffiths, Matt Johnson, and the team at the Hopkins Center for Psychedelics and Consciousness Research uh, in Baltimore. Uh, Matt Johnson uh, very kindly shared this with me. So I could just offer a very brief state of the psychedelic union for you. I know we're talking about all kinds of novel therapies and um, you know, no disregard to MDMA, which is in phase three, but just as a quick snapshot of psilocybin, for example, you probably know that clinical trials have been happening not only at Hopkins, but NYU, UCLA, UCSF, um, and elsewhere, obviously internationally. Psilocybin, the active compound in magic mushrooms, has been given breakthrough therapy status by the FDA. And, you know, all anticipation is that sometime in the next few years, you are going to see the first FDA approved psilocybin medication for perhaps a range of conditions. It could start with depression, for example. Um, there have been trials on cancer-related anxiety and depression specifically. One of my favorites came out in 2016 in, in the Journal of Psychopharmacology. Uh, but you know, Matt and the team there are also looking into psilocybin and its effects on things like addiction, tobacco addiction, alcoholism, demoralization, and AIDS survivors, um, all kinds of things. And, and which, which for me always raised a very big question. Why does this one compound, psilocybin, why is it proving so very effective at treating a very diverse range of conditions? What does the future hold for mental health is, is an obvious question. But, you know, since I was trained in antiquity and ancient languages, things like Latin and Greek and Sanskrit, and the things that did not premier, uh, prepare me for Wall Street, but the things that always kind of kept me busy and up late at night, I asked a different question. I was asking, is what's happening today in these clinical settings, does it have any relationship to what may have happened in deep prehistory and in antiquity? And so my journey really starts in the 1970s with the man right there, Carl Ruck. So instead of giving a, a big dog and pony show about my book, I'm gonna tell one story about Carl. Carl's a friend of mine, he's 85 years old. He was educated at Harvard and Yale um, and was the chair of the classics department in 1978. You can see him there at the bottom left when he was just a couple years older than I am now. Um, and together with the two gents and their spectacular ties on the top left, Gordon Wasson and Albert Hoffman, Albert who actually discovers LSD in the 1930s, they released this incendiary book, The Road to Eleusis. And they claimed that the answer to the best kept secret in history 
was actually a psychedelic potion full of magic drugs. Specifically, they claimed that the ancient Greeks used drugs to find God at sort of like the Vatican of the ancient world, which was called Eleusis, hence the road to Eleusis. Eleusis was not some random place. It was the, 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 the premier sanctuary of the ancient Greek world. It welcomed people like Plato, Pindar, Aristotle, Sophocles, all the way into the Roman world. Marcus Aurelius, the great Stoic, the great philosopher, was an initiate into these mysteries that took place at Eleusis, which I often describe as the real religion of the ancient Greeks. What does this have to do with anything? What you're looking at right there is ergot. And ergot, for those who don't know, and those beautiful purple mushrooms that it blossoms, ergot is where Albert got LSD. This is where LSD comes from. It's a natural fungus that grows on the grain as you can see on the right hand side of the screen. And so when we think about psychedelics, we think about magic mushrooms and we think about DMT, the tryptamines. We think about phenethylamines like mescaline, which you can find in peyote. Um, but let's not overlook the ergolines. So it's not just LSD. There are dozens of potent alkaloids you can find in that funky fungus right there. And my friend Carl's hypothesis all the way back in 1978 was that the ancient Greeks must have been tinkering with that very funky fungus right there and mixing it into their beer. And this was the, the great magic potion, the best kept secret in history that fueled Western civilization. Um, and so a couple of years ago, I jumped off on this quest to try and prove it right or wrong. I'm, I'm really looking for scientific data. In 1978, not a lot of hard science on the search for ancient pharmacology. In the, in the subsequent 40 years, a lot's been happening. New disciplines, new science in this theme of new of today. Um, archaeochemistry being one of them. So people at MIT, for example, who spend their careers going out into these excavation sites, testing these ancient containers and chalices, and turning up occasionally psychoactive substances. It's, it's all relatively new and gaining more attention at the same time that we're experiencing this psychedelic renaissance of sorts. Uh, which is an interesting development. So I go over to Greece and I, I talk to the excavator there and I want to test the, these chalices that you see at the upper left there. This, th th these are the kinds of things that we think were drunk by Plato or Marcus Aurelius, you know, the, the people who drafted the blueprints of Western civilization and left artifacts of their experience like in the bottom left there. It was thought that even the blind could witness the vision that took place at Eleusis. So clearly, there's something crazy happening here. Um, hence the psychedelic hypothesis. Uh, to my dismay, the excavator informed me that chalices like the ones you see at the top left could not be tested because in fact, they'd been cleansed. They'd been treated for conservation. So I was fresh out of luck and had to take a big step back and look for other holy grails, other chalices. So I went all the way back into deep prehistory and started asking big questions like how old is beer? One of my favorite beverages. Um, it's about 12, 13,000 years old. And so there's Gobekli Tepe, the, 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 the trough and barrel you see on the right uh, was actually tested positive for very early traces of fermented beer, calcium oxalate, like 12,000 years ago, which is to say just maybe beer was the engine of civilization. As we're going from hunting and gathering to building civilization, it seems that beer is playing this really pivotal role in our development. And so just maybe this same kind of beer maybe spiked with the right ingredients made its way all the way to the Greeks. So where else were the Greeks in antiquity? Well, I had to go to Spain of all places to find more data. So there you're not looking at an island in Greece, you're looking off the coast of Spain and I'm hunting for drugs. And that's Asclepius, the, the Greek god of healing in the middle there. And on the right, you see some of the artifacts that are coming from this ancient Greek colony. This, this is 2,200 years ago, 2,300 years ago. You see these ancient Greek artifacts in what today is Spain. Not the first place people go looking for evidence of ancient drugs or the blueprints of Western civilization, but there you go. These Greek settlers, they found this colony on, on the sea and they go inland and they start doing this. And this is a recreation of the mystery rites, the, the religious festivals that were happening in ancient Iberia with a very, very Greek flair. Um, in addition to the sacrifice of a dog, which you can see on the right, what you can see in the background is a woman ladling magic beer from a vase into these tiny chalices. This is a, a faithful reconstruction of the kind of religion that was motivating our ancestors, which is all well and good, but where are the drugs? Well. 
first you got to find the Greeks. Inside this, this, this house, this sanctuary in Spain, all kinds of Greek artifacts. If that looks Greek to you on the right, it's because it is. That comes from the Mount Pentelicus quarry in Greece. It made its way all the way to Spain, just like those coins at the top left. That's Persephone, the same goddess of the underworld that was worshipped by Plato. And all these initiates at Eleusis who went there to drink that magic potion and had this magic vision of a goddess like Eleusis. Um, you even find this character, who's the missionary, the grand poobah of the mysteries, Triptolemus. On the left, that was found in Spain. On the right, that comes from that same museum at Eleusis, where I went to try and test those ancient Greek vessels. The right and the left, almost exactly the same. So we know the mysteries made their way to Spain. Not a bad place to go looking for the answer to the best kept secret in history. And there's my friend Carl again. So he joins me on an adventure to Spain. Um, and what we're looking at there is this ancient chalice. And as you can see, it's only, you know, so high. It was actually dug up in the 1990s um, by the archeologist Enrique Tapons. And she published this spectacular find in her native language, in Catalan. And for that reason, it never really made its way to the academic community and obviously never filtered up to the public. But what she found was extraordinary. What she found in that tiny little chalice right there, a shot glass, um, was the ancient residue, the organic remains of beer, the same kind of beer that Carl was writing about back in 1978, this magic beer that had somehow made its way into the ancient Greek potion that very much turned mortals into immortals, solved the mysteries of life, and gave birth to Western civilization as we know it. So it's some of the first scientific data for the existence of one of these potions. But I didn't take Carl all the way to Spain just so he could look at a beer cup. Inside that miniature chalice in the 1990s, it was also tested under optical microscopy. And what did they find? They found the microscopic traces of ergot, the very same ergot that Albert Hoffman would use to synthesize LSD in the 1930s, the very same ergot that Carl and his friends Albert and Gordon hypothesized way back in 1978 was the secret ingredient that fueled Western civilization. Here at a cathedral in Spain, we're looking at some of the first hard scientific data for the ritual use of psychedelics across the entire history of Western civilization. What does that mean? If Carl is right about this, and if this continues to pan out as we test more containers, more chalices, what does it mean for Christianity? Um, the whole second half of my book, which I'm not gonna get into, is basically what I found here under the streets of Rome um, in the Vatican secret archives, in the archives of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. If the ancient Greeks were using drugs to find God, if this is what brought them meaning, healing, did the Christians just maybe adopt some of the same technology, right? Which to them would have discovered the gods. Um, so I'll leave you with that. And one more piece of profanity uh, before we end the presentation this morning uh, from my friend, Mark. I won't say it out loud, but he calls it a mind blower. Uh, so this is the story of the immortality key. Um, I'm totally happy to talk to people offline. You can find me at my website, theimmortalitykey.com. I will stop sharing my screen so you can see my face. And I think I actually spared you two minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Well that. done, my friend. Well done. So this is cool. I'm going to go back and listen to some of your, your other speeches. And I'm, obviously, I'm going to read the book. But you know, it's a great segue into some of our content today and, and sort of where we are. Fast forward several thousand years. Uh, and, and here we are now with the, the medical approval, ideally, of some of these compounds again, right? After they're, they're being banned, you know, some of the prohibitions starting to come to an end. So this is interesting and certainly something I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about. Uh, I hope so. It's, it's a really exciting time. Um, I do think this technology is ancient. I think there was a lot of ritual surrounding it. And I think we can say with a straight face that just maybe drugs like this played a pivotal role in the history of Western civilization, which is no small thing. No small thing at all. And certainly for our investors watching something of note uh, when it comes to, to placing their bets, right? And looking at, at some of the companies that are now bringing these compounds to market. So Brian, thank you. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, guys, go out and grab that book. Uh, and, and Brian, of course, we'll see you soon. Peace.
All right, man, later on. Okay, so let's keep this moving, my friends. A perfect segue as we bring him on to the first company we have presenting today. Uh, this is Yaren Conforti, the CEO, director, and co-founder of Novamind. Novamind, N-V-M-D-F. N-V-M-D-F is the ticker. Yaren, how are you? Good to see you. I'm good, Patrick. Good to see you, my friend. I will let you get rolling here, and then we'll uh, we'll come back for some questions, ideally. Great. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Uh, whoops, give me one sec here at the beginning of the presentation. Okay, sorry about that. Great, so I'm here to present Novamind. For those of you that don't know the company, we're um, involved in the psychedelic medicine sector. We have a network of clinics that we operate as well as a clinical research organization uh, that operates as a CRO. Starting with slide three, a quick summary of some of the things we're gonna talk about. As I mentioned, we have an operating model for psychedelic medicine. We operate four clinics now. There were over 20,000 client visits to our clinics in 2020. Uh, and we reported for the quarter ending December 31st, uh, 1.3 million Canadian in, in our fiscal quarter. Uh, we are a leading provider of KAP, ketamine assisted psychotherapy. So when, when I mentioned that our operating model for psychedelic medicine is, is set to scale, those are the psychedelic medicines we're using today. And we're positioned uh, to administer the compounds coming online, which I'll talk a little bit about or expected to come online. Um, and of course, we're, we're growing this business, we're positioned to scale it, and that's via M&A and organically, and I'll talk a bit about that in the subsequent slides. This next slide um, summarizes in, in a few pillars what we do. So the first on the left is our clinical care group. I mentioned the four clinics operating. Uh, they operate under the Cedar Psychiatry brand, and I'll go into some detail about that. The next is clinical research. This is our contract research organization. Uh, the brand is Cedar Clinical Research. Uh, it's an organization with a, a significant history and track record and also with some recent news that I'll, I'll talk about. And the last is our therapeutic retreats. Uh, this is our take on, on, on therapeutic retreats, which really blends our clinical expertise in psychedelic medicine and innovative health modalities with different set and settings. The next slide is a map uh, that demonstrates some of what I talked about. So I'm based in Toronto. That's the HQ for the company with um, some other executives in the board also in Toronto. Utah is the location of our four clinics along with our clinical research site. In the Netherlands, we've made a large investment in, in one of the, the, the best, if not the best, legal medically supervised uh, psilocybin retreats in the world. And in Costa Rica, we're setting up our own uh, therapeutic retreat that will launch uh, later this year once once things have normalized from COVID. So the the representation on the, this map, to be clear, is is important because our referral network now that we're operating with, uh, for people who are seeking innovative mental health alternatives, we can refer them either to our clinics, of course, stateside, to our retreat partners, or if appropriate, into one of our clinical trials. This next slide gives a, a landscape, both of how we're operating our clinics and uh, an overview essentially of the regulatory environment around psychedelic medicine today. So on the left, you'll see ketamine and Spravato. Spravato is the insured form of ketamine. It's a, a drug that came from Janssen, um, which we were involved in, I'll speak to later. And these are the psychedelic, me psychedelic medicines we can use at our clinics today. Um, and we provide particular protocols for people seeking those alternatives. And on the right are, again, the compounds expected to be uh, coming online, that is having 
gone through the FDA phase three clinical trial process with MDMA expected burst and psilocybin to follow. So that that's, uh, right half the slide is where, where the clinics are being positioned for to serve the drugs that, that are coming online. The next slide, we get into Cedar Psychiatry, our clinics. Um, as I've mentioned, we're, we're leaders in the field as in, in objective terms, that's, that's evidenced by the amount of ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, amount of treatments we've administered, uh, as well as Spravato. So we're leaders in both categories. I, I don't know any other of our, our peers or competitors. Uh, in fact, they come anywhere close. So I'd, I'd encourage everyone to have a look uh, at the fact that the operating model is working today. And of course, when you walk into our clinics, it's not a typical outpatient mental health clinic. And the list you see on this slide gives you an idea of the, the spectrum of services we offer. So the, the traditional uh, outpatient mental health services, including CBT and, and prescription management, but the focus and, and emphasis and our expertise with the novel uh, and more innovative mental health modalities, which include ketamine therapy, which includes bravado, TMS, et cetera. A bit more about our clinics is that I mentioned 20,000 uh, client visits, excuse me, in 2020. Uh, that was 100% year over year growth. So we saw about 10,000 client visits in 2019. Uh, of course, COVID has exacerbated uh, the demand for mental health services, uh, certainly the demand for our services, and we're, we're expanding. We've got a very strategic plan and, and have hired some senior people with uh, specific ex expertise in executing that kind of growth. This next slide uh, is just a bit about the therapeutic retreats that I mentioned. We made a large investment that's on the left. Um, that's a passive investment. Again, we were able to refer people today to a, a level of treatment and care that is, is similar to our medical clinical standards stateside. And Circadia is an operation that we'll set up that'll launch later this year. Again, uh, it's providing that, that clinical standard of care in a therapeutic setting. So these are very much medical retreats. This next slide, we get into Cedar Clinical Research. As I mentioned, this is our clinical research platform. Both Cedar Psychiatry, the clinic network, and Cedar Clinical Research were founded by Dr. Reed Robison. We acquired both of those entities outright, so they're 100% owned by Novamind. And Dr. Robison is very much a thought leader uh, in, in psychedelic medicine and has <clears throat> significant track record both as a researcher and a clinician, which is, is very unique. So his model for many years has been to uh, be involved through the, the CRO, through Cedar Clinical Research, in the drug development pipeline. So when those drugs come online, uh, he's positioned with his team to provide those alternatives to his clients. So that uh, some of those examples are on this slide, uh, the significant study that he led in Utah uh, that resulted uh, in the approval of uh, Jensen's Spravato product in 2019. Uh, we just recently announced a key clinical trial site for Merck, uh, that's for a treatment resistant depression drug candidate. And if you also look at our news, and I encourage people to, to have a look at our website and our news, you'll see some, some evidence of, of the creative uh, approach that we're taking to getting involved in certain clinical trials. So mentioned on the slide is Bionomics. And again, uh, you'll see the details in the news release where we're in fact using our capital to support bringing new uh, mental health care and innovative therapies to market and also providing, uh, seeking to provide our clinical trials services uh, to those entities. A bit more about Cedar Clinical Research on this next slide. Uh, we, in fact, are contracted for eight trials now. Some of those clients are listed on the right. Uh, the other part of Cedar Clinical Research, which is, is very unique, uh, the entity, we, we're not drug developers, so Cedar Clinical Research principally serves drug developers, but we do work, uh, we do work in-house, and the work we do in-house is focused on the development of therapeutic protocols. And two examples of those are listed on the slide, both FCAP and GCAP, which are essentially variations on ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. These are Novamind-specific approaches uh, to these therapies, combining them with the, the screening preparation and integration protocols and, and very focused uh, therapeutic processes towards greater efficacy, towards uh, the outcomes, the transformations that people are seeking. So we combine our expertise in the clinic and our expertise with some of these compounds. Um, we rely on other drug developers to the safety and efficacy data, like it's going on for MDMA now and psilocybin. And when those drugs are legal, we'll be able to, like we have uh, with ketamine, 
wrap them in our protocols focused on specific indications. And in this way, we're, we're effectively um, trying to personalize mental health care so that people can access very particular protocols that were designed uh, with their dis mental health disorders in mind and using a variety of compounds in that our, our view is very much agnostic and we want to support uh, the broad spectrum of therapies that, that will come to market and help people. So this is a, a bit of a deeper dive into Cedar clinical research, but again, to summarize those two components, we serve drug developers, those clients are academics, academic institutions, or uh, big pharma, small pharma, not-for-profits. And on the other side of Sierra Clinical Research, we develop our own therapeutic protocols for use in our clinics and elsewhere. This next slide, uh, number 12, is um, it's an investment portfolio that we hold. We've been making some strategic investments since we founded the company two years ago. So it's a, a quick look at what we hold. Uh, we've done very well with our investment portfolio. We only make strategic investments at this point. Um, so we'll be liquidating any passive investments, but it's a good source of, of capital, of course, and relationships uh, in terms of supporting uh, the leading players in the sector. This next slide is our executive team. Uh, I've made mention of Dr. Reed Robison. He's our chief medical officer and our partner in the business. Much of Nova Mind and, and what I'm talking about today is built uh, very much on, on the back of his work for the last couple decades. Uh, he really is a, a thought leader in psychedelic medicine and our opportunity to scale our clinic network uh, and our CRO, our contract research organization platform, it is really uh, credit to him. So we're supporting those businesses with the capital and the resources, uh, human resources they need. Pierre Boom and Seward to his right joined us a couple months ago. He's a former CEO of Life Labs. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the brand, it's in fact a Canadian company. It's about a billion dollar revenue business focused on uh, diagnostic clinics and labs. And Pierre has br brought some of that expertise uh, to help us scale our network which is, um, which is our number one priority. We've also got Prakash Goud, um, Joseph, and, and some of the other people you'll see on the second layer there who very much have their own domain expertise, ex-equity research analysts and um, M&A experts, and it's applying that expertise to the mental health space where we're doing it in a very focused way. The next slide is our board um, and, and the scientific advisory board. So we're working very closely with some of these people on the therapeutic protocols that I mentioned earlier. It's their domain expertise and, and some of our partners that inspires the, the work that we're doing focused on particular indications. The board of directors below, Srili Weinreb and Jesse Kaplan are my co-founders. Chuck Rafici, many of you may know from the cannabis sector. He was uh, one of the founders of Canopy Growth and he's been very helpful uh, of course, has a lot of expertise in building businesses in, in newly regulated markets. This uh, coming to the end of the presentation, this is a summary of both our, our stock price and the trading thus far. Uh, we haven't been public very long. Uh, we went public on January 5th. We raised capital before we went public um, and closed that financing in November 2020. So we're, we're, we're very happy with the first couple of months. It's a, it's a liquid stock, it, it trades in a, a fairly consistent range, and we've cultivated a very supportive group of shareholders that understands our strategy. And I think more and more investors are starting to realize uh, some of the details of that strategy. And since we've only been public a couple months, I'll look forward to, to wel welcoming more of that interest. Uh, and we were included in the, the Horizons ETF fairly quickly soon after going public. We're very proud of that. Um, this next slide is a comparable companies list. I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, some of you are familiar with this peer group. And I'll just point out, maybe point your eyes to the quarterly revenue column and note um, you know, the comparative difference. And of, of course, the valuation, given that we've just recently gone public, we'll expect that, that gap to close in, in due course. Finally, a, a summary slide, uh, just covering some of the things that I mentioned. We are operating today. 20,000 client visits in 2020, um, ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, Spravato, transcranial magnetic stimulations, stimulation. These are some of the uh, innovative mental health modalities that we offer today. Uh, we're positioning Nova Mind to be a leading player, both in the clinic space where people can access, access these innovative treatments 
and in the clinical trial business where we where we support the drug developers who are bringing these therapies to market. So that's the end of my presentation. I welcome any questions. Thank you. Oh, there's my video. Uh, thank you, Yaron. I really appreciate that. Uh, I do have a couple questions for you, and some of this uh, will be specific to the company and the stock, and some of it, you know, just given a couple of the questions coming in in the chat, will just be, you know, again furthering the education about uh, what's happening in this in this space and and why this should be a serious um, therapeutic method moving forward. Right. Um, okay. So let's start with a partnership. Um, now you just recently announced a partnership with Merck. Uh, world-class pharmaceutical company, we all know them, um, and it's to evaluate the efficacy of their MK1942 drug in conjunction with antidepressant therapy, right? Now, that research is going to happen at the CCR uh, with Dr. Robeson, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what can you tell us about the significance of that partnership specifically, and of course, the significance of, of what uh, you and Dr. Robeson have built at the CCR? Certainly, it's, it's a very good working example um, of, of the, the validation that CCR is getting in terms of the clients that we're supporting. So specifically, um, you're referring to, to the news that came out just a couple days ago, and we, um, we're a clinical trial site for a Merck clinical trial that's investigating a new uh, therapy for treatment-resistant depression. So our role um, when, when Merck goes out to test the, the safety and efficacy of these drugs, they need uh, at certain phases hundreds of sites and in later phases thousands of sites. Um, and this is a similar process that MAPS would go through, for example, with MDMA in, in phase three, and that you need essentially that kind of um, coverage globally, uh, specifically people who are practiced in facilitating these clinical trials. So the role that we play um, is to recruit patients Again, our clinics are a big benefit there uh, in our clinical trial business because we act, have access to a large patient pool. Um, and then we will actually run the trial uh, at our clinical research facility in Springville, Utah, and collect the data, analyze, and report and transfer data according to the protocols that Merck uses uh, with sim similar uh, clinical trial sites like ours. So in short, um, Merck actually hasn't said a lot about this drug. We don't know exactly how the, the molecule works. Um, and they're in fact not marketing it as psychedelic. What they are marketing as clearly is another therapy to tackle the suffering caused by treatment resistant depression. And so Cedar Clinical Research, um, I invite people again to look at our website. Um, I, I don't know if I mentioned explicitly, but one of the things that Dr. Reed Robinson is involved in is that he's the coordinating investigator for the MAPS phase three clinical trial uh, using MDMA and focused on eating disorders. So uh, Merck would be one example of a client on the spectrum. MAPS would be another example um, that we're, we're obviously lead, uh, Reed is acting as a coordinating investigator. Uh, Otsuka is a very large pharma. We're doing another example would be a trial with the Ketamine Research Foundation. So to give people a bit of scope on Cedar Clinical Research, it serves a spectrum of, of drug developers and, as I said, both not-for-profits and commercial. And, and what we want to do is take us an agnostic view, which means that we, we are open to all therapies and we want to build an infrastructure on the clinic side that provides our patients with access to all therapies. So we aren't particularly focused on um, one, for example, there's multiple people developing as you know, phase two psilocybin. So we're, we're gonna seek to partner with as many of those people as possible um, rather than, than, than decide for ourselves what drugs deserve to come to market, support them all and find out which, which are best for patients. Uh, so that's a bit of a look into the future. I think you'll see more of the creative transactions uh, similar to the Binomics uh, transaction that I mentioned, where we're very much, uh, the expertise that we have is in demand because the clinical trial business is unique when you get into CNS and, and mental health innovations. Uh, as many people know, a lot of the, uh, the treatments or the trips associated with psychedelic medicine are very long. The duration is long and can be challenging. So to have both the infrastructure that is designed to facilitate those trials and the therapists, of course, that are trained is very, very important. And if you look at the case of um, Spravato, as I mentioned, where we, we led clinical trials uh, for Janssen in Utah, and then when it was approved and, and legal in 2019, 
we weren't, were one of the first to provide it, and to date are one of the most experienced groups in the United States uh, as far as facilitating treatment with Spravato. So this is the, the model that's worked very well. Uh, you were, we're planning the same with, with MDMA, of course, which is 2023 is not far away. So when we design our new clinical research sites and our new clinics, which, which are expanding in real time, uh, a footprint across the US, we, we look at those specifications, we look at the experience we're having in the trials, we look at the, the requirements that the FDA and, and the drug developers um, are essentially signaling, and we build so that when those drugs come online, we're not waiting around, we're, we're really in pole position and, and trusted, in the sense that if we're trusted with the clinical trials to bring these drugs to market, our expectation is that we'll be trusted to facilitate these treatments in the clinic for people that want them. Awesome. Yaron, that takes us to time. I know that there are some more questions around the data that's being collected and efficacy. Um, I'll shoot those over to, to your team, uh, but I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to see how the market is, is really starting to take shape. So thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me. Of course. You guys, again, that's Yaron Conforti, the CEO of Novamind. Novamind, the company there, NVMDF. Uh, moving right along, uh, next up I get to introduce Dr. Lakshminarayan Bhatt. Lakshminarayan Bhatt, um, and this is from Reviva Pharmaceuticals. The ticker here is RVPH, RVPH. Lax, hope you're well this morning. As we get you moved over and get your video on and your mic up, you guys in the chat, feel free to ask questions. We like these questions, they're good. Hello, sir. Hello. Welcome, welcome. I appreciate you being here. Uh, now, I, I definitely have some questions, uh, just things that I'm curious about, and we'll we'll wait to hear from our friends in the chat. But uh, you go right ahead. Thank you. So, thank you for the introduction, and uh, you know, uh, thanks for having me here. So, before I begin my presentation, I would like to draw your attention to our uh, forward-looking statements displayed in this deck. See. So, my name is Lux Bhatt. I am uh, founder, president, and CEO of Reviva Pharmaceuticals. We are a uh, you know a young public company. We became public uh, in December uh, 2020, just three months old uh, public company, uh, listed on Nasdaq, trading under symbol RVPH. Uh, we are a, a clinical stage company uh, having multiple programs in clinical development uh, in the neuropsychiatry and respiratory space with huge unmet medical need. The company is led by experienced medical team. I'm the founder of Reviva. My background is a, I'm a trained scientist. Um, I've been in the industry for over 20 years, uh, contributed to one upro drug and uh, multiple drugs that entered uh, clinical development. My, with me, my colleague, Mark Antion, he brings over uh, uh, 20, 25 years of experience in the industry. He contributed to four drugs currently uh, in the market, blockbuster category drugs, when his contribution at major pharmaceutical companies. So uh, with us, our uh, chief financial officer, uh, Narayan Prabhu, he also brings over uh, 20 years of experience in the industry. So now coming to our uh, uh, you know, clinical pipeline, we have two molecules in development, RP1208 and then RP5063. Uh, RP5063 is the most advanced uh, drug candidate, RP1208, it is currently in preclinical development. Both molecules are uh, platform therapies. Uh, that means say the drug can be used for, uh, based on the pharmacology of, uh, of these drugs, can be used for multiple indications. RP5063, we have completed a phase two study for schizophrenia and, and schizoaffective disorders. Based on the clinical data in hand, we believe this drug can be used for multiple neuropsychiatric indications that are closely associated with schizophrenia, such as bipolar disorder, uh, depression, major depressive disorder, and uh, ADHD as well. So drug has also shown uh, you know, good efficacy in the translational model for uh, respiratory indications, PAH and then IPF. So you might be wondering why uh, that we are talking about extending the antipsychotic drug uh, to uh, respiratory indications. 
So if you look at the uh, recent uh, clinical literature, uh, there is a good mechanistic connection between the mental illness and uh, pulmonary diseases. So the connection is, biological connection is a serotonin uh, uh, signaling dysfunction. So uh, in the scientific uh, field, we all know that the dysfunctional serotonin signaling in the brain lead to uh, psychosis, depression, and dementia. It's very well uh, validated and very well known. Uh, however, the dysfunctional serotonergic function in the lung are leading to pH and then IPF, even though we have uh, you know, uh, known this uh, scientific literature for uh, over a decade, currently there is no drug approved uh, targeting these uh, targets. So we believe RP5063, our lead drug, can treat having broad spectrum activity, potent selective activity for key receptors expressed in uh, uh, both uh, in the brain and in lung for uh, uh, serotonin uh, receptors. We believe our drug can treat mental illness and uh, uh, respiratory indications, pH and an IPF effectively. So the addressable market is very large. Uh, neuropsychiatric programs has highlighted here uh, a few drugs approved for uh, schizophrenia, also used for depression or bipolar disorder, and one or two drugs are also used for ADHD as well. Collectively, if you uh, consider these four indications in the neuropsychiatry, it is over $40 billion market size. However, uh, if you look at the pulmonary indications, PAH is alone around a $14 billion by 2026 and a IPF market is close to $6 billion. So the total addressable market for our drug here is a over uh, $40 billion. Again, we are not the first company or the first drug uh, developer to target for multiple neuropsychiatric indications based on the broad spectrum pharmacology of our drug. Uh, we believe our drug can be used for these major neuropsychiatric indications. However, pulmonary indications, it is novel. Uh, but the translational data in hand, uh, you know, we believe this is this drug is, uh, uh, you know, effective in treating pulmonary programs. Only the clinical data will further confirm that. Now, coming to quickly highlight neuropsychiatric indications of our, uh, you know, what we are targeting with RP5063, as uh, you know, the previous presentation uh, in the neuropsychiatric space, you heard. The neuropsych schizophrenia and then associated symptoms are, you know, very large. Uh, schizophrenia alone, over one percent patient affected by schizophrenia globally. It uh, translates into over twenty million people in the U.S. alone. Over four million people suffer from schizophrenia. Now, quickly coming into the the question, it connects. Despite having a block around a six to seven blockbuster category antipsychotics currently in the market, and in general, overall over 20 drugs approved antipsychotics in the market, the here is the statistics. One third of the patient population do not respond to current medication. The patients who respond to current medication, antipsychotic medication, about uh, you know uh, 35 to uh, or oh, 45 percent patients, they discontinue medication in four to six weeks of treatment. In the long-term treatment, on about a year, around 70 percent patient discontinue medication. So, why do these patients say uh, discontinue medication? Uh, the reason for that is a uh, suboptimal efficacy associated with current approved antipsychotic to treat, but, you know, broad spectrum uh, symptoms associated with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is not a single disease like cancer, rather it is a, a symptom of cluster of for at least four major symptoms, positive symptoms, negative symptoms, cognitive, and then more. So drug has to have efficacy to treat, broad spectrum efficacy to treat uh, equally or to a great extent, all these major uh, symptoms uh, at the same time should have greater tolerability and then safety profile as well. So because of the suboptimal efficacy and then high uh, side effects profile associated with approved antipsychotics, patient discontinue medication. So without going into complex science of, uh, uh, you know, causing the uh, uh, factors contributing to uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms, if you look at the discontinuation rate itself, RP5063 has shown in the phase two study uh, around 12 to 14 percent dropout versus other approved antipsychotics in the similar trial uh, in the four, uh, four weeks of trial reported around a 35 to 45% dropout. That itself, uh, you know, an indicator of 
R5563 uh, has better efficacy and then safety profile compared to other approved antipsychotics. So this is a mechanism I would not go into detail because of uh, time constraint. What I would like to point out here is the RP5063 has potent selectivity for key receptors that are implicated for all major symptoms, what I discussed, positive symptoms, negative symptoms, uh, mood, and then cognitive. So that makes RP5063 uh, a differentiated product. And then also RP5063 doesn't have any appreciable activity for receptors that are known to uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, cause or implicated for adverse effects. Schizophrenia, to a great extent, uh, we know because of the last 50 years of antipsychotics history, what receptors are responsible for uh, uh, contributing to side effects. Our drug doesn't have any appreciable activity for those receptors. So now coming to quickly coming to the uh, phase two uh, data here, RP5063 has shown 20% improvement on PAN score. PANS is a scale used for evaluating schizophrenia positive and negative symptom scale. 20 point improvement uh, for three doses, close to 20 point improvement is really a robust efficacy in one month of treatment compared to other approved antipsychotics, if you, without good naming any particular drug, approved antipsychotics in similar trial have shown about 13 point to 18 point improvement. Each point improvement translate into almost like a 8% uh, uh, you know, uh, outcome. So compared to this approved antipsychotics, RP5063, we believe can be anywhere around a 20% to 50% better. That depends on which drug you compare our data. So this is an approval criteria for the market. However, the drug has to be accepted by patients. Drug has to have efficacy for more than total PAN score. So which are those uh, you know, uh, measures? Positive symptoms, as I mentioned, we have shown uh, in one month treatment about six point uh, decrease in PAN score. That's really a robust efficacy. Approved antipsychotics in the similar trial, anywhere around a three to four point improvement. On the other hand, negative symptom scale here, again, it's very difficult to treat. If you look at all approved antipsychotics do not have efficacy for negative symptoms, only handful of very few drugs show reasonable efficacy. However, if you look at here, we have, we have shown on the day 15 itself, itself, robust efficacy for this drug, statistically significant improvement. So with the social functioning improvement. So a drug, it's uh, antipsychotic drug, uh, has an efficacy for negative symptoms and social functioning that can be considered as a marker for drug can be used for beyond schizophrenia, such as depression and the last well as a uh, bipolar disorder. Now quickly move to the safety. Safety is also equally important uh, as a uh, as a efficacy. So most uh, you know, uh, antipsychotics known to have you know, metabolic side effects, endocrine side effect, as well as a CNS side effect at various degrees. So CNS side effect, uh, to date, all the antipsychotics approved have dopamine D2 activity. Without dopamine D2 activity, uh, I know the uh, various other companies also in, the, uh, in developing drugs for non-dopamine targets. So to my knowledge, to date, all the drugs approved uh, have dopamine D2. Without dopamine D2, so far, no drug uh, entered into the market. So dopamine D2 activity is very critical to treat positive symptoms. So uh, that is related to some extent neuroleptic side effect. So we have seen uh, for RP5063, 2 to 2.5% side effect for the 15 milligram dose. That is the dose we believe is widely used when it comes to market. That is considered very benign compared to other approved antipsychotics. However, the endocrine side effect, metabolic side effect, drug doesn't have really uh, any uh, side effects compared to placebo. This is a very clean uh, side effect profile. With this, uh, you know, we met FDA uh, and the end of phase two meeting. It was a very successful end of phase two meeting. FDA uh, has reviewed the phase two data as well as the phase three uh, development plan. FDA has also given us guidance for a superior safety label claim. So we have uh, designed the phase three to meet the superior safety label claim. To my knowledge, no other, uh, no approved antipsychotics has superior safety label claim as well as say other drugs currently in the development uh, also has that kind of assurance to my knowledge. So overall, you know, the uh, 
the outcome of the end of phase two meeting is uh, was really uh, encouraging. We are preparing to start the phase three mid of this year. Expect to give top line data sometime next year in November, December. So this is a what I, I hope I have a few minutes time. Just I will take a two minutes time to just to quickly review respiratory indications. So I mentioned about uh, at the beginning uh, respiratory indication, pulmonary arterial hypertension, and pulmonary fibrosis. So both PAH and an IPF are lung diseases uh, uh, affecting different parts of the lung. But the bottom line here, if you look at here, upstream targets are 5-HT2A, 2B, and then 5-HT7, serotonin, 2A, 2B, and 7 receptors are highly expressed in the lungs of this both PAH and an IPF based on the recent scientific literature uh, in over uh, 10 years. So there are enough indications that uh, targeting these three receptors you know, drug can be uh, effectively used for treating both PAH and an IPF. We have great data for PAH uh, shown here. We have published over uh, six papers. It's on our website. So we have compared our drug in translational model, the representative widely used drug for three different categories of, uh, you know, uh, drugs currently in the market for PAH. Compared to these uh, drugs, RP5063 has shown robust efficacy, highlighted summary here, reduce the pulmonary arterial hypertension in translational model statistically significantly. Not only pulmonary arterial hypertension, it also reduced the lung fibrosis and then inflammatory markers. That's a great sign. Similarly, with the lung fibrosis in the IPF model, RP5063 compared to uh, the other two drugs currently in the market, nintadanib and perfenidone, again shown the robust efficacy, would not go into detail. So. The translational here is a, besides reducing the lung fibrosis, it also should mitigated the respiratory resistance, increased blood oxygen, as well as a survival rate. So with this, we have, we met FDA. FDA has already granted orphan designation for this drug. FDA has already reviewed the phase two and then phase three clinical development plan for PAH and then IPF. We are preparing to start the phase two studies uh, sometime uh, later this year. So this is the summary of R&D to overall, we intend to start the phase three study sometime mid this year and then later part of this year, intend to start PAH and then IPF. So in the next 18 to 24 months, we expect to give top line data for phase three schizophrenia and then phase two studies for PAH and then IPF. So I pause here, I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Lox, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I do have a couple. Um, sure. Can you remind us what the, the orphan drug designation from the FDA, what is the significance of that for, for our investors? What does that mean for, for, for the drug itself? You know, orphan drug designation is given to a disease currently there is no cure. And then the total number of patient population in the U.S. should be around 250,000 patients. So there's a huge significant unmet need. If you look at a PAH and an IPF, currently there is no treatment, there is no cure for that, even though there are treatments available, uh, some are very symptomatic. Uh, but if you look at PAH patients, average lifespan after diagnosis is around five to seven years. Uh, but the IPF pulmonary uh, uh, fibrosis is hardly around two and a half to three years survival. So this is a huge unmet need, especially in the COVID environment. If you look at the COVID uh, symptoms, if you, uh, besides temperature, the remaining lung infections are very close to pulmonary fibrosis. So there are scientific literature came out recently, even though these patients out of, uh, you know, COVID virus infection, but still their lungs are infected and lungs are uh, left with scars. That, that could be a concern for developing IPF uh, uh, in the near future or in the long run. Great, and and I, I apologize. I don't have your your latest um, financials on hand here in terms of what you've reported. So per, perhaps you can just remind our audience mm -hmm. here um, wh what's what's the current status? How much? Uh, what, what's the the cash balance? What's the burn rate? Anything like that that you can help us with? Sure, I'll quickly summarize. We became public company in December through SPAC transaction. At closing, we left with a uh, twelve point five million dollar. So. We were, uh, phase three uh, would cost around a you know a little over twenty million dollars. We are uh, before starting the phase three uh, mid of this year. We would uh, raise some additional capital uh, just to 
uh, enough to complete the phase three. Our burn rate is very lean because we are a very lean company. So uh, we, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we would uh, raise some additional capital uh, to complete the phase three study um, uh, to give a top line data sometime next year by November, December. Great. Great. Well, Lox, thank you so much for joining thank us today. You. I really, really appreciate it. This is this sounds interesting. I mean, one could glean that the opportunity is there with, you know, obviously uh, diseases with no cures, the orphan drug designation, and then of course the overall market uh, size. Yeah, there, there's got to be opportunity here. So thank you. I look forward to hearing more. Thank you. I appreciate. It. All right. Take care. Okay, my friends, up next, um, we are introducing Sh uh, Sean Singh. Yeah, Sean Singh, the CEO and director of VistaGen Therapeutics, VTGN is the ticker, VTGN, that's on the NASDAQ. Um, Sean, welcome. Patrick, how are you? Great to join I'm good. You. Good, to, well, good to, good to have you, man. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. We will we'll dive in and let you get rolling. Absolutely great. I appreciate it. Let me hook up here and share the screen. All right. Good to go. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today, learning a little bit more about Vistagen. We are a company based out here in South San Francisco, committed firmly to changing lives that are affected by mental illness. And, and for that commitment, how we're advancing on that is going beyond the standard of care and the three drugs we're developing for anxiety and depression disorder. So we'll go through our pipeline quickly today, not much time, uh, feel free please to uh, check some of the things we're talking about today in our SEC filings, I'll be making forward looking statements and you can obviously take a look at our website and uh, check in with our IR department. So what we've got right now in the pipeline are three clinical stage assets. Um, each of them has fundamentally differentiated mechanism of action or the way the drug works and this is key for us as one of the key screening criteria that we've got across this entire pipeline is the drug's got to be different from the drugs that we've seen in the anxiety and depression spaces for decades now two three uh, close to even four decades with respect to some drug classes they also have to be safe. They've got to show in human studies, in, uh, in patients in particular, that the underlying condition is what's being focused on primarily, not managing down a whole host of side effects and safety concerns that are often more debilitating than uh, the underlying condition. So all of our three candidates currently through all drug uh, studies to date, all clinical trials to date, show very favorable safety profile. They also have to have potential in multiple markets, not just a single niche market, but multiple fairly large or um, uh, large global um, CNS markets. So that also fits each of these three assets that we've got. This is a company right now in a transformative year in 2020, COVID notwithstanding, uh, a lot of um, a lot of key events, partnering activities, regulatory in, uh, interactions with the FDA, financing activities, institutionalizing the stock. Uh, a lot happened in 20 that hasn't happened for the company in, in many years prior. So we see it here with three assets again, pH 94B and pH 10. These are uh, nasal sprays for anxiety and depression disorders, respectively. AV101 is an oral drug, a NMDA receptor antagonist that we're developing in combination with the drug called probenicid for several neurological indications, as well as a major depressive disorder. The company sits at a very strong balance sheet. We had a financing um, in December of last year, as well as in the summer, brought in over 123 million last year through partnering arrangements, as well as um, large financings with healthcare, long bias healthcare focused investors. Pipeline in a nutshell here, um, the lead indication for the company right now and the lead asset for the company right now is pH 94B. It's a nasal spray that we're focusing on uh, social anxiety disorder. That's a phase three program. We'll be launching that here next quarter. Four other indications, all anxiety disorders for pH 94B. Uh, we'll talk about those briefly as we get deeper into the deck. pH 10 is a nasal spray for depression disorders. The lead focus there is major depressive disorder, but additional uh, depression related disorders also uh, on the horizon. And for AV101, the focus, we'll decide that in early 22, based on some work we'll be doing here in late 21, 
in combination with probenicid, some drug-drug interaction studies in phase 1b. So don't need to remind you much. Unfortunately, this is in the news every day. Uh, COVID only exacerbated a situation we already were facing in the US and worldwide with respect to mental illness. Uh, it is now in, in an unpredictable way a year ago, but to the point now where we can forecast forward, unfortunately, the lingering effects of COVID and all of the other um, stresses and strains, anxiety and depression provoking stressors that we're wrestling with today as a society. Our, name, our main focus is on social anxiety disorder at the moment. So let's unpack this for a bit. Social anxiety disorder, first, it's the third most common mental illness. And its hallmark is really a profound fear and anxiety of embarrassment or humiliation, judgment in what many and most would consider everyday social performance, public speaking type of situations. It could be um, sitting in a classroom, fearing being called on, it could be giving a presentation to colleagues um, in a corporate setting, it could be going on a date, a job interview, going to your neighbors for a barbecue, getting a flu shot. Uh, there are many and diverse uh, anxiety provoking stressors that affect those suffering from social anxiety disorder. Uh, about 17 and a half million adults, adolescents, it's a chronic indication. Usually the, the mean duration is about 20 years with an onset typically in adolescence. So not only the effects of COVID, but the rising um, team orientation in the workplace, in an academic setting, uh, the effects of social media on all different age groups. Uh, again, it's, it's a, it was a challenge pre-COVID. I think it's even more challenging as we now enter um, this one year point post-COVID. What do people affected by social anxiety disorder have to help them out? Unfortunately, there's only three drugs and they're all antidepressants, three drugs approved by the FDA, all old school antidepressants, SSRIs, SNRIs. Um, on an off-label basis, however, and this goes for many anxiety-related disorders, the main go-to are benzodiazepines or benzos, uh, drugs like Xanax and Valium, Ativan. Uh, also, beta blockers are used from time to time, propranolol. The problems uh, related to these drug candidates, these drug classes, are their side effects and safety concerns are extremely well known, as are those with antidepressants. And so you have a situation where really the currently available medications, whether they're on label or off label, just fall far short of what people need. What do they need? They need something that can work quickly, that can work on demand, but not cause some of the, the troubling side effects and safety concerns associated with antidepressants, but especially with benzodiazepines. So cognitive impairment, sedation, uh, memory loss, potential for addiction, misuse, overuse. These are these are challenges that have led to, in the benzo case, at least a benzo epidemic, which is at levels really, unfortunately, uh, approaching those of the opioid epidemic. It's often the case when overdose autopsies are done that both benzos and opioids will have been part of that, um, that problem and that uh, tragedy. So we've got even the FDA in the fall of last year, uh, September of, of 2020, issued an updated drug safety communication to say that the box warning for benzodiazepines needs to be improved, needs to be enhanced. There is, uh, they noted 92 million prescriptions for benzodiazepines in 2019. Uh, 2020, we can expect that we saw in the first quarter an increase of about 34% based on a study that Express Scripts did. So as we move deeper into 20 and deeper into COVID, um, our belief at least is that the uh, the use of benzodiazepines has increased even more so. So uh, these are drugs that when taken properly, just like opioids uh, and for a short period of time, can, uh, can achieve the intended effect. The problem is when they go beyond the stated and the prescribed um, uh, level of use, the rise to overuse, misuse, uh, addiction, withdrawal issues. So the challenge is there uh, to displace benzodiazepines. And we think what we've got in phase three, entering phase three development, PH94B, leading first with social anxiety disorder, has that potential to displace benzodiazepines in the anxiety treatment paradigm. It's a tall order, it's a big idea, but this is a drug candidate that has 
a product profile that we think really fits nicely within not only the SAD slot, but other anxiety-related disorders. So what is it? This is an odorless farine nasal spray. It's a neurosteroid. And in studies to date, the onset of activity has been about 10 to 15 minutes. A benzodiazepine will be about 30 minutes, but the effects of that benzo will last 10, 12, even uh, longer than that, uh, hours. Whereas the effects of PH94B we've seen last about an hour and a half to two hours with the ability to take it in studies to date up to four times a day. It's non-systemic. It's given at microgram doses, not milligrams. So a typical Advil is about 200 milligrams. This is a microgram dose that's administered uh, to the nasal passage directly. And I'll tell you why we're doing that in a second. The phase two study that has um, supported the decision, both Vistagen and in consensus with the FDA to move into phase three was highly statistically significant in two ways, both in a public speaking challenge and in a social interaction challenge, P.002 and P.009 for the social interaction. So the, one of the breakthrough moments for Vistagen was last summer, where in the meeting with the FDA, we reached consensus that the phase two study we'll talk about in a moment serves as the foundation for the design of our phase three program. Very elegant study, only four weeks in duration, four different visits. Uh, so it's, it's also very economical from a phase three perspective to run our phase three program. And we do have the, what we believe is the very first fast track designation for a drug for social anxiety disorder. And that was given to us by the FDA a couple of years ago. So we're looking at a drug candidate that maybe think about as you would a rescue inhaler for asthma or a migraine drug for a migraine episode. So that period of time, maybe 10 to 15 minutes right up front, of what is often a very predictable stressor, uh, anxiety provoking stressor for someone affected with social anxiety disorder. It's in that window of time where if the onset of PH94B does what we hope it will do and what it's done in phase two, it provides confidence and it puts a person in a position to be able to embrace that particular situation, whether it's a performance or a social setting um, with the type of calm and comfort and confidence that um, they would like to have be able to achieve in all those settings on a regular basis. So how does it work? We say action from a distance because it's very possible, we'll know later in some studies uh, this year, whether the drug even gets into the brain. It's, it acts primarily on what are called nasal chemosensory receptors. And these are uh, neurotransmitters that are located solely in the, the nasal passage. That's why PH94B is formulated as a nasal spray. Uh, you could drink it, it's not gonna do anything. You take it by IV, not gonna do anything. The key here is, uh, the nasal chemosensory receptors located in the nasal passage, when they are spritzed with a very small amount of PH94B, again, microgram doses, they then activate uh, through an inner neuron called the olfactory bulb neurons, neural circuitry, that ultimately ends in the amygdala, which is the main fear and anxiety center of the brain. And this is achieved without systemic uptake. This is not a pill that needs to be broken down by the liver and transported across the blood-brain barrier uh, through the blood. This drug isn't even detectable in the plasma, uh, given it's, it's administered in microgram doses with a very direct mechanism of action. So using essentially the nose as a portal to the part of the brain associated with fight or flight or fear and anxiety and um, triggering neurocircuitry that uh, stimulates or that not stimulates but causes an inhibitory action in the brain to repress that fear and anxiety impulse and do that very quickly. Let's talk a little bit about phase two. This is a study that was run by Dr. Michael Leibowitz um, out of Columbia. Dr. Leibowitz is really known as the godfather of social anxiety disorder. He created what's called the Leibowitz Social Anxiety Scale, LSAS, uh, that's been used in the prior three drugs for approval by the FDA. This was a study conducted in a controlled setting, in a laboratory or a clinical setting by Dr. Leibowitz and his colleagues, two other institutions. And what, what occurs in this situation after someone is assessed using the Leibowitz scale as having social anxiety disorder, um, there is a placebo run-in point where everyone is administered a placebo at visit two. And at that point, they are told 15 minutes later, they have to prepare within two minutes for a five minute speech to a mock audience. And during that speech, they are uh, given 
they give to the investigator a score that associates with how they feel and how anxious they are at each minute during that five minute speech. They then come back, that establishes their baseline, and they come back a week later, and that process is repeated after there's a double blind randomization to drug or placebo. The fourth visit is just simply a safety follow up. So, at the end of the day, uh, what they're assessing here, and the benefit of this program is that it's a patient reported outcome. This is a, called the subjective units of distress scale, it's a visual analog scale where the, the subject actually reports to the investigator how they feel. So the investigator does not need to make a subjective assessment of what he or she thinks the, the condition of the patient is or the subject is. Here, the subject's reporting that directly to the investigator. So as published in data that are available on our website, um, you see here on the left, visit two, we talked about all subjects in visit two, again, received placebo. This is their baseline, the same dynamic, 15 minutes after administration, they're told they have two minutes to prepare for a five minute speech. And then they give that speech and report their scores during the course of that speech. Visit three, they come back, and this is where we see exciting separation and a statistical um, outcome that's highly significant, P.002. The red is the placebo group, the blue on the right side is the uh, drug treated group. And you see a very significant separation between the placebo group and the PH 94B group and the same dynamic. So this encouraging result, uh, even though they knew they were coming back for exactly the same type of um, uh, public speaking challenge that they had the week prior, this is a very, public speaking is a very um, significant stressor. And public speaking is part of most social anxiety disorder challenges, whether it's to an audience or to a small group, or just in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Uh, it is very, anxiety provoking for people affected by SAD. So it's this study design and it's this outcome that supported our interactions with the FDA last summer. And what we achieved was alignment with FDA on using this phase two design in our phase three study. Difference though, is that we don't need to, according to the FDA, do the social interaction challenge. We have sufficient um, support there in our uh, phase two study to be confident that the drugs got potential not only in public speaking scenarios, but as well as multiple social scenarios. And FDA in our case here wanted really the most simplified way possible to assess the efficacy of PH94B in a phase three setting. And so the consensus was we only need to do the public speaking challenge. We've moved this from a three site study to about 15 to 18 sites. This will be a US study. I'll involve both males and females at a 3.2 microgram dose. And um, we expect to mirror this study in a global study design. Uh, the US study will be launched next quarter, right around the corner from now. Uh, and then the global study will be launched in the fourth quarter. Purpose of the global study is to be able as concurrently as possible to file new drug applications, not only in the United States, but in uh, several major regional markets around the world, uh, China, Japan, Europe, other markets, leveraging the work that we will do to support our NDA enabling, NDA enabling activity in the US. Target for our NDA for PH94B for the acute treatment of anxiety in adults with social anxiety disorder. So using PH94B, take it out of your pocket, your purse, uh, your backpack, and as you have a anxiety provoking event that you can predict or even that comes upon you suddenly and unpredictably, have the ability to use the drug on demand as needed and to not have a scenario where you become sedated or you become confused or you become addicted. Uh, so far, all work we've done collectively with this drug candidate has shown that um, the safety profile is exceptional. There's no binding to dopamine, nicotine, uh, opiate receptors. Drug does not potentiate GABA. We just uh, had several studies that have focused on whether or not this is benzo-like. So benzodiazepines do potentiate GABA and PH94B does not. So again, trying to displace benzodiazepines in the drug treatment paradigm for anxiety disorders is a tall order, but the pro product profile and features of PH94B to date through clinical studies, through phase two development um, have indicated that that's an exciting potential the drug possesses. So we will be developing in parallel with the phase three program will include adjustment disorder. This is a, as a result of COVID in particular, we've seen quite a few 
new patient groups emerge that had no pre-existing history of anxiety disorders, but do now as a result of trauma associated with COVID. Frontline workers, uh, healthcare workers, college students, teachers, uh, just people who have had to wrestle through the diverse impacts of COVID and now for a persistent period of time, multiple weeks, um, this trauma has impaired their functionality. So adjustment disorder is a small study we will launch mid-year uh, in both New York City and Boston that will assess the drug's potential in that patient population. We know PTSD will be a very long-term lingering challenge, mental illness challenge across all demographic groups um, as we come out of COVID even. So we expect to be working um, with the team at Boston University and Harvard end of this year uh, around a PTSD program in phase two. Pre-procedural anxiety, postpartum anxiety, panic, these are all possible indications for us with this drug. That's good, my running low on time. We are at time, my friend. Any last thoughts you wanna leave our audience with? Well, I think I'd just like to leave you with the fact that this is one of three drug candidates. Uh, the company is extremely well-funded now for multiple years with a broad base of institutional investors with sufficient funding to not only focus on our lead program and our lead uh, development for phase three development of PH94B, but all three candidates across multiple different indications. So a very busy clinical trial calendar coming up in 21, a lot of outcome in 22, uh, beginning with the phase three program in the second quarter of 22. And then ideally, we're a company that's if successful in phase three. We're less than 36 months to market in the U.S. Wonderful. Well, Sean, thank you so much for joining us. I know that we'll be, we'll be hearing from you again soon. So folks in the audience, if you have questions, I'm sure you do. We'll make sure that Sean and company get them. But thank you, sir. Thanks to the VistaGen team. You bet. Thanks again. All right. Okay, so that was, again, Sean Singh, the CEO and Director of Vistagen Therapeutics. VTGN is the ticker there. Uh, a lot of interest in the chat, so make sure you check that company out. Next up, a fan favorite. You're welcome, all you investors watching. Here comes Jason Rasnick, our CEO here at Benzinga. What's up, pal? How is my color there? Is it too bright behind me? What do you need me to do? I mean, Patrick? you look like an angel. Is is really what it is. You look you look angelic. There's I mean, like I could, a I, I could a nice. It. I could switch it for you if I want me to go. Oh, see, I like that. I like that better. I don't know if you. Like I don't know what you guys think. Give us a one if you like him against the the brick wall and the signage, or a two if you like the uh, angelic heavenly window. Or three, you just don't care. That's like that's it's got to be the first time anybody's ever said Jason Rasnick is angelic, but all I'm right, happy to right. be that guy. All, all right, right. Well, hey guys, I mean that was an awesome presentation, Patrick. And if you guys do have questions, feel free to get a hold of us, and we'll get it to them. Or go in, the, go in the platform. The platform is awesome. If you're not using the platform of media and networking, you're truly missing out. So, um, all right, Patrick. Yes. Welcome, Ryan Starks. Ryan, welcome from Century Business Consulting. Century is a, a very good friend of ours here at Benzinga. They're doing a lot of cool work in a number of different industries. And so I'm glad Ryan and Jason are here to talk about uh, what they're up to. Ryan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Ryan, right. th thank you for coming on. Yep, uh, appreciate exci it. Yep. Excited to talk to you guys. A lot of stuff going on in the markets and you guys seem to be sitting sort of in the middle of it and you are like this i talk about a thing behind a thing like technology companies and you your company kind of these biotech companies you help you help them function you help them do what they do today can you just give like the elevator pitch on century real quick sure thing so i think that's a great way to describe how we're working and, and helping our clients uh, and really our focus we're an accounting consulting firm so we're working and supporting our clients with their technical accounting, financial reporting, valuation, and, and internal control needs. So as companies in this space are raising capital and moving towards uh, needing audited financial statements many times for the first time, or working towards a, some kind of public offering, either through a traditional IPO or a SPAC, there's a lot of work that goes into that from an accounting perspective. And many times, you know, while the, the focus for these companies, and rightfully so, is on developing the science, they need the support from the accounting side to support their CFO and their team with all the financial statements and analyses that need to get prepared 
as they move towards these capital raising projects. Yeah, absolutely. And when you like, how long you been at Century for? I've been at Century uh, for about three years, uh, but uh, you know, based on the receding hairline, I've been doing this for quite a bit. So, <laughs> have you seen markets the way they are today, with the amount of, um, I guess, velocity that's happening, and you, and as a biotech company and your other industries have it and be able to move fast? Have you seen it like this before in your in your career of doing what you guys do at Century? I think this is a very unique time. I mean, there's always been an active market, particularly the last couple of years and in biotech in particular. Um, you know, I go back to even early, early 2000, late 90s with the tech boom. But, um, you know, I think more recently um, with the involvement of these SPACs, the, the number of transactions, the sheer volume has really been tremendous. Yeah, and where do you think this is all? Do you have a viewpoint on where this is all going? Um, and how? What would you advise? I guess these companies to do. I mean, um, if they're not already talking to you, they should be talking to you. But besides that, you know, where do you think this is all going? And what would you advise uh, these companies to do? Well, it's been really interesting during this past year, during a pandemic, the, the number of transactions, the volume of investment dollars going into this space in particular continues to grow. I read a statistic recently just on private investments uh, was up 27% from 2019, over $20 billion. And that's your series A, your series B. That's not even going public. That's just private dollars going in, okay? so. Clearly, the money and interest is there, and as the science continues to evolve, um, it's going to continue, uh, which I think is wonderful. Uh, for companies that are looking to raise money, um, either through private investment or ultimately through a public uh, process like an IPO or, or with a SPAC, um, really, you need to plan. You need to have your financials uh, up to speed so that they don't become a gating issue in closing a transaction. You want your auditors done and locked in and your, your timing of producing financial information uh, functioning as if you're a public company, okay? And I realize that could be a lot for private company early stages, but you wanna work towards that because getting that initial round of financing hopefully is just the beginning and it leads to the next round and then even potentially a public offering. And you wanna have kind of all cylinders going when that arises rather than playing catch up. Yeah, no, it makes sense. You don't, you don't want your accounting or auditing be the thing that holds you back when you could have a, you know, a generational impact. And yeah, I mean, that's why like, we thought you guys participating here to be just amazing because it takes a lot of things to make a company hum and make all those parts. It's not just selling the product or that making that invention. It's having great accounting. It's having great auditing. It's having the whole story together or tr truthfully investors aren't going to work with you. I mean, they're just not. And um, Ryan, what is, I mean, I, I'm jumping around a little bit, but I know you've been at Century for three years, but before that, like what's your background in the sense of, um, did you always see yourself working for these kind of companies, doing what you do? Um, were you like an advisor to companies? Like, how did you get to where you got today? Sure, sure. So um, I'm previously an audit partner at BDO, uh, working with life science companies. Uh, so what I decided to do was kind of get back to working with management directly. Uh, I did work in private industry for a period of time. I, I did kind of two stints at BDO. I worked at Pfizer in the early 2000s, where I ultimately led their SEC reporting group. Uh, so I, I've got some interesting experience, both from one of the largest companies in the world to working with middle market entrepreneurial based companies from my time at BDO. And really now at Century, our focus is on middle market and middle market, excuse me, and entrepreneurial based companies, because they're the companies that need a lot of help, ultimately. And that's what we do on an outsourced basis. We step in and support management and we can ramp up or ramp down as needed, uh, provide very focused support or a broader based support, uh, depending on the needs. Got it. 
Okay. Um, and then, I mean, I mean, that's all. I mean, like, look at your experience. I mean, you got, if you guys are listening in, I mean, he was at Pfizer on, on working on, I mean, that's, I mean, what kind more, more, what bigger company can you be with? Right. I, I don't know. So that kind of experience you're just not going to get. So, um, if you're not talking to Ryan Starks, you should be, um, how can Century like the, the SPAC route, I know you have a different opinions on the SPAC route. Um, if a company right now is listening, they're considering the SPAC route. Uh, what should the, what are a couple of things they should think about? Well, I, I think from a financial perspective, uh, you know, kind of staying in our lane, realize that the information you're going to need to provide is very similar to going public. You know, the number of years of financial statements and the various different analyses, you need to start operating and thinking like a public company, okay? Because you're you're filing with the SEC. Um, and, and so you need to get yourself to a point where you can operate post-merger, okay, as a public company, producing financial information and statements on 45-day period. Um, it's not an insignificant amount of effort to get to for companies. So again, plan ahead. Got it. Okay, now I'm switching to a little more broad thing on Century uh, Business Consulting. What industries do you specialize in? Um, I know you do, be, be, I know you go beyond biotech, but are there a few other industries that you'd wanna target that if someone's listening, they should um, connect with you guys? Yeah, I, I think, you know, for us, uh, our, our services and our, and our efforts tend to follow where the investment dollars go. So I would say currently we're, we're spending a lot of our time with life science companies, technology companies, uh, cannabis companies, and, and crypto uh, currency based companies. Uh, we, we're kind of industry agnostic in many ways. We can work with any industry, but those tend to be where the investment dollars have been and continue to be focused. And, and where our clients are, are kind of, uh, from an industry perspective, where, where they're landing currently. So you are, you are working with crypto-based companies too, uh, Ryan? We do, we do. Yeah, so that is interesting. Um, because, I mean, I'll, <laughs> you see Elon Musk tweeting that we'll take Bitcoin now. Um, so how should a company get in touch with you if they're looking to go the SPAC route or you know, wanna talk to you about potentially utilizing your services or just get a phone call and say, hey, you know, because I know these deals don't happen overnight, but it's the connections that are made today. I mean, if you're listening to this show, the connections that are made today are what can result in, in zeros at the end of your um, bottom line. It's not just selling your product. So what's the best way to usually get in touch with you guys? Uh, our website is usually the best way unless you'd like to reach out directly or point of contact. And, and most of our work comes from referrals. That's, yeah, I mean, and you're based on how many, where are you based out of now? Uh, we're currently in six markets. Uh, we've actually expanded pretty rapidly during the last year with uh, the, the, the shift towards a virtual environment. Uh, home, home base is in Philly and, and, and also Manhattan. Is there a minimum number of like employees you should have at your company before calling a century or uh, a revenue number? Like, is there a sweet spot? No, you know, I think I think typically for for our core clients, what we see a lot is, you know, usually there's a CFO in place, CEO, and 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 they're handling the five jobs plus the night work that they're typically handling, and then their accounting staff really hasn't been built up. They're they're capable of doing the day to day and the month to month, but here comes this unusual quirky transaction, and now they need help. And that's really where we can step in and, and help kind of produce and quarterback the process on their behalf. Okay. Now this question, I don't know. I don't know if you'll have an answer, but you've been in this industry. So you've seen, I bet you have worked with companies that were as small as 10 people that are now a thousand people, like mm -hmm. high growth companies. If that's the case, and I think it is, but if that's the case, what's a piece of advice you could offer these companies that are going through growing pains like they're growing but they don't have the necessary people like what are some tricks of the trade that like maybe you saw hmm that that thing that that company did to help grow really made an impact like are there any like to like advice you could offer if there's i mean i'm putting you on the spot because i haven't oh, but I just, okay. 
I, yeah, okay. You know, I think I think if I look at it more from that earlier stage company that's that's trying to move up, right? What what can they do as they're trying to plan ahead? A lot of times it's making sure that your debt and your equity transactions are complete. You have a good grasp on where they all are. I know that sounds simple, but it, it depending on the number of raises and transactions, it can be voluminous. Um, and, and make sure you've got the accounting and valuations locked in on those so that when, when that time comes that you're producing your financial statements, you have it all ready because some of the challenges that we see all the time is looking back and, oh, I did this raise, I gave these warrants to my friend six years ago and now you're like, okay, I issued preferred stock with warrants eight years ago. <laughs> Now you have to kind of rebuild everything and that just takes time. So and as you're being current, keep keep track of all this. And can, can Century help me with that or do Absolutely. I have to go to a law firm for that? Okay, so then no, you guys no, do that. we can help so. you with all of that. In fact, that's really what we do is we'll take the technical accounting, we can help you with the valuations and we bring it all together into the financial statements. Lo I love it. I mean, I love it because as business owners, it's the last thing we think about <laughs> getting that stuff or, organized, right? Um, yeah, yeah, it, it does, you know, it, it tends to present some challenges for folks, but but more and more people, uh, you know, have have been staying ahead of it. It it works um, for us when, when we're able to help and then that's what we enjoy is helping right. these companies get to the next stage. All right. Well, Ryan, I see Patrick awesome. giving me us the boot, but Ryan Starks. Get Century, out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Century, Century Business Consulting. If you guys uh, aren't familiar, go to their site. It's very in-depth, several industries that they're involved with and big company. Give them a ring, give them a holler, at least pick their brain. You know, like, hey, nothing like free advice, but, but then you want to pay for it because free advice is only as good as free. You know what I mean? So thank you, Ryan. Fair point. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Jason. Much appreciated, man. We're looking forward to a great rest of the day. Maybe I'll see you a little bit later. Hopefully, hopefully. All right. Moving right along, my friends, I get to introduce uh, one of my pals, a guy that I am always happy to see uh, in front of our audience. This is Aras Azadian, the CEO and co-founder of Avacana. A-V-C-N-F is the company. A-V-C-N-F. Uh, Aras has really been an OG in this space, man. So it's always good to see you. I'll let you jump right in, brother. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Nice to see you. And thanks for having me on on, on the, the biotech version of these conferences. Of course. Um, pleasure to be here. Thanks for, for taking the time to listen in on our presentation, everyone. I'll, I'll commence by sharing the presentation. All right. Well, again, thanks again for, for taking the time. Uh, my name is Aras Azadian. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of the company. Uh, the company was originally accepted in 2015 as a drug development and biopharmaceutical company focused on naturally derived cannabinoids. Uh, fast forward a few years, six years to be specific, the company is now a vertically integrated company operating in various markets, specifically focused in South America and North America with our headquarters in Canada. And we are focused on three finished product categories, including functional skin care in the form of Pure Earth, medical cannabis in the form of Rofido, and then we have a pharmaceutical pipeline of drugs that are indication specific, either in clinical development or today in registration stage. And I will expand on all three of the categories. As a summary of the company, as I mentioned, we are a vertically integrated company that, is, that are in commercial stage, so the unique part about being a biopharmaceutical company, but being involved in the cannabinoid space is that we have had early wins and early access to markets through our cosmetic and medical cannabis categories. We do have a comprehensive commercial portfolio that covers consumer products in the form of cosmetics, medical and pharmaceuticals. Our footprint is across the United States from a commercial perspective, Canada from head office management, R&D, clinical, and then Latin America in form of vertical integration, cultivation, extraction, and commercialization. We have a partnership that's very important for us, which is the largest pharmacy chain in Canada, Shoppers Drug Mart, and we've had an incredibly successful rollout of our medical program and, and, and a great proof of concept with medical adoption in Canada with our medical line. 
We have established what we believe is an industry leading scientific platform within the space, which is five to six years of R&D, preclinical, clinical development, the entire intellectual property portfolio within uh, our R&D our division is as Abicana's. So it's all built in house for Abicana. And we've been able to commercialize several product lines out of that R&D platform that we, we take a lot of pride in. We're part of a Johnson & Johnson uh, biotech incubator called Jade Labs uh, in Toronto. And we're part of the Mars Discovery District of Toronto. And we've established incredible uh, world leading and world-class collaborations with major medical and clinical institutions so far in Canada and now spreading that globally as well. From a vertical integration perspective, we decided to cultivate and to build our enterprise really in South America, where we have cultivation costs, advantages, and also from an environmental and sustainability perspective, it's the right jurisdictions, the right area to be cultivating. We are USDA organic certified on our hemp cultivation today. And we are ranked amongst the we are ranked highest amongst cannabis related companies with an S&P Global Index last year. Getting into the R&D, again, I think this is very, very timely and uh, considering uh, the, the sector from a cannabinoid side is really starting to segment and you're starting to see a more, much more focus towards you know, the biotech, the biopharmaceutical, the evidence-based approach that we've been taking for six years. Uh, some points of pride over the last year, we've attained over 10 grants uh, from, from various government uh, uh, institutions in Canada for the research and clinical work we do towards cannabinoids. The team today comprises of about 10 plus MDs and PhDs. So it's a very deep pharmaceutical and scientific team. As I mentioned, comprehensive intellectual property, which is all ours with 20 plus, I think that's more, it's more now at 25 plus commercial products that have come out of that R&D pipeline. Head of, headquarters, part of the, the Mars Discovery District, which is the Silicon Valley of biotech really in Canada. From an R&D collaboration perspective, we took, a, we took an approach of, because we're a strictly medical and biotech company, we took the approach of collaborating with some of the top minds and some of the top institutions in Canada. That includes the University of Toronto's Faculty of Pharmacy, University Health Network, UHN, which is the largest medical institution in, in Canada. Uh, we work with the University of Guelph on a lot of the preclinical work. So we've had incredible support from the, the academic and medical community in Canada. And it, considering Canada, it's a federal legislation, we've had the flexibility to actually work with some of these top minds from our federally regulated perspective. Getting into the products, Pure Earth is the first commercialized product that we had. It's a consumer product line focused on hemp-derived CBD. And from a regulatory perspective, hemp-derived CBD, <clears throat> CBD allows us to put these products initially over the counter as a consumer product line. The, the formulary or the line of products includes 13, excuse me, 13 skincare products that are combining CBD with other natural excipients um, that are active. As an example for, for acne or clear skin treatment, we're, we're leveraging off of the monographs existing and the efficacy of rosemary extract and tea tree oil in combination with CBD. Um, in the case of eczema, we're leveraging off of colloidal oatmeal. Um, and there, the other formulations, the other products are covering targets such as dark spots, under eye, et cetera. So these products are now commercial in South America, launching with our partners in the United States, red, white, and blue next quarter, commercializing in Canada in the next few weeks with Shoppers Drug Mart and some of our adult use uh, partners and, and, and channels. And in the European Union, they've already been registered as cosmetics and are being exported currently to Brazil and Ecuador. So early win for us on the cosmetic side, uh, what, what makes this line truly unique from a, from, from a CBD perspective is that we've actually conducted human clinical trials and successfully completed them early 2020. Uh, these, three of these products were selected and enrolled into human studies in which we had very successful results. We're currently in the process of publishing those results, but we are also leveraging off of those results today for marketing purposes. Uh, from our understanding, this is the world's only known uh, CBD skincare line that actually has human clinical results completed. The next product category, which is very important for us today is the, is the medical line. We have an advanced medical formulary of cannabis products that are CBD or CBD and THC offered in various drug delivery methods and are offered within cannabis regulations. For example, in Canada, that's medical cannabis. In a, in a country like South America, they're, they're under the compound pharmacy model. In the United Kingdom, they'll be under the compassionate care model. 
So we are leveraging off cannabis specific regulations to provide products that are not indication specific. We can call them essentially general and are designed really to treat comorbidities that are prevalent in a number of clinical pathologies that exist. You know, there's, there's, there's existing literature and evidence from anecdotal and clinical perspective that cannabinoids can have significant efficacy and support uh, from symptom management to comorbidities that, again, prevalent in a number of clinical pathologies in areas such as oncology, neurology, psychiatric disorders, GI, neurological disorders, and pain. And these products are really designed to provide the patients and medical community within the cannabis regulations a standardized medicine, you know, using CBD and THC. So we took a typical drug development process to that. We took the, the pharmaceutical pathway that we would take for a drug, formulation development, optimization, preclinical, in vitro, stability, in vivo. And we designed these products to not only be accurately dose stable and have higher absorption and bioavailability, in the case of the tissue gel, have higher absorption and ensure that they get past the skin membrane, but also to make sure these products are a pleasant experience for the consumers from a taste perspective, from a smell perspective. And then finally, to make those doses accurate, which allows physicians and patients to actually enroll in, 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 in regimens related to titration and dosing. Some highlights of the formulary. This is what we believe the most scientifically advanced formulary products in Canada today. It's the number of sublingual sprays, oil drops that are microemulsions, and topical gels that are deep tissue. We've had a successful launch with Shoppers Drug Mart in Canada, um, and that's where the, the product line is now leading. It's supported with education and patient support. In every market that we launch these products, it's not just having advanced products, but it's providing the education and training that physicians, patients, and consumers need to have to ensure that these products are safely administrated and to increase the probability of, of, of success within the patient care. The, the products are also offered with the evidence and training that, that, that is provided to the physicians in the form of education modules, CME courses, dosing guidelines, and, and healthcare practitioner packages. Again, accurate dosing, consistent delivery, batch over batch, time over time, total 20 SKUs, CBD, THC, and in some formats, CBD only, where we're leveraging off purified CBD. All the products are inhalation free, and the product lines are now going to be expanded into major hospitals in the Canadian marketplace as a first major market where we'll be working with institutions as well. We had a successful launch with Shoppers Drug Run, as I mentioned, in Q3 2020. Uh, since then, the product lines have, have done substantially better. We, we continue to see quarter over quarter, month over month revenue increase. We continue to see more and more adoption by, by, by physicians. Today, we have over 400 prescribers and physicians that are recommending our products. We're working with over 15 clinics. Some interesting demographics, which are substantially contrary to the adult use market, is the fact that these products have actually, we've been successfully able to segment and target actual patients that are looking for wellness and, 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 and medical benefits of cannabinoids. If you look at the demographics, it's actually 53% women, which is unlikely, uh, which is contrary to what you would see on the adult use or the recreational market with, where the consumers are predominantly males between the age of 20 to 30. The other factor that's interesting for us is the age. We are seeing that most of our sales are adults older than 30 years old. So we've been, again, successfully able to segment the population that's adults, professionals that are looking for actual treatment and benefits of medical cannabis. Finally, in the Canadian marketplace, we realize that while the medical market is about $300 million today, the adult use market is closer to $3 billion. And, and we realize that within the adult use market, there is a large portion of the, those consumers that are buying these products for medical and wellness purposes. However, they don't want to go through the process of getting medical documentation and prescription. So from a sake of accessibility, there, there's some limitations there. And therefore, we decided to launch our products within the adult use market through the provincial uh, brands and the provincial government in Canada. And we are in the process of doing that, and we expect to be uh, available within the adult use market in the next few weeks. So this is, again, a much larger market, but we're still providing the products as medical and wellness within a, an easier and a more accessible format. We've done the same thing in Colombia, where we are vertically integrated. We are cultivating, extracting, manufacturing the products. And in Colombia, we have had the opportunity to, 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 to actually prescribe these products. From Physicians can actually prescribe these products for particular indications, and we actually deliver these products to the patients. In Colombia, we're also working with institutions in which we're supplying major clinics and hospitals with these products as well. This was launched late December and has, has, now, been, has, has now been scaling up. 
The program has its own education, patient support, and finally, the products are also going to be expanded into other markets in South America. Getting into the pharmaceutical pipeline, I think it's very important to cover this. On the pharmaceutical indication specific side, we take really three different formats and we take three different strategies. We're working on generic pharmaceuticals. We're in the process of registering several of those, including cannabinoids in South America. Now, we work with natural several of those now as well. And then we have our own indication specific pipeline of drugs that are going through clinical development. In that form, we're looking at the drugs and the, and the, the target areas that we're targeting are ep epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, spasticity, chronic pain, anxiety and depression, epidermolysis bullosa is a rare disease, rare skin disease, and osteoarthritis is a clinical project that is proceeding, which is the topical gel. A quick look at the clinical pipeline. The cosmetic trials are completed, products are commercialized. On the Rho Fido side, we have the luxury of doing conducting real world evidence studies with major medical institutions in Canada, since the products are now commercialized. And then our pharmaceutical pipeline is only focused on the rare diseases in which we are clinically developing. On the phytotherapeutic and generic pharmaceutical side, it's a GMP pharmaceutical manufacturing that allows us to actually register such drugs without going through full clinical development. A quick look at our supply chain. So Avicana, as I mentioned, is vertically integrated. And the, 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 the company was really built around a pharmaceutical quality centric plan. But we realized that very early on in 2017, that if we don't control the, the quality of the API, the active pharmaceutical ingredients, the costs, we're going, to, we're going to be facing challenges from a regulatory perspective, quality perspective, and cost perspective. And therefore, we've built our own supply chain in which our cannabinoids are actually supplied from our vertical integration in South America, which, as I mentioned earlier, is USDA organic as well, meaning that it's sustainable. So we're in Santa Marta, Colombia, where it's an optimal climate with the perfect amount of sun hours every, year, every month, 12 hours of sunlight. Uh, we have the right climate, right humidity levels, and we're also doing the extraction and the purification and the fractionation of the cannabinoids there as well. This business unit is designed to be the supply chain of Avicana, but it is actually its own revenue driver as well, in which we are supplying API to other pharmaceutical companies and actually providing standardized, feminized seeds to other cultivation companies as well. Taking a look at our cap tables, the company... Uh, is very very tightly held still so after five years several fundraisings the company has had issued total of 41 million shares uh, the company is very tightly held by its management board um, and a lot of institutions that have been with us since inception or have recently joined the company that includes tasty pharmaceuticals in china several funds out of south america several funds out of the united states and canada so we take pride in being non-dilutive when possible. Uh, of course, 2020 was a tough year, uh, especially any, any company that was associated to cannabinoids was, was substantially hurt. Uh, the company minimized its fundraisings to, to essentially what was necessary and has been able to reduce costs and in parallel increase revenue. I, I will go through the bios of everyone. Uh, this is obviously available. I can just tell you the executive team named here have been with us since the beginning. Uh, the company has been together and everyone comes from professional walks of life. Um, as a TSX pharmaceutical issuer, R&D issuer, we take our board of directors very seriously and we're proud to have a, a, a prestigious board of, uh, board of directors that, is, that acts as mentors and board members. Uh, again, bios of the group are available uh, online and on our, on our uh, in, in the presentation, and I won't take up everyone's time to review them. But again, as a TSX senior issuer, we also have an independent board. We have an independent board committee as well. Upcoming milestones that are very important for us, uh, we just want to touch on Rofido across retail channels and adult use, as I mentioned. That's going to be taking place over the next couple of weeks. Expansion of Pura, the skincare line, actually into Canada, Ecuador, and the United States. Uh, commercialization of the new partnership that we formed with Al Harrington, former NBA player and a topical formulation. He's launching the United States and Canada, where we are the intellectual property, we are the formulations. Commercialization of his socially equitable brand, Viola, in Canada. So our Q2 milestones are basically all commercial, and we're at, we're at a very, very exciting stage where years of development, years of vertical integration, infrastructure build out and, and R&D has led to the commercialization and now expansion of these products. And in the second half of 2021, we expect to get our first indication specific pharmaceutical drugs registered and have marketing authorization. 
We expect to, to be able to conclude some of our real world evidence studies and observational clinical trials related to rural phyto. We expect to proceed into a phase two pharmaceutical trial on epidermolysis bullosa and to be able to expand row and pure into more markets. So it's a very exciting year for us. 2021 is our breakout year and I believe Q2 2021 is a major quarter for us. Are you cutting me off, Patrick? You've got one minute, my friend, hit him. All right, I'm gonna go fast. Uh, from an investment highlight perspective, uh, what the way I would present is we're, we are completely de-risked in our, from our perspective. The company is now in commercial stage, so years of R&D, clinical development, regulatory approvals. Uh, we, we've, we're diversified, scalable business models in which we're covering skincare, medical, and pharmaceutical. Experience management team, we've been here since 2015, 2016. Intellectual property powerhouse. And of course, we're taking a disruptive, uh, disruptive approach to pharmaceutical and medical development. World-class partnerships from you know, J&J Incubation to, to Shoppers Drug Mart, some of the largest medical and academic institutions in the world, to controlling our own destiny through vertical integration. It's as fast as I can go, Patrick, what do you think? Well done, man, well done. I mean, we've got some comments in the chat. We don't have time for them today, but I'll send you these questions and maybe I can throw them back at our investors. The key thing to know here, you guys, is that you know, Aras and his team have been developing this company and their product lines for a while. And, and now they're at the stage all of, that should make all of you very happy, right? It's, it's less about R&D. It's more about commercialization. Many catalysts coming up in the near term for this company. So it's, it's going to be an exciting time to watch. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, it's a very, very exciting time for us. Yeah. Well, Aras, thanks for being here, man. We really appreciate it. Aras is and again, my friends from Avicana. AVCNF is the ticker. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for having me. Take care. A pleasure. A pleasure, a pleasure. That was awesome. Um, and thanks to you guys in the chat for those questions. I'll make sure that they, they make their way to the Avicana team. Next up, let's keep this rolling. Uh, the ticker is LXXGF on the OTC and LXG on the TSXV. This is Lexagene and Dr. Jack Regan, their CEO and founder. Jack, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure, it's my pleasure. I'll let you dive right in. I'm sure we'll have some questions coming for you. So uh, we'll, we'll let you go ahead. Okay, I am obviously at the wrong slide. So thanks for having me. So we're gonna change gears a little bit here and talk about molecular testing, specifically uh, looking for pathogens. So I am the CEO of Lexagene. I appreciate the opportunity of your attention over this next 20 minutes, and I'll dive right into the presentation. So our disclaimer slide, obviously this slide deck is available on our website, um, as is a lot of other information. So I encourage you to go visit our website. So a quick overview of Lexagene. We are a molecular diagnostics company. We are located just north of Boston. We currently have 40 employees. We're growing quite rapidly. We have just over 9 million in the treasury today. So our commercial system is called the MyQ Lab. It is a rapid, fully automated pathogen detection system. It is designed for ease of use, basically providing that high quality answer at the point of need. We have achieved our first commercial sales. We are also pursuing the FDA emergency use authorization for COVID-19 testing. We've also placed our instruments into early access uh, veterinary hospitals for their use. So if you're curious about the, the word Lexagene and where it came from. The etymology of the word is such that Lexagene, Lexa has Greek meaning. It means the defender of humankind. And gene is actually what the instrument detects. Combine them together, you get Lexagene. We view ourselves as a company looking to really improve the, the health of, of people and animals uh, to make our lives you know, safer and more enjoyable. So on to our markets. So our technology at its simplest form is designed to really simplify do, doing genetic testing. So genetic testing is important across many different markets. We have human clinical diagnostics markets. We have the veterinary diagnostics market, food safety, as well as open access. Open access for us is a catch bin for a lot of other applications where genetic testing is important. What we do is we provide a very high quality answer in a short period of time where samples are collected. This is different from sending a sample to a reference lab where immediately you are waiting at least a day, if not three or four days, if not more, to get those results back. Time generally is money, it has an impact. There is a need for faster testing. 
PCR being the gold standard, it, it's a complicated technology. We have reduced the complexity into a very simple, easy to use instrument. So taking a deeper dive into these markets, each and every one of these markets are, are big in their own right. Obviously the human clinical diagnostic market has exploded with COVID-19. The veterinary diagnostics market is a very much underserved market. When I started this company four years ago, uh, my focus was on veterinary diagnostics and food safety because they're underserved and they don't have the regulatory hurdle of the FDA. Obviously the human clinical diagnostics is the bigger market. Uh, nonetheless, that regulatory hurdle does prevent a challenge for a small company like Lexagene. Nonetheless, the pandemic and the EUA has provided, if you will, a shortcut to get in to human clinical diagnostic testing much earlier than otherwise would be possible. So again, back to our value prop. Our value prop is taking the gold standard chemistry that's traditionally done in reference labs, which everybody trusts, and moving that gold standard chemistry out of the reference lab and placing it at the point of need, whether you're dealing with a sick patient, being a person or an animal, or doing other types of testing, such as looking for contaminants in a bioreactor used to develop a vaccine, for instance. So our technology not only automates PCR, the gold standard, but it's capable of doing 27 PCR tests at once on a particular sample. This is called multiplex testing. Another phrase for this that's often used in the industry is called syndromic testing. Syndromes are disease states that can be caused by many different organisms. This is our strength, our value prop. If you look at other companies in the space that do syndromic testing, for instance, some of you may have recently uh, seen the name Genmark in the news. We've referred to Genmark as a co comparator to ourselves. They're a pure diagnosis company. They were just recently bought by Roche for 1.8 billion. That company was really founded in like 19, uh, 1993. And so certainly they've had a head start, but we believe our technology is a better technology than theirs. We believe we'll be able to steal market share from them. And so we see our company as a, a growing company that uh, will be taking effectively a, a, a larger piece of the pie moving forward. So early studies have shown that our technology returned 8.2% uh, concordance compared to reference lab data. We do have a razor blade business model with high profit margins. This is one of the areas where I think we excel on, on Genmark, where their profit margins were, I think they quote around 39%. Uh, we have a, a strong patent portfolio. So in regards to COVID testing, again, I founded this company uh, with the goal of first uh, entering, you know, veterinary diagnostics and food safety, establishing a foothold first there, then going to human clinical diagnostics. But the whole pandemic has put a tremendous amount of, of pressure and, if you will, focus on the company to enter this COVID-19 testing. And certainly we are working um, our way through the FDA studies to allow us to provide testing to the human clinical market for COVID-19 testing. It's important to note that you can very easily argue that the current tests on the market today have failed to contain this uh, particular pathogen. What's particularly troublesome, and it should be for all the people who are you know, viewing this presentation, is the fact that we have these variants that are emerging that you know, are more contagious, you know, more pathogenic, and also frighteningly uh, possible to evade the vaccines that are out there. This puts us in a position where this pandemic may last for years if these variants keep on basically spreading you know, without any um, abatement. And so what is preventing our ability to contain the spread is our ability to rapidly move a new test that identifies these variants to the point of care where time to result is critical so you can identify those people, make sure they're effectively placed in the quarantine, they don't have the opportunity to infect other individuals. Our technology is, uh, called an open access technology. So although we are developing validated tests you know, for coronavirus, the technology itself allows for new tests to be very quickly added onto the system to allow for strain identification. This is important because if you wanna quickly identify the South African, the, the UK, there's now strains out of New York and California. If you wanna identify these quickly, our platform is arguably gonna be the best platform to help prevent the spread of new viruses. And so this is something that we believe the industry is going to catch on to uh, and really promote uh, and adopt in, in, the, in the near term. So in regards to COVID testing, again, I do not want you to think of LexGene as only a COVID market. We're gonna get into veterinary diagnostics and, and food safety in a bit, but quickly in regards to COVID testing, some of the tests out there, they are very, very fast uh, and that is uh, a great attribute. However, they have some serious drawbacks. Here you have isothermal tests and antigen tests. 
isothermal and antigen tests fast, but they lack sensitivity and they also lack the ability to multiplex. Why is multiplexing important? Again, one, for strain identification. Two, respiratory illness can be caused by a lot of different pathogens, not just coronavirus. You, you have influenza, RSV, adenovirus, the list goes on and on. If you have somebody who's symptomatic and they test positive, great, you know what they have. What happens if they're symptomatic and they test negative? You're like, okay, well, was it a false negative? You know, what was it? This is where you have the value of a multiplex test because if the person is symptomatic, you should detect what's causing the illness. And there's a great need for this highly multiplexed technology. This is again why Genmark got purchased for 1.8 billion. Again, we also automate PCR. PCR is considered the gold standard. In contrast, the isothermal tests, the antigen tests, these are not gold standard chemistries. They generally miss about 25, sometimes even higher percentage of positive samples. That's just not good enough. What that means is when those tests are used, you know, if you're testing 100 people who are sick, you're sending at least 25, if not 30 or 40 people home, telling them they're free and clear of disease when in fact that's not the case. Lexigen has always been about quality testing and providing the most accurate tests available. And this is why we've decided to automate the gold standard chemistry. So now on to veterinary diagnostics. So like humans, animals get sick. They're often sick with very similar pathogens. And so it's a great opportunity for Lexigen to get into a market which is not as highly regulated as human clinical diagnostics. We do not need to go through the FDA to sell our technology into the vet space. And we've already begun selling. So our current panel is again, not just looking for one pathogen, but here we're looking for 20 different targets. Our first panel looks for seven different um, bac bacteria that cause the most common infections in dogs and cats. We have additional 13 other markets, mar markers that look for antimicrobial resistance factors. This allows the veterinarian to quickly identify what's causing the infection and it informs them on how best to treat it. You've probably heard of these superbugs. Bacteria are acquiring resistance to the therapies that we prescribe. There hasn't been a new class of antibiotics developed in the last 20 years and the incidence of highly resistant uh, bacteria is growing really rapidly and is a huge concern where experts are predicting, you know, antimicrobial resistant bacteria are going to kill more people than cancer by the year 2050. And so it's a great concern. There's a great need for this, not only in veterinary medicine, but also again, in human medicine, which we also will be uh, targeting in the future. So recognize that there's a huge need here. It is an underserved market. There are no in-hospital PCR tests available in the veterinary space. We are the first. Now on to food safety. You know, food is something that it's a massive industry. There's many illnesses every single year. These illnesses have driven uh, policy changes uh, from the government. There's a Food Modernization Act, which is requiring companies to do more frequent testing and subject themselves to more audits. And really these food producers are looking to protect their brand and prevent a recall, which can cost you know, tens of millions of dollars. It's a huge industry. We believe our costs are low enough to service this industry. We can provide highly sensitive tests looking for the targets of interest and really penetrate this space where other molecular testing platforms are too expensive. We believe the costs of our consumables are low enough at high volume manufacturing for us to be very successful in this market. Open access testing. So open access is for us a catch bin. Um, the difference between open access and these other markets I just described those other markets are more applied markets where we develop and validate panels and we sell a panel to a customer. Open access, the way to refer to this or think of this is really a custom test. A user comes to us, they have a custom need, we help provide them that test either from us or they themselves can put their own test on our system and we allow for that. So our first sale was in the open access sector. And for us, that meant that a company came to us, which we wasn't expecting, and they wanted our system to detect different contaminants in bioreactors. They happened to be a major multi-billion dollar drug manufacturer, and they wanted a better way to detect contaminants in the bioreactors. We provided them a test and they bought the system. It's just one example across the pharma, biotech, research sectors where there is a need for automation and the previous speaker spoke about you know, cannabis and cannabinoids. The cannabis and agriculture sector is a sector which needs to screen for you know, fungal contaminants and also contaminants that can be of danger to humans. A great opportunity for Lexigen. So there's many sectors where we feel our technology would be of great benefits. Too hard to name them all. So we fit them under the open access bin because our technology is flexible and easily 
configured by the end user. So a little bit about myself and the history of the technology. So I am PhD trained in influenza biology. I went on to work at a national lab where I get involved with a group of very talented scientists and engineers developing automated instruments for really the Department of Homeland Security. And we had money from them to build a next generation biodetector that was gonna be adopted into BioWatch. And so the Department of Homeland Security obviously is looking to protect the American public uh, from a bioterrorist event. And so we built a system designed to look for anthrax, smallpox, and plague, among other select agents. And we effectively proved it worked and the Department of Homeland Security adopted the te technology. I was the lead author on the paper describing that technology, plus a sister instrument that was used in the clinic for respiratory illnesses, very like looking at flu and adenovirus and RSV, also the more conventional coronavirus. And from my experience with these, uh, with these technologies, I recognize their greatness, but also some of their weaknesses. And I looked to improve those weaknesses. So I designed a new system, had it filed, um, uh, the patents filed by the national lab. And it's that new improved technology that Lexigen has now commercialized. But it's important to recognize that this technology does have a history that was successful. We're just making a better system, leveraging some of the successes of those previous instruments. On to the company financials. So again, we have a razor blade business model. And so there are two components to it. And I think you guys you know, can all see my face here. This is our single use disposable cartridge. It's designed to receive a sample into this uh, little uh, chamber. You close the chamber, you slide it into the entry point at the face of the instrument. This is used to purify genetic material in the sample. The other part of our consumable is called an assay panel. This is where we put the PCR tests to have uh, the instrument direct testing for either coronavirus, E. coli, salmonella, or what have separating out sample prep with PCR detection and the way in which we fill these. These are just basically microcentrifuge vials. It's a very low cost way to provide genetic testing. Because of this form factor, it allows us to basically mass produce our consumables at very low cost to us and we can then therefore be you know, cost competitive uh, when it's a selling uh, opportunity and really provide a high quality test at a lower cost and allows us to get into these markets which are very cost sensitive. So looking at the company, you know, we have been public uh, since 2016. Again, headquarters is north of Boston. We currently have 40 employees. Here's our cap table. Again, you can see this on our website. Uh, the, the most important thing here is that we you know, have done a series of capital raises. We now believe we're past the risk point of the company. We've raised over $28 million. We still have $9 million in the bank. Um, we are, of course, listed on the, on the TSX and also the OTC. So obviously, a, a company is not just about the technology, but the team bringing that technology to market. And I am very proud of the team that I've recruited. Uh, their bios are available on the website. You're free to look at their bios. Uh, overall, they come from a lot of experience helping develop and launch companies. And I've been leveraging uh, their expertise to help guide the company and make the smartest decisions possible. And you know, collectively, a lot of experience across this group. It's not just the upper management and the board of directors of the company, it's also our scientific advisors. And so some of our scientific advisors you know, are, are really you know, luminaries in their fields. You have Dr. Kimothy uh, Smith, uh, James Marsden, you know, Shelley Rankin, and, and, and Sean Stevens. All these individuals, again, you know, really considered you know, key opinion leaders in their fields. Um, when, when, they something, when they say something, often you know, people listen and they follow. And so they are advocates of technology, of technology particularly Lexgene's technology big supporters of the company and very fortunate to have them part of our team. So quick summary here, our technology called the MyQ Lab, uh, it meets a very critical need uh, for pathogen detection. And the fact that we are open access, if I haven't already mentioned it, it is, uh, the MyQ Lab is the only system on the market today that is open access that allows for point of care, highly multiplexed PCR testing. That feature is something which we're gonna, is really gonna drive sales. We provide a rapid turnaround time, again, fully automated. The technology is commercially available, and, and we are actively uh, pursuing FDA for COVID-19 testing. So I think that's my last slide. So thank you very much for your attention.
Dr. Regan, thank you so much. I wonder if you have time for just two questions. We've got about a minute left here. Um, the first is just uh, the the FDA approval that you're seeking right now. Um, I, I would imagine you know you you can say what you can here, but uh, any feedback you can give us around timing or uh, or, or anything related to that decision or, or approval? Yeah, well, I, I can tell you what I can tell you. So you know, going to the FDA again, it's something that. You know, when I founded the company, I targeted vet diagnostic and food safety just because I recognized the challenges of going through the FDA. Most, most companies who have gone through the FDA already had systems on the market. And so we have not yet even presented our technology to the FDA yet because we're working on all the data that the FDA requires. We're working on IEC 61010. This is basically confirming that our system is electrically sound. We're not going to shock somebody working all the software validation, making sure a third party validates the software. So when our system goes through the FDA, it's not just the liquid chemistry test. And there are like 200 liquid chemistry tests that have already been through the FDA. It's not fair to compare us to that because in that case, you have a company basically getting a liquid chemistry that's designed to be operated in a reference lab. And for us, we have to put our entire hardware, software, firmware, and chemistry through the FDA. So it is a longer process. Sure. We are making great progress. Uh, it, it's impossible for us to give a, a, an exact timeline um, in regards to our submission, but we are making steady progress on that. Great, thank you. And then just very, very briefly here, overall market share. So you're saying that this is the only uh, product out there with, with the sort of open access features that you, you were describing. Um, are there other companies out there that are sort of in the same space, uh, just in a different way, or or is this, unique and singular? The fact that we are open access and highly multiplex, we are a completely unique technology. And again, that is something that we are defining the market. It's allowing people who customarily have to do manual PCR testing to buy an automated solution. And it's hard to, again, get your, number, your mind around how big that market is because you're talking about the pharmaceutical industry, the academics, the governments. There's a lot of people who want to do customized testing, but they don't have the opportunity because there's nothing that can be automated. They have to do it manually, and doing it manually is time, time intensive, time intensive, and also expensive. So we're very excited to make a name for ourselves with this, with this very unique technology. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jack Regan. Thank you so much for joining us, Lexagene LXXGF, my friends. Jack, thank, thank you. you so much. All right, moving right along, my friends. Um, somebody who should be no stranger to our audience, Kyle Detweiler, the CEO of Clever Leaves, CLVR on the NASDAQ. Kyle, as we bring you over, I'm sure there's some fun things to talk about uh, in, in this crazy market. How are you, my friend? Hey, yeah, doing well, doing well. Good, good. Well, I will let you get started and, I, and I'll monitor the chat for questions and hopefully come back before the end here. All right, perfect. Um, well, yeah, great, great to see everybody this morning. Um, I'm Kyle Detweiler. I'm the CEO of, of Cleverly's. Uh, Cleverly's motto is to cultivate mojo, create value, and change lives. Um, and we are publicly traded under the NASDAQ under the ticker CLVR. Uh, uh, so who is, uh, who is Cleverly's? Uh, Cleverly's is one of the largest low-cost producers of cannabis outside of North America. Uh, you know, we are very well funded. We've raised a quarter of a billion dollars of capital approximately. We have about $80 million of cash on hand, it's about three bucks a share. Uh, we have one of the largest global cultivation footprints uh, on the planet uh, in Colombia, where we are, uh, you know, probably best known for our operations. Uh, you know, we have nearly half of an entire country's quota to produce THC, and that equates to approximately 18% of the global quota as mandated by the United Nations itself. Uh, we are the only company in the world to have an EU GMP certification, an Invima GMP certification, and GACP certification. A lot of acronyms. I'll explain a little bit more what those mean, but uh, you know, also being designated as a project of national and strategic interest uh, by the Colombian government gives us a number of influential uh, paths to, to, to market. Uh, we believe that as the cannabis industry legalizes, we are one of the most levered opportunities to, uh, to attack the United States if, uh, if legalization does uh, occur the way we hope it was. Uh, and we also do have a, a bit of a hedge through a non-cannabis operation in the U.S. that should allow us uh, access. 
But first, we, we talk, about, talk about Cleverly's as a multinational operator, uh, and I'd like to explain what that means, because I think a lot of people are familiar with Canadian cannabis companies, they're familiar with U.S. multi-state or single-state operators, but Cleverly's is very different. You know, Cleverly's was founded on a simple idea that cannabis production was not built where it made economic or environmental sense. It was built where it was first legalized. However, that's a very myopic view about what an industry will look like. And as legalization occurs, I think people will start to recognize the virtues of our business model. Unlike an MSO, which has to build operations in every single state it operates, having 17 management teams, 17 facilities, or 17 different uh, go-to-market strategies, you know, if we want to sell to a whole new country, we build a couple more greenhouses next to the 18 we already have in Colombia, use the same supply chain, same extraction fa uh, factory, uh, it's a lot more efficient. And so as you think about legalization, think hard about how legalization will happen. And if you believe that, you know, borders will, will open up, international cannabinoids will, will, uh, will, will flow, you know, Cleverly is, an, is excellently positioned to, to benefit from that, that world. So today we're about 500 people globally. Uh, we're again best known for our Colombian operation. We have 1.8 million square feet of cultivation there. Uh, we also were recently licensed in Europe uh, because Colombia only allows us to sell or export extracted products. Uh, we needed a home for flour and Portugal has the benefits of, of course, being within the European Union, even post Brexit, uh, that it gives us some regulatory advantages as well. But now that we've proven to the world that we can produce the product, extract the product, and wrap it up in this, in this coveted EU GMP, it's all about distribution now. We have a number of exciting partnerships in Brazil, Canopy Growth, uh, uh, Green Care, um, uh, Entourage were recently announced in Europe. We have two importers, so to bring cannabis into the country, you have to use a controlled substance importer. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And of course, our U.S. nutraceutical operation uh, gives us some advantages and call options for the U.S. So Colombia, just to level set, um, surprises most people to learn that seven in 10 cut flower imports to the United States come from Colombia. It's where flowers belong. Uh, we we kind of say that internally, if you're building a facility for cannabis in Canada or maybe some parts of the United States, you're trying to trick cannabis into feeling like it's being grown in Colombia, and we get that for free because we don't have to have, uh, you know, we don't have to compete with snow or, you know, uh, darkness during, uh, you know, big parts of the season, you know, kind of like oil or manufacturing, there are better places in the world to do this. In, in Colombia, with 12 hours of sunlight, you know, we also grow at a very high elevation down in Colombia, about 8,300 feet, which is a, an, an important pest mitigation strategy. You know, we have been able to achieve a 90% reduction on our costs compared to our peers in Canada. Uh, that is immense. That is not just a slightly better business model that, uh, you know, being an ultra low cost producer is a disruptive business model. And more importantly, if you think we are at the beginning of this, uh, this sector, like I do, you know, we have decades worth of growth to go ahead of us. We've built capacity so much cheaper. In fact, because our costs were 14 times lower than those up in Canada, one could say that, you know, a dollar uh, invested in Clever Leaves goes 14 times as far, as far at building the capacity that will shape this future, future market. So just to put people in context, you know, we are one of the largest cultivators on earth, you know, whether you count the Canadians or some of the American MSOs like Cure Leaf and True Leaf, you know, we are right up there. Uh, and arguably that uh, cultivation that we have is, is more suited uh, for the long term. Uh, we're also one of the largest extractors uh, in the world, right up there with a lot of independent extractors that are known, uh, known in, in Canada. On top of that, you know, while an American cannabis company might talk about its quality in terms of its, you know, celebrity endorsement or, you know, the, the, the brand positioning or, you know, the location of the retail location, when we're talking about international cannabis, uh, there's thankfully a very non-arbitrary uh, standard for quality, and that's the famous EU GMP certification. The way we look at it, there are only about four companies in the world that have EU GMP certified cultivation and extraction in an integrated fashion, which is very important. So what does that mean? That means that if you're selling to a country like Germany, where your cannabis products sit side by side other pharmaceutical products like Lipitor or Humira, you have to have the same quality standards. You have to really be able to say that the production system that was used for this wasn't just sort of a, a rushed job to get into market. It is a true pharmaceutical product. 
and therefore that unlocks markets for us, but also because of these quality standards, it can unlock a higher price point. We'll talk about it later, but the price of cannabis in Germany, for example, might be four or five times uh, the price per gram of cannabis in the US or Canada. So just looking quickly at our cultivation, you know, here are two of our major sites. Uh, the existing site up at the top, that's 1.8 million square feet of licensed greenhouses. Uh, there are not many, if, 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 if any, sites in the world that produce this much cannabis in, in one location. Uh, but as we think about the future, we've also be, become one of the first companies in Colombia to identify an outdoor project. This is 70 mil run. Here's our extraction facility. We can extract about 100,000 kilograms per year of, of product uh, with a modest uh, investment to expand uh, to nearly three times that level. You know, we have our own independent labs. We run a lot of different stability tests. And again, this is an EU GMP certified operation, the only one of its kind in, in Latin America. But look, looking across the pond over to, to Portugal, um, you know, we've been growing uh, very rapidly in Portugal. You know, we built this facility organically. You know, we cobbled up a, uh, a property of land. We built a hundred uh, or, you know, we acquired an existing small greenhouse and now we are expanding it. Uh, Portugal is a very attractive climate and this will allow us to sell into, uh, you know, the flower market, which is still a, a very high percentage of, uh, of, of the market in places like Germany and Israel and Australia. Also, when people think about Latin America, you know, there are a couple of peer companies out there and people ask, well, how is your Colombian operation uh, compared to some of those? Well, by capacity measures, you know, we are larger. Uh, by quality measures, we are the only EU GMP certified operator. And also in terms of kind of tightness of our regulatory system or, or relationships, you know, in Colombia, we've been awarded 59,000 kilograms of THC production. That is a, approximately half of the country's award. I, we have not uh, learned what some of the other companies have, have earned yet. Uh, but then lastly, uh, you know, we also have access to flour, which is, which is very unique. Um, and so when we think about our end markets, uh, I was actually speaking with somebody the other day and I said, you know, do you realize that there are a, almost a billion people in, in Europe, counting Russia and Brazil, and there's a lot of focus being put on other geographies, but there's a potential billion people that we can sell to in those different geographies. That's pretty in, in, in amazing. I think this is what drove drove some recent M&A announcements with the Cure Leaf EMAC deal. Uh, you know, Europe is not an easy place to do business. The startup costs are very high. The standards are very high, but that translates into, into fewer operators and higher pricing. You know, even in Brazil, where you might think it could be a low price market, you know, we're still seeing pricing there that could be, uh, you know, competitive with what, what's going on in the United States because of all of the barriers that happen. So talking about Germany, um, you know, I probably won't belabor this too much, but, uh, you know, I just encourage people that you need to throw out everything you know about the American or the Canadian cannabis industry if you're trying to understand the German market. Prescribed by physicians, prescribed at pharmacies, very complicated market. Uh, but, you know, we are doing very well there. And I think the market is just beginning. Only one in a thousand people using medical cannabis today, whereas in Canada and the U.S., you've got north of 10. Um, I think it's really important to highlight in the last couple of weeks, we announced a major partnership with a company called EffiFarm. Uh, for those that don't know European pharmaceuticals, EffiFarm is a specialty uh, pharmaceutical company. It's backed by a $20 billion plus private equity firm called PAA Partners, you know, 1,500 employees in Europe. This business is one of the first instances of a, of a pharmaceutical company partnering up with a cannabis company to sell their own products. This vision has been with us from Cleverly's at day one. You know, we are not a, a cannabis company forcing a pharmaceutical company to market our own brands. That, that is an unnatural act. It's not what pharmaceutical companies like to do. And this is one of the first instances I've seen as a B2B powered company saying to a pharmaceutical company, hey, we can save you four years of time building cannabis, cultivation, extraction, getting an EU GMP certified. We are your specialty ingredient partner, but you guys, you're the expert at distribution, marketing, uh, uh, selecting the right formulations to fit that patient mix. This is a huge opportunity for us and we're very, very excited about it. Uh, quickly in Brazil, over the last couple of months, we've announced nearly $15 million worth of take or pay contracts with a couple of uh, partners down there. The Brazilian market is going to be a major opportunity for Cleverly's. There is no domestic production allowed in Brazil. Everything is in oil format. 
it must be GMP certified and you have to run what they call zone 4B stability data, basically a different type of uh, temperature and humidity profile than you might see in the United States or Canada. And most pharmaceutical companies in the US or, North, or Europe don't even bother to run that. And it just so happens that because Columbia is in that same zone, we've been running those stability tests from day one. You can't fake it. You know, we like to say you can't uh, you can't have a baby in uh, in one month with nine mothers. It just takes a while. But Cleverly's has been at this for four years, and I think that's going to be a very rich market. And of course, the U.S. You know, a couple of years ago, we bought a family-run company that sells. Uh, detox and cleanse products. It gives us access to 15,000 retail locations. Its biggest customers are CVS, GNC, Vitamin Shop, Rite Aid, Walgreens. These will be great markets for potential, or, or great retail uh, partners for potential CBD products, which we are gearing up to launch uh, by the end of this, uh, this year. So just a quick overview of our customers, you know, we've had great, uh, great announcements with great partners, Canopy Growth, Canatrek in Australia, Entourage in Brazil, Epifarm now in Europe, Univo in Israel, Green Care in Brazil. We're starting to see the true value of what this vision of Cleverly's is, that we speed up our customers' time to market, we give them EU GMP products, which will save them years of time, and we create asset light entry into a market. Not every cannabis company needs to have 2 million square feet of cultivation, and it probably shouldn't be in the wrong geographies. You know, we provide that, we lower the cost for the system and create a more stable, uh, stable market. Um, just very quickly, you know, this is a little bit of our, our cap table. Um, I know it's a little bit complicated as we went public back in December, but, you know, roughly 25 million uh, common shares outstanding right now. Uh, worth noting that, you know, about uh, two thirds of our shares are still under a, a, a lockup, uh, you know, from, uh, from the IPO transaction. But, uh, you know, again, very, uh, a very coveted spot to be in. You know, this is a quick overview of our team. Uh, I spent most of my career at KKR and the Blackstone Group investing in healthcare. And, and, and natural resource investments, including agricultural projects. So this is this has been our DNA from the very beginning. Uh, we have a very talented local team. I'm excited. We also just announced our new CFO. Uh, Hank joined us from uh, from Abacus uh, Health Products, which was acquired by Charlotte's Web. So very familiar with the uh, industry. Uh, we of course have uh, some notable political luminaries like uh, former Senate Majority Leader uh, Tom Daschle, who has been very important to the company, um, and of course as a Nasdaq listed company, you know, a, an independent uh, dominated board. Of course, a nice attribute of the business is that you know we do have a significant cash reserve, uh, you know, approximately eighty million dollars of, of cash uh, going into the end of the year. That will you know give us a fully funded uh, operating business plan. But because of our experience in the investing world, you know, acquisitions like Herbal Brands, partnerships like the one that we've done with Cansativa, uh, you know, that's a lot of flexibility embedded into creating opportunistic. Uh, M&A opportunities. So nothing to announce here today, uh, but it is something that we spend um, you know, quite a bit of time on. So to summarize, a leader in low cost cultivation, not just a little bit cheaper, but a lot cheaper, thoughtfully constructed one of the first multinational operators, pharmaceutical grade EU GMP certified production that leads to partnerships like the Ethi Farm partnership, we are built for growth, we are built for profitability, have a lot of operating leverage, the, the team is, you know, a, 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 a head and shoulders, uh, you know, a great, uh, a great asset of the company, strong balance sheet, and we are NASDAQ listed with U.S. GAAP, uh, fully PCAOB audited financials. So, you know, we're excited to be here. It's only been three months on the NASDAQ. Uh, we've got a lot to do, uh, but as this industry involves, you know, we hope Cleverly becomes an exciting partner to some of your companies or, you know, potential investment opportunities. So with that, uh, Patrick, we can uh, open up to Q&A. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. I do have a couple of questions here in the chat that I want to hit quickly. Perhaps you covered this, but um, but but just a couple in here. Len has is asking uh, the source of income from non-operating activities. Kindly explain uh, anything that um, anything that you can speak to there. Um, yeah, not sure exactly what that's referring to. I mean, you know, we are an international company, so maybe some of that's, uh, you know, FX movements. Um, but uh, yeah, we could probably be have a more discreet follow up on that to, to drill into that. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. And so I have a couple myself. Um, okay, so you were recently added to the THCX ETF. Has that had any major impact for you guys yet? Or do you expect it to, let's say? 
Yeah, I, th I think we're very fortunate that, you know, we've had institutional investor backing since the, the beginning of the company. You know, Fairlawn is one of the largest, uh, uh, you know, investors in the company. They're not the only one. There's a number of other cannabis operators that have been in the uh, in the capital structure. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think getting to a an ETF like um, uh, like uh, THCX is, is just another step in that same direction. Um, so I cool. think, you know, there are other ETFs, I believe, that have now, uh, you know, picked this up. Um, I haven't gone back to look at their shareholding lists, um, you know, in the last uh, couple of weeks, but it's just an evolution. Um, and, you know, I think there'll be uh, some more exciting names, hopefully, that will come uh, come into the shareholder uh, registry, you know, over the coming months, but we're publicly traded. So I, you know, to some extent, I can't control it. Yeah, no, no, and I and I understand that, but that's another feather in your cap for sure. The last thing, and and just very briefly here, the Ethi Farm deal in in Europe, and and sort of adding to that distribution footprint, that's got to be really exciting. And I think for all of us who are investing and know the space, um, you know, you know, sometimes it certainly seems whoever has the largest footprint is winning, right? And we know that that's not necessarily true, but especially in your case. You've got Canada, you've got Latin America, you've got deals in, in Europe and, and really hefty deals in Europe now. So I, I wonder how excited and how significant we should be uh, or, or what significance we should place on that deal in, in Germany. Yeah, well, like all partnerships in pharmaceuticals, these things take time. You know, we're probably talking a S on the word of years, right? You know, it, it, it took a sure. while. There was a lot of validation. I mean, GMP certification in pharmaceuticals is table stakes, but you know, the real quality audit is if a customer like Epifarm validates you and, and enters into a, a partnership. So it's very early. Epifarm has not yet sold products in Germany. So, you know, we can't, you know, promise the moon. You know, we're being very conservative about our approach. But if there's anybody that could potentially uh, you know grow into that market, you know, it would be a company like Epifarm. You know, and I would also go out to point that. You know, this is still the true beginning of the pharmaceutical side of the sector. I mean, we saw the mm -hmm. massive deal where Jazz Pharmaceuticals, ironically, an old KKR portfolio company, uh, acquired GW Pharmaceuticals. You know, there are a lot of reasons and parallels that one might be able to draw to, to what we're doing uh, with Effie Farm. And I would further go out to show that, you know, Effie Farm is, is a very fashion forward company. You know, they were involved in the French, um, you know, kind of cannabis trial or, or program that you talk about. And they had another partner for that trial. You know, people can go up and, and, and go look into that. Uh, and so, you know, because of the partnership that, that we've been building over the years with Ethifarm, I think it's even more remarkable that after going with one partner in France, you know, they've decided to go with Cleverleaves in, in Germany, arguably a more commercial uh, opportunity. So, uh, so we're super excited about it. It will take time, but you know what we've observed in these pharmaceutical partnerships is even though they take a little bit longer to to ramp, that's a very sticky business, right? You know, our mm -hmm. partners will not be able to very easily change out their suppliers. So we are we are tied at the hip with those companies. You know, uh, they they you know people would talk about GW Pharmaceuticals. They're using 15 year old processes and methods for their you know cannabis extraction techniques because that's what was embedded in the in the trials with Epidiolex and Sativex. They couldn't change that stuff even if they wanted to. And you know that's very uh, important and a good differentiator. This is very different than a wholesaler of cannabis in Southern California, where you know what's the price? You know, let me beat it. You know, we're 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 tied at the hip with these companies, um, which is both exciting and also daunting because we carry a sure. lot of weight on our shoulders. Um, and you know, we we have to be a you know terrific partner to make these things work. Great. Well, Kyle Detweiler and Cleverleaf, CLVR, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate that. It's very exciting to see some of these, um, what, what are truly massive global footprints coming together. So thank you, sir. Thanks, Patrick. All right. So we'll keep this moving right along. I get to introduce a friend now, John Purell from Zuber Lawler. Zuber Lawler is a firm that represents biotech companies, fortune companies, funds, uh, and other entities around the world. Um, I know that they've successfully uh, obtained hundreds of patents for biotech companies. They, they've done more than a billion dollars in deals in, in uh, the cannabis space alone uh, over the past couple of years. So, John, I know you're a counsel in the New York office. Uh, you focus on IP, regulatory, compliance. It sounds like you're the man. Thank you, Patrick. I think with that very, very kind intro, you might be now my favorite Lane brother who's at Benzinga. Yes, please. Uh, please make sure the other one knows. Out. All right. Um, I'm very excited to host this panel about cannabis biotech. 
And in fact, actually, the hardest thing to do was to condense the very impressive bios of these companies and their CEOs. Um, we want to spend as much time on the substance of the panel, so please pardon me in advance if I read through this quickly. And may the Zoom gods be merciful, our wireless connections be sturdy, and our dogs and children quiet for the next 30 minutes. All right, and with that, let's get into it. So first, I want to introduce um, uh, the company Sky Bioscience, which is a biopharmaceutical company unlocking the potential of cannabinoids through the development of its proprietary cannabinoid-derived molecules to treat diseases with significant unmet needs. The company's lead molecule in preclinical studies has demonstrated potential as a new class of therapy to lower intraocular pressure in patients with glaucoma or elevated intraocular pressure that is superior to the current standard of care. Representing Sky as its CEO, Panit Dillon. Prior to Sky Bioscience, Mr. Dillon was the co-founder, CEO, and director of Oncosec Medical Inc., a leading biopharmaceutical company developing cancer immunotherapies for the treatment of solid tumors, where he completed a partnership with Merck, raised over 200 million, and uplisted the company to NASDAQ. After Oncosec, he's worked in various management capacities and helped to raise over 500 million for several companies. Welcome, Panit. Hey, thanks uh, for next, having me. I want to introduce Avikana, which is a, a Canada based multinational commercial stage and vertically integrated biopharmaceutical company with three business units, including functional skin care, medical cannabis, and pharmaceutical products. Albicana has an established R&D and scientific platform in Canada, commercial platform in the US, Canada, and South America, and a vertical integration and supply chain business model in Colombia. Albicana is represented by its co-founder and CEO, Aras Azadian, an executive with extensive experience in both financial and biotechnology sectors. Uh, his expertise in corporate development, coupled with his executive experience in the oncology industry, has been integral to Avikana's thought leadership pertaining to R&D and clinical development. And last but not least, uh, Enveric Biosciences is a patient-centric biotechnology company endeavoring to enhance the lives of those who are adversely affected by the side effects of cancer treatments, which is listed on NASDAQ under the ticker ENVB. And Varick's vision is to develop novel therapeutic drug solutions with the goal of rigorously testing natural and synthetic compounds, starting with cannabinoids, to find therapeutic solutions for these supportive care indications and raise the standard of care for these patients. It's represented by its CEO, David Johnson. Dave has 35 years of experience leading small, medium, and large cap companies around the world in the life sciences space, both public and private. Dave was a CEO and subsequently the COO, my apologies, and subsequently the CEO of Convitec, a five billion global healthcare company, where he sold the business out of Bristol Myers Squibb into private equity. For the past decade, Dave has been an investor, a board member, and an operator of numerous microcap companies in the life sciences marketplace, raising over 100 million to expand um, these businesses' models. And on to the panel. Hopefully, that wasn't too quick. Um, it's funny that and fortuitous that uh, Mr. Detweiler just referenced uh, GW Pharma because that is specifically very, very important in the cannabis biotech sectors. So I want to open up to the panel, right? As we know, GW Pharma was the first company to obtain FDA approval of a drug where cannabinoid was the active ingredient in Epidiolex with CBD to treat seizures. How did that affect your companies and other companies in this sector? I'll open it to any of you to start. I'm, okay, go you, for it, David. You want me to start? All right. <laughs> well, first of all, John, thanks for the uh, introduction and, and also to Benzinga for putting this on. Um, li listen, let's hope all of us are sitting uh, next door to each other uh, a year from now and having a cocktail at the end of this conference. But listen, the virtual world is still here and, and we'll make the best of it, right? So thanks to all of you. Listen, I think for all of us in, in what I'll call the cannabis biotech industry, for me, there were two key things in 2018 uh, with the FDA approval that it did. And the, the first word that always comes to my mind here is validation, right? So that decision validated that cannabinoid therapies truly were a bona fide therapeutic solution to address unmet medical needs. And it went even further than that in my mind. It, it validated that societal norms had changed, that regulators had a different level of appetite. You know, we, we sometimes forget that panel voted 100% to approve Epidiolex 
That's very rare with an FDA panel. There's usually a, a significant number who vote yes, and then there's always a few who abstain or, or vote no, but but 100% of them. So the, the regulatory appetite was validated. And you know, thirdly is the politicians. We're hitting them off one at a time, but these kind of regulatory approvals had a significant effect in my mind on both sides of the aisle in the US for sure. And then I, for me, the second one is that efficacious scientific solutions always win out. I always think of, of back in 1998, GW Pharma, you know, we forget that they're a 23 year old company. And that was the wild, wild west of the cannabis industry. Yet GW Pharma created a sophisticated approach to entering into this space. I remember seeing something really early on. It was, they still have it, I believe it's called ICARE and it's an acronym for integrity, compliance, accountability, respect, and ethics. I'm not sure all of the other companies in cannabis back then had those same five attributes. And you know, I remember reading an article just as they were preparing for their, uh, for their IPO back in 2013. And I had to relook it up and it, this, this analyst said, you know, they're a quiet company. They don't make outlandish financial projections. They don't pay stock promoters and they don't make weekly splashy press releases. They just do really good science. And, and I think the FDA approval continues to emphasize to all of us, do good science and you'll generally do well. Very, very well said, David. Um, you know, if I could just add to that, Jonathan, I think, first of all, great to be here, part of this uh, panel, and, and I can echo the same remarks that David said, of looking forward to meeting you all in person one of these uh, days soon. Um, absolutely, in terms of uh, it, it, it is a, um, I think you, you nailed it in terms of the clarity, David, with the, uh, you know, validation and evidence uh, in truly a, a tide turning. I, I could, um, you know, looking at, uh, in, in, in terms of my, my own experience, um, I, when I uh, started Onkosec about 10 years ago, uh, cancer immunotherapy was uh, uh, relatively new, at least the next generation of uh, immunotherapies, and there was only one drug approved. And there's a lot of parallels here in terms of what I'm seeing in the cannabinoid space. Um, we finally see a, you know, a, a very important uh, inflection that's happening in, in the cannabinoid space with uh, a, a, you know, at least five drugs, uh, five different drugs approved. Uh, but uh, it's it's just the tide is just beginning to turn in terms of what uh, is going to happen here. There's so much applicability here, um, so much science that still needs to be explored. And the next 10 years, I think, can be very, very disruptive, especially as we um, more broadly understanding the, the receptor labeling, the specifics uh, that these different cannabinoids can act in terms of uh, you know, the, all the different modalities. Uh, you, you look at a, 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 a molecule like CBD uh, and it has wide applicability in terms of pain relief, neuroprotection, uh, you know, the, uh, anti-seizure. There's just uh, a, a ton of evidence here in terms of that we're just uh, brushing the surface in terms of what the science uh, is. And I, I, like I said, I, 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 I saw this uh, hands-on in terms of the cancer immunotherapy space. 10 years ago, we were talking about targeted therapies, meaning like localized, you know, they, they treat a tumor and, and uh, they were able to um, uh, help uh, people that have cancer. And in, in, in the last decade, you really truly got to personalized uh, medicine in the, in the immunotherapy space where uh, cancer is being treated uh, in a, in a, at, at, a, at a cellular level in terms of um, uh, the specificity uh, for a patient. So we're gonna get that same uh, level of understanding here with all of these uh, different companies focusing on research and and uh, generating the safety and efficacy around their clinical trials. If I may just add, guys, I mean, uh, so first of all, it, it's fantastic to be on a panel like this. And I can tell you, I've been the CEO of this company for about six years now, um, and I've been fighting for the first five years of that to say that there's a difference between cannabis, pharmaceutical cannabis, biotech. And now that, that there are specific panels dedicated to this and I get to share the panel with the likes of Puneet and David, it's, it's great. It's, nice. it's great to see that, uh, that evolution of the sector. Uh, GW Pharma, of course, was the pioneer that move made my life a lot easier. I can tell you that from a, from a capital raise perspective, you know, 2015, 2016, uh, you know, when I'm presenting biotech, clinical development, drug development related to cannabinoids, if it wasn't for GW Pharma, 
I don't think the company would have had the support. You know, that validation, that proof of concept back then was massive. Of course, the FDA approvals, uh, it, was a, it was a massive catalyst to see it as a proof of concept. But yeah, I, I look at them as pioneers. Um, I, I, I believe it's just the beginning of the biopharmaceutical side and there's so much more potential. I always joke and I say on the adult use side, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're probably in the third or fourth inning. And then uh, when it comes to the pharmaceutical side, we're still in preseason. You know, so, so things are just getting started and it's exciting to have, to have the opportunity to speak here today. Great. Thank you, guys. So to circle back to GW Pharma, right, obviously after it gained approval, subsequently it was purchased this year by Jazz Pharmaceuticals for $7.2 billion. So how has that affected the space and how do you think that will continue to impact the sector? And, and, and if I may start, guys, like it's another validation. This is this is a capital markets uh, conference, and I think it's very important to see a major, major acquisition. And we're talking about a pharmaceutical company with a real valuation, with a real purchase. We're not talking about an all share acquisition by a cannabis company that may have an overly valued market cap. You know, this it's, it's very real. Um, and we're seeing more and more pharma companies. We have a few pharma partners ourselves that that are starting to enter. And again, it separates the segment or the, the industry into segments. There's the, there's the adult use companies, and I think the likes of Constellation Brand entered first. There are higher risk takers. Pharmaceutical companies wait, and they wait, and they, they, they make their investments when the research is there, the data is there, the drugs are registered. So I think it's another big validation for, for the group here in this panel. Yeah, uh, thanks, Naraz. That, that, I uh, echo the same remarks in terms of this is a real uh, 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 um, dollar component here in terms of uh, when these pharma companies are looking at uh, these type these type of deals, they're actually sitting there and calculating um, uh, the net present value of the different products and and kind of see how they can enhance uh, their own growth trajectories and um, and in the case of this this particular transaction, you can see uh, that it's a it's a huge value add, um, not only for validation of the cannabinoid space for all of us that are working in there, but also a value add for Jazz Pharmaceuticals. And uh, you know, it's 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 not uh, you know necessarily the, the largest farm out there, but it is certainly uh, uh, shows that uh, you know a company like uh, Jazz went through that uh, that diligence that calculates. Uh, the breadth of what uh, GW adds to their overall pipeline. And if you, know, if you look at their disclosures, I think they've done a, a really good job of uh, articulating that it wasn't just a single product deal. It was really to enhance their entire pipeline. Uh, I think that that's um, inevitable in, in the uh, broader uh, pharma. I think you look at um, any of the large pharmas and uh, we've I think this panel has all worked with uh, uh, different pharma companies in some capacity. You can see that there's still a lot of opportunity in a lot of different disease segments that uh, they're looking for growth. Uh, I think that we saw that in the cannabinoid space uh, over a decade ago uh, in, in, a, in, in different drug applications that didn't necessarily have the best safety profile. Uh, but uh, that's uh, finally shifted. Uh, it, it's you know like all industries they go through a cycle. Um, we saw uh, a clear separation of what's happening in the adult use market validation with what cannabinoids can offer in terms of certain uh, disease segments. And now with the growing science, uh, yeah, you, you're going to have a, a lot more clarity in terms of what um, uh, they're specifically working towards in in these variety of different indications that these companies are. So I think it's going to enhance. Uh, you're going to see more deals uh, in the in the next decade. Yeah, and, and both great points by both Panid and Araz. I, I would add two maybe lessons that we can take from the GW journey that they've had. And the first one is is you know we as as small microcap biotechs, and, and even if you're a mid mid sized biotech, your scientific plan has to be critical, but your access to capital strategic plan has to be as critical and. You know, GW Pharma, they raised hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. We forget, the end of 2020, they still had $483 million on their balance sheet and they lost $29 million in the first quarter. So it's not inexpensive to get to the finish line here and make sure that you have as much in capital and then tying that into executing in your scientific business plan. So I, I would think that's a really good lesson. I, I think the other one, um, as I was preparing for this, I was reading some of the things that I haven't read for a long time on GW Pharma and it's perseverance. 
thought this was a great story. So in April 2016, an analyst wrote this. The headline was GW, a cannabis stock that's way too high to make any sense. And the three bylines were, this bloated $1.8 billion market cap cannot be justified. They are relying on an epilepsy drug that families say they won't use. And herbal cannabis oils seem to have won out in the space. Well, you know what? You know, I think that 1.8 seems like a pretty good investment at this point for a $7.2 billion uh, transaction. And people are using it because they sold $500 million last year and tracking to $600 million. And I don't think there's a cannabis oil company that's selling $600 million right now. So perseverance, if we believe in the science and it can truly change the standard of care, continue to track the way you believe you should tra track and good things will happen. Good lessons for us. Yeah, um, if I could just add one more co comment to that, I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I was listening to the last presentation by Clever Leaf CEO Kyle, uh, you know, he uh, brought up a really good point um, around GW as well. It, there, you know, clearly these, these companies that have gone through the FDA process, it's a completely different rigor than going down to your, you know, local uh, retail shop and picking up uh, 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 you know, a product that you think would have a comparable health benefit. Um, by the approach the pharmaceutical companies are taking, they're uh, bringing that uh, level of um, you know pharmacon pharmacokinetics, the the, the full um, specificity that you would expect, uh, and eliminating um, you know some of the other challenges that have been around with um, with how traditional methods have been used. Uh, with cannabinoids in terms of the you know, other deliveries, um, you know, that people have taken up until now. So we're, we're only going to uh, see an improvement with that consistency uh, with, you know, these uh, you know, comments that David's made around um, a company like GW that, that was really pioneering on multiple levels with uh, the type of rigor that they've had uh, for, for decades. Great. Thank you. Now, alluding to something you said before, Panit, as well, Right, you three are at the forefront of an industry that's still in its nascent stages, right? Where GW Pharma is the trailblazer in certain respects. Where do each of you see cannabis biotech five years from now, and then say 10 years from now? Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to give a different answer than what's expected. I, I'm, a, I'm a fond believer on the, the natural side and the synthetic use of cannabinoids, I think there's room for both. Um, I, I, when, I, I usually argue on panels about there's no such thing as a cannabis industry because it, 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 it's a raw material, it's a pharmaceutical active ingredient, then it could be utilized for cosmetics, for medical, for pharmaceutical. On the medical biotech side, I think my personal opinion is that there's going to be two broad categories. There's going to be the nutraceutical side where it's going to be some of the non-psychoactive cannabinoids, CBD, CBG, whether it's skincare or even oral potentially uh, as a some sort of supplement or nutraceutical, and that may be used for comorbidities or some symptom management. And I think there's a big angle there considering that it's a natural compound and the fact that it does have pretty high acceptance among society now. But I think on the indication specific, you know, the drug development, clinical development, you know, drug registration pathway, there is massive potential. And, and I think, again, everyone said it, we're just in the earlier stages. We're still working on the major compounds. You know that CBD THC. There's obviously some of the some of the the guys here that are doing some of the work with the rare ones. We're starting to look at synergistic ratios of the cannabinoids. So I think it's going to get a lot more specific, potentially towards personalized medicine as well. And I think we're just getting started. But there will be the pharma side, but there will be this medical nutraceutical side that's going to be much more general as well, in my opinion. So let, let me take off from there because because those are great points. So listen, maybe in a more simplistic fashion, I, there's no question more drugs will be approved five years from now and even more 10 years from now. There is a trend here because the good science remains as robust as needed by the regulatory agencies. I do think industry consolidation will continue to happen, but I also think there'll be a fallout. I think good companies will continue to move forward. You know, we think of the, the dot-com bubble back in the late 90s um, cannabis was there. I think we're coming out of that a little bit, but, you know, look at the psychedelic industry right now. And I think there's a, there's a combination that will over time connect these two businesses. And you could argue there's a little bit of a bubble going on in psychedelics right now. And I think over time that the ability to access both human and financial capital will be 
of good science and strong fundamentals. And so there will be a fallout of businesses. And you know, my final point would be is, is I think patentability is going to get more and more difficult in this space. And so it'll drive us to be more creative in therapeutic options. You know, we've, we just announced a licensing agreement in, in conjugation therapies and potentially using a very unique linker molecule to create potentially a new class of drugs. Now, listen, this is a high, high risk area, but the innovativeness of creating more intellectual property and doing better things for patients, I think will continue to drive us further. So some things both five and 10 years out, I think they'll continue to evolve. Yeah, those are great points, Araz and uh, David. I think, uh, you know, clearly there's been uh, a lot of uh, capital that's come into the overall space, the adult use and the, uh, the uh, you know, these the, the companies like ours that uh, are exploring the pharmaceutical applications. So uh, the stack capital needs to be put to work. I think that we're going to, uh, those companies that have active clinical programs are going to help uh, support each other in terms of the validation that, this industry needs in order to really uh, begin that true inflection. Uh, I agree with Aras and the uh, comment he made earlier earlier about the pharmaceutical space being, you know, preseason at this point. Um, even though we've seen a couple products approved, uh, there's still a tremendous opportunity ahead of us. So uh, we're not even close to uh, that inflection uh, happening uh, in terms of that hockey hockey stick. Um, uh, pictorial that everyone's kind of familiar with. It, it will happen, I think, once we all collectively generate the data. And by data, I mean these not only the safety, but efficacy, but also understanding um, these different pathways at play with all of the different diseases. Uh, intellectual property is a big part of that in terms of the pharmaceutical space. That's the only way you can monetize uh, these products in terms of licensing and, and getting um, you know, these big deals to happen and add to, uh, to the different pipelines that, that we talked about earlier. So, uh, so those, those things are, are, are both uh, at play together. But um, the third comment I'll, I'll just make uh, beyond that, I think, is that uh, if I was to you know, make a prediction, I think that we still are understanding the disruptive potential of cannabinoids. So right now, you, know, you have all of these wide applications like pain and anxiety and anti-seizure and, and all that. But I think what's the undercurrent here is in terms of really recognizing the mechanisms at play with these cannabinoids and, and neuroprotection has been a big one uh, in terms of how the cannabinoids can work for, uh, you know, uh, the, um, uh, with these receptors located in the brain or, or uh, re related to neuroge neurodegenerative order, uh, disorders like multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's and so forth. So I think that if that connection happens and these companies start generating the data on the neuroprotection side, then you have truly, um, uh, a disruptive potential because I think more capital comes into play. Uh, you know, you will definitely get the institutions more excited uh, with a, with that kind of efficacy uh, and the safety to support it. Um, and uh, we we should be able to um, uh, really become disruptive in in the in a lot of different disease segments. So then, if I may just add a couple couple of points about about the sector again. Six years I've been I've been here, been wearing a biotech hat, and and it's 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 been it's been very difficult to be frank, you know, to to educate investors. And I still get shareholders and investors that are saying, well, you know, I'm looking at your adult use recreational peers, and they're generating more revenue than you. And I think we still don't have that separation that it's a different pathway, it's a different process. Uh, and once we get our products into the market, we have entry barriers within the form of, you know, obviously patents, but data and, and, and brand establishment. So I think, again, having this panel is showing that the industry is starting to make that divide, make that separation, which I think is crucial. And something that's worth noting, especially speaking on a U.S. based uh, panel, is that the rest of the world is evolving on a daily basis. Like we're, we're active in, you know, in nine or 10 countries where it's strictly medical. There is no adult. You know, in South America, we're, we're in the process of registering indication specific drugs without the, the necessary need for full clinical development. And from a pharmacological perspective, we're, we're actually leveraging off of literature. So the world is evolving towards pharmaceutical and medical use of cannabis a lot more than they are adult use. But of course, again, that lack of separation in the, set, in the, in, in the industry is causing everyone to look at multi-state operators in the recreational industry. So I think 
that separation in the segments is going to allow further capital to come in capital that understands that companies like us go through a process. I don't think it's going to be necessarily as expensive as UW Pharma was because they were the first, you know, but I think it's a very different process. And the more that we segment and we separate the sector, the more opportunities, uh, you know, the likes of us are going to have to actually execute those business plans. Great. Thank you. I think we are coming up on time just to echo something you said, not that I'm biased, but I do agree that intellectual property is very important in the sector. Um, I think we have about 30 seconds left. We could either explore a merger since you guys all got along really well, or we could pass it over to uh, Ben Zinga nice and efficiently. How about this? How about this? Any final thoughts since we do have about 30 seconds left? Any final thought from from each of you uh, on, on, on what's next? I, I would just make one addition to what Aras is saying. I think you alluded to this in his last comment. Uh, the, the regulations, um, I think, are really what's going to help speed up the development across the board for for this globally. I mean, a lot of what we're dealing with are regulatory hurdles and bureaucracy uh, associated with the development time. So, the faster uh, these, you know, we we continue that effort on the lobbying side, and we continue to educate the benefits are on the pharmaceutical applications. The easier it's going to be for speed of development and for us to reach that inflection. Or you can get us to do it for you in Canada. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> Very true. No, but you know, honestly, I, I think it is about continuing to educate the decision makers, whether that be regulatory bodies or politicians and and doing it through a sophisticated approach, not unlike the biotech industry. I, I think there's some real learnings from mm -hmm. the past that we can take for the present. And but it's it's not going to happen overnight. But it's each one of us doing that. And we do it in a combined way. I think that's where we need to move this forward. It needs to be one voice as an industry like bio has or, or like the pharmaceutical industry has, not each of us trying to do it ourselves. And so, you know, maybe that's the next step. I love point. that. I love that. Well, gentlemen, thank you. I really appreciate it. John, thanks for the great discussion here uh, and for leading that for us. And, and I know we'll hear from two more of you. Aras, we heard from you earlier. So have a great rest of your afternoon. And gents, we'll hear from you coming up. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. All Thank right. You. So, so next up, Puneet, I think you'll just stay on if you don't okay. mind. Go ahead sure. and share your screen. Again, you guys, this is Puneet Dillon, uh, Sky Bioscience. The ticker is SKYE. And go right into it, my friend. One second. Let me just share my screen. Sure. All right. Can you guys see my, see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Well, thanks again, um, uh, Patrick and uh, Benzinga. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, present at this virtual conference, and looking forward to uh, us being able to, uh, you know, connect in person in in the years to come. Here, um, Sky Bioscience. Uh, if those of you that listen to the panel, we're a emerging uh, growth company. Uh, my name is Panit. I'm the CEO. Uh, I'm going to be making some forward-looking. Uh, statements. So please uh, refer to our regulatory filings uh, for the risk factors uh, that um, are associated. Uh, Patrick, just cue me if you can't see my slides. Um, for those of you uh, kind of uh, tuning into this presentation uh, uh, for Sky uh, for the first time, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of just go over some very important takeaways. At a, at a macro level, we're really focused on the development of proprietary first in class molecules to treat disease with high unmet medical need. Uh, these are bioengineered and they're synthetic cannabinoid derivatives and they're designed to significantly enhance the therapeutic benefits in, in the different applications that we're working. So we're not your, you know, as uh, those of you that were kind of tuning into the last couple of presentations, we're not your uh, comparison to uh, going to the retail shop and picking up a, a cannabis product. Uh, we're really working on specific modified molecules designed to really leverage um, and validate, uh, show the validating, validating benefits of cannabinoids. And we're trying to reduce any of the inherent disadvantages associated with um, the uncontrolled kind of approach that uh, cannabinoids have been in the adult use space. Uh, <clears throat> these molecules uh, that we're presently working on are based on a partnership uh, with, uh, and, and several exclusive licenses that we have with the University of Mississippi uh, in all fields of um, applications. And we're initially concentrating on developing one of these molecules to the clinical stage in uh, the area of glaucoma. 
the management team, uh, myself included, uh, we, we have uh, a, a very impressive track record of rapidly advancing uh, preclinical candidates through the human trials, as well as securing uh, the, the different um, types of strategic pharma partnerships. Uh, I think uh, collectively we've done uh, at least a half a dozen different types of deals uh, that are value creating everything from licensing technology uh, to um, uh, to reg uh, regulatory uh, 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 registration trials. Uh, all right, so I uh, will jump right into the uh, kind of the, the key message here. So our lead molecule uh, is focused on this large unmet medical need uh, known as glaucoma. Um, it has very limited treatment options, and there's primarily um, uh, most of the treatments right now are focused on symptoms. So they're really focused on slowing down vision loss, and there's still really no cure to reverse uh, the uh, glaucoma. And in this visual, you can see. On the left is normal vision, and as the disease progresses, uh, you can see that uh, it continues to be impaired in terms of the advanced uh, glaucoma. Uh, it's the leading cause of irreversible blindness, uh, and uh, it currently affects over 78 million patients globally, and it's uh, predicted to go over, uh, over 100 million by 2040, but even those numbers are probably conservative because it's really underreported in a lot of developing countries. So let's go over the biology really quickly uh, in terms of the eye. Um, it, uh, what, what's causing glaucoma um, uh, is really important to understand before we show you how the sky drug specifically works to counteract this. The normal uh, eye here in this picture uh, um, has really good production of, of the fluid, uh, which is called aqueous humor. Uh, and it is able to drain that uh, fluid in a, in a uh, produce it and drain it in a, in a very uh, consistent manner. Um, and uh, what that fluid's responsible for is it helps in terms of keeping the kind of shape of the eye or the inflation of the eye, as well as the uh, uh, responsibility of transporting the different nutrients uh, that are important. So when it doesn't drain uh, and it can't flow out of it, it ends up increasing interocular pressure. And that ends up damaging the optic nerve, which leads to the vision loss. So you can see on, on this picture, uh, you know, that uh, injury uh, starting to happen on, on the uh, optic nerve cells. There's clearly a, a large market here in terms of how uh, uh, how, what's what's happening in terms of uh, the patients uh, across uh, across the globe, and at the same time, um, there's been uh, quite a number of drugs uh, that are looking to to make a difference here. But all of the current treatments really are are focusing on tackling uh, the production of aqueous humor or the outflow of that. So either to try to decrease the production or increase the outflow. So uh, most of it, most of the uh, uh, Current approaches uh, really haven't uh, shown a significant uh, difference, and they're they're geared towards a mechanism of, of reducing interocular pressure. But you can tell, like these percentages are are fairly low, and it, it it's pretty it uh, clear in terms of alluding to a, a large number of the patients um, don't have response, or uh, they're uh, developing some sort of tolerance uh, to the current therapy. So what's shift? What's happened really in the space is that you have uh, one drug um, or single use uh, kind of monotherapies uh, 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 being ineffective, patients developing tolerance and then uh, being prescribed combinations. And now some of the combinations are starting to make a difference. And you can see uh, that um, uh, the uh, combination of uh, latanoprost and repressa uh, showing 30 to 36 um, percent uh, drop in interocular pressure. So what Sky is focused on uh, is a whole new class of research. And our first application is to really tackle this problem in glaucoma. And what, with, why we're doing this is that cannabinoid receptors are found throughout the entire body, but they, and, they, and I, you know, what you've learned today from the different presentations is that they have wide apl applicability across a, a lot of different bodily functions, uh, a lot of different diseases. We've selected the eye because uh, uh, the eye is very rich with these cannabinoid receptors. And there is also some very uh, strong science that supports the, the receptor labeling uh, that is um, detected in key parts of the eye. 
So what we what we're really honing in on is the effects of this receptor labeling, and specifically THC has shown to be able to uh, uh, do a very good job in terms of lowering interocular pressure, and that's been validated through a whole series of studies that have been done um, showcasing how THC being um, uh, inhaled uh, through smoking um, uh, has shown to lower uh, interocular pressure. So in, in this uh, table, uh, you can see every single study um, uh, in patients have sh has shown lowering of uh, IOP, um, but, um, and in some cases they've even, you know, made the additional claim of, of uh, being able to associate uh, being associated with uh, these uh, specific cannabinoid receptors. Now, if you link this back to what we were talking about uh, with uh, with regards to GW Pharma, this is um, uh, truly something in terms of what we're witnessing in the market. Um, you know, GW uh, was the uh, first company uh, to show FDA approval uh, of a CBD drug, and it approved it to treat seizures associated with several forms of epilepsy in patients um, of uh, one year age or older. Uh, we I think that that's a really important validating event that something that is a cannabinoid can come out of the clinical process and then get approved as a drug with utility. And that's what we're trying to show here is uh, with this uh, approach is like, you know, clearly THC has worked, um, but there's also uh, some of the, the challenges that would um, uh, be inherent with the kind of the traditional approaches uh, that have been used um, uh, in terms of inhaling THC. So uh, there's limitations with kind of the traditional methods and that's why modifying a molecule and kind of taking this very validated and clear approach, you, you get over some of these limitations and challenges. In the case of uh, uh, THC uh, being a, uh, used in, in kind of the traditional method, there's a kind of myriad of different kind of challenges. Uh, you have poor bioavailability, you have, uh, you know, very uh, 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 variable kind of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Um, even if you're just delivering a THC extract locally, you're not necessarily going to get that same um, uh, uh, penetration into the uh, eye because uh, uh, it um, it's, a, it's a very oily um, extract and uh, the eye is very watery so you get that uh, oil and water combination that doesn't very mix very, mix very well so you need to come up with a uh, very clear uh, kind of um, a development and a rational des uh, drug design in order to overcome some of those limitations and that's where what we're focusing on at sky is that we can modify our molecule to really enhance the delivery and overcome some of the persistent challenges that you would get, um, what you would have with taking off the shelf uh, drug. And that this is a patented process. And what we refer to uh, as a pro drug uh, in this particular molecule. And what a pro drug is, is that once it's administered uh, in the eye, uh, then it uh, metabolizes into the active pharmacological kind of uh, component. So our uh, approach at Sky is really unlocking the therapeutic value of THC using a very clear rational drug design and bioengineered approach uh, to develop a synthetic pro drug of, of THC called THC VHS. And once it's delivered in the eye, it gets converted in the anterior chamber of the eye into, into THC. So I'm just going to quickly touch on uh, how this uh, kind of separates uh, from a from a data perspective. This uh, particular slide is a an assessment of interocular um, pressure, uh, comparing THC uh, VHS to the leading uh, drugs that are that are prescribed for um, uh, lowering interocular pressure. And one of them is latanoprost, and the other is uh, timolol. And here, uh, what we've shown is that. Uh, not only is THC better than latanoprost, which is the most prescribed drug, um, and but it's also uh, and and it's dosed once daily. But we can also show that we are uh, uh, having a better uh, time of activity um, uh, uh, compared to latanoprost. So that's um, a real uh, kind of validating event here in terms of uh, uh, early data in animals that shows um, the efficacy of this approach. Now we've taken this a step further. Uh, we are uh, currently assessing 
additional head-to-head -head studies in combination with latanoprost and repressa, uh, as well as the combination of those drugs. So we're looking forward to sharing data uh, out of that uh, program uh, in the second quarter. So from a, from a commercial opportunity, uh, I think it's very interesting to see some of the synergistic effects of this uh, monotherapy approach, uh, as well as the combination approach uh, in terms of how we continue to develop the drug. Now, outside of the, uh, uh, that example in terms of lowering interocular pressure, I think it's important to just highlight a couple of other important um, mechanisms at play here. So as we've established, outside of the human brain, the eye has the highest density of cannabinoid receptors, and it really ex helps to explain why THC works so well compared to other therapies. And this is an additional study that we performed that was in combination with gluconics, and it shows that THC released from uh, the prodrug uh, lowers the biomarkers associated with inflammation and fibrosis. And specifically, this is a 3D model of the human tubercular meshwork, which is uh, in the eye. It's a very important function of the eye. And we take, we've taken human samples and, and gluconics that specializes in this, has built a 3D model to emulate the same effects that you would see in humans. And the graphs show specific biomarkers that uh, are lowering inflammation, fibrosis, and uh, improving blood flow. And it really um, highlights that, oh, at, at the end of the day, from a mechanism standpoint, that our molecule has an anti-inflammatory effect and anti-fibrotic um, uh, effect, which are very important markers to show that the effects of THC VHS beyond the just lowering of interocular pressure. And it's it's pretty early evidence of um, of how. Uh, there could be other mechanisms at play, and and specifically uh, in terms of uh, uh, neuroprotection. So uh, we've established that you know glaucoma is a, a one of the largest. Uh, um, uh, it's a le leading cause of irreversible blindness. Uh, there's no cure. Uh, there's several types of glaucoma. We've been talking primarily of primary open angle glaucoma, which is linked to uh, uh, the the um, uh, increase of uh, interocular pressure and, and doing that damage to the optic nerve. There's also uh, another type of uh, glaucoma known as normal tension glaucoma, which is low tension uh, or normal tension, and it's still impacting uh, the optic, optical nerve. And so uh, there's a large incidence uh, or, or kind of a disproportionate number of these patients in Asian countries. Uh, we're still trying to, I think, better understand uh, why is that damage happening to the optic nerve without the elevated uh, interocular pressure, but uh, what's a, the important takeaway here is that it's a large market. Over one third of all glaucoma patients have this normal IOP, and uh, we believe it's a significant kind of unmet uh, need and market opportunity for uh, for the neuroprotection neuroprotective elements of our drug. Just going to check here uh, the chat box for one second. Oh, sorry, that's uh, not directed towards me. Um, yeah, Puni, you're, you're good. You've got a, a couple more minutes here. And there are just one or two questions in the chat. Take your time if you'd like to go ahead and finish up. Um, it, up to you. Yeah, no problem. I'll just uh, finish up with a couple of important kind of takeaways. So what's what the key thing is that there's pretty, pretty good early evidence that cannabinoids play a very important role for neuroprotection. And there's like a whole slew of really good uh, papers on this. Um, what we want to, uh, I think the, the key thing is from our first step is to show superior interocular pressure benefits against standard care. The next, uh, and I alluded to this in the panel, I think there's potential for kind of disruption here uh, in terms of the space uh, where well, if we can demonstrate um, and validate the neuro, neuroprotection properties of THC uh, Valley Chess. So we are doing an early um, preclinical study. It's an optic nerve injury model, which is a common model used uh, to validate uh, neuroprotection. And, and, uh, and we're looking forward to sharing that data uh, this year as well. Uh, in terms of other important takeaways, and this is kind of uh, the, uh, the big uh, crescendo of the presentation is that we're really focused on getting the clinical program uh, started. So this year, um, that is gonna be the major inflection for this company. I think it's been a long time coming in terms of development milestones. Uh, we are uh, initiating 
uh, first in human uh, study, assessing uh, safety, and uh, looking also at efficacy in terms of um, uh, 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 seeing the results in, um, of our drug in, in a certain cohort uh, of patients that have elevated interocular pressure. Uh, but we're looking forward to initiating our phase one uh, trial this year in Australia, and uh, and um, that will be, uh, I think, the kind of a, a major, as I stated, uh, inflection for the company. Uh, in terms of uh, milestones, uh, there are several preclinical milestones that we're that we're focusing on: or clinical enabling studies, uh, and then initiating the clinical trial, and then looking forward to sharing data uh, uh, as fast as possible, uh, top line data from that trial uh, by. Uh, First half of 2022, uh, where and where um, I think um, you know, one additional takeaway here is that once we can move this program forward, it really helps to drive a wedge for expanding our pipeline. Uh, haven't had time to talk about the other molecule that we have in development, um, but we're looking forward to also outlining uh, a development plan for CPD uh, Valley Chess, which has a lot of different uh, applications as well. Uh, cap structure is pretty straightforward for everyone to understand. You guys can take a look at our um, uh, scientific advisory board and management bios uh, on the website and on the presentation. And I'll just uh, end off here with um, just outlining kind of a, the, the unique uh, competitive position. I think it really boils down to speed of execution, uh, generating the data um, and uh, the uh, opportunity for real growth uh, for this company. Uh, so you can see that uh, we have a pretty clear uh, competitive position for, for achieving that. Um, since I've taken over this company uh, seven months ago, uh, we've been very clear on operational discipline of getting um, uh, uh, generating the data and moving this program into the clinic. Uh, we're not letting up on that, and we're really excited about initiating that trial. I think once we, went, once we initiate that, you can see that the, the doors uh, can open up a bit wider in terms of our pipeline, and we're looking forward to sharing uh, that as we uh, also share data from the program. That's it. Do I have time Great. for questions? <laughs> Great, Puneet. I'm afraid we're we're out of time now, but I will send you the questions, and then I'll I'll post some uh, some answers in the chat for our investors here. So, Puneet, okay. thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you guys grow uh, and, and move forward. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. And we look forward to con continuing to work with you or, uh, you know, have an opportunity to present with you. And, and most of all, you know, in really uh, focused on creating long-term value creation with uh, what we're doing on uh, in terms of cannabinoid uh, science. Well, certainly seems like you're on the right track. So thank you again, you guys, S K Y E sky bioscience, Puneet Dillon. Thank you so much. All right, my friends, we will keep this rolling. We're going to bring back David Johnson, the CEO of Inveric Biosciences. That's NASDAQ listed ENVB, ENVB. And David, as he comes over, we will get this up and running. Some really good questions in the chat, so I will make sure to send those to the companies. And David, thank you, my friend. I will let you get rolling. Hey, Patrick. Thanks so much for the introduction. Let me hang on for two seconds. And sure. See if we get this going here. There we go. Great. We've All got right, your screen. Everybody. Listen, thanks, Patrick, and, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And as Patrick had said, my name is Dave Johnson. I'm the chairman and chief executive officer of Enviric Biosciences. We are a NASDAQ traded company under the ticker ENVB. And our mission is about extending and enhancing the life of cancer patients who, after going through cancer therapy, live with what often are debilitating side effects from that cancer treatment. Listen, many of you have seen these. We're gonna be talking about forward-looking information. I would ask all of you to review this prior to us going any further in the presentation. So who is Enviric Biosciences? I mentioned our mission. It's to extend and enhance the life of cancer patients who live with what are often debilitating side effects of cancer treatment. And our vision is to develop novel therapeutic drugs to increase the standard of care in these, what we classify as support care indications. And very quickly, and we'll talk about most of these today, we became a NASDAQ traded company on the final day of 2020, but in a very short period of time, we have created an incredibly strong financial base for the company. And 
as all of you know, without that, uh, it is very difficult to execute on your plan, both internally and taking advantage of opportunistic business development opportunities. We have 18 months of cash on the balance sheet. We have absolutely no debt. We've had very good uh, liquidity in the first three months of trading, and we have a clean cap table as we move into the end of the first quarter of 2021. That is going to continue to allow us to build and execute on our plan. And that plan is really twofold. One is to progress our internal targeted clinical initiatives in GBM, glioblastoma, radiodermatitis, and chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy. We'll have two drugs in the clinic with phase one, two trials by year end. And we'll talk about this, but each one of these sectors creates a very large unmet medical need in these indications. And secondarily, while we'll continue to move forward in a very disciplined approach internally, we'll also continue to spend time looking externally for both our opportunistic, but also targeted business development opportunities to both expand our therapeutic solutions and the indications that we're serving. I can't go any further without talking about leadership. In every time in my career that I've seen great success, it's all started with leadership. And it's not just the management team here. I would think that in micro cap companies, if you're not leveraging your board of directors and your scientific advisory board as part of that leadership team, you're, you're just losing a tremendous opportunity to value incredibly smart and well-connected people. And we're very proud of the team we've put together on our board and already have them engaged both within their skill sets, but also in their ability to help us with their own network. And our scientific advisory board, when you look at it on, on, uh, on our website, it's the who's who. We have two research scientists who have numerous patents and 30 years each of experience in the cannabis and biotech space in Israel and the United Kingdom. And then two oncology clinicians from Memorial Sloan Kettering here in the US and Sunnybrook Medical Center in Canada to help us move forward. And then finally, our management team. You know, I always say about a management team, look at each one of the backgrounds and understand some of the success they've personally seen and, and worked with. I always think you need to know what good looks like to be successful the second time. And I think we have put together a team who knows that. Maybe most importantly on this slide, there is a team that is just as passionate about being successful for both patients and for investors moving forward. You know, we have a relatively simple business plan, but it's a little different than others. You know, it starts with the fact that we are identifying therapeutic solutions from natural compounds that have clinical evidence and truly have an ability to change the standard of care. And then we go through what I would call a relatively traditional drug development process with world-class oncology centers and world-class oncology institutions. And then we leverage this business model with partners. You know, our core competency is identifying patient-centric therapeutic solutions that can look after these support care indications. Often, you know, think of many of biotech companies who crazy smart people develop a molecule or a drug delivery platform and then identify the patient demographic that these molecules or drug delivery platforms can help the greatest. We've turned that upside down a little bit. We're all about looking at the patient, where the greatest needs are in the most underserved markets, and both developing internally and also accessing externally therapeutic solutions, which can enhance the current standard of care. And we'll do that internally and externally all the way along. And while we only started trading on NASDAQ on December 31st, it's, it's been a busy first three months as a public company. We enhanced our balance sheet by raising over $25 million of capital in the first three months. We progressed our clinical initiatives, uh, as I mentioned earlier. We announced on February 25th a strategic partnership with an exclusive agreement with Pureform Global, which I'll spend a couple of more minutes with a little later. And then in March, we expanded our therapeutic solutions by announcing an agreement with Diverse Bio, which again, I'll go into in just a little more depth. So it's it's been a busy start to the year, but it has only just begun. 
So let's transition now into supportive care and cannabinoid therapy. You know, first of all, I like to say cannabinoid derivatives can be leveraged across multiple delivery mechanisms when we talk about these support care indications. And there's many of them. I'd like to think that these are sexy, but they're not the sexiest part of cancer therapy. They're just incredibly high needs for the patient. And when you look at things like chemo-induced neuropathy or radiodermatitis, these are huge markets, well over a billion dollars to access that. Currently, the standard of care is only superficial. And you know, when you look back over the decades, it lacks clinical innovation. So targeting these unmet medical needs provides both time and cost efficiency in our path to commercialization, unlike other molecules that people work with. We have a robust pipeline. Um, we think they're novel therapies and we're, we're looking at them in a number of different ways. We have novel formulations. We have combination therapies, and we now have our hands on the ability to conjugate molecules, all of them different therapeutic solutions to go after these indications. And let's dig into each one of them just a little bit more. With radiation-induced dermatitis, uh, many of you may know this, but 50% of patients who are diagnosed with cancer will receive some form of radiation therapy. What I sure didn't know when I first got in, and many of you may not know as well, that 95% of those patients will develop some level of dermatitis. And so often it's debilitating. I, I will never forget a conversation early in 2020, prior to the pandemic. I was in a leading oncology center in New York and a patient was introduced to me who had dermatitis literally from the top of their body to the bottom. And he said, Mr. Johnson, if you can do anything to help me, I'd appreciate it. He said, you know, I was cured of cancer, but if this is how I have to live, I'm starting to wonder whether I wanted to be cured from cancer in the first place. And that's what we're dealing with. We expect an IND filing in the third quarter of 2021 and moving into the clinic for a phase one, two study by the end of 2021. Chemo-induced neuropathy, as, as many of you know, what we're talking about here is the degeneration of the peripheral senses, really the peripheral nervous system. And it's a very complex condition. You know, symptoms are things like tingling, or as I like to think of them as pins and needle sensation, pain, burning, difficulty with your fine motor skills. And so why do we think cannabis can help in this area? Well, we all know this in this room. It reduces pain intensity. There's an anti-inflammatory relief and it relaxes muscles. There's absolutely no reason that we think there's not a formulation in our ability to go after that, specifically for neuropathic pain. And so we have continued to move forward with novel formulations to get to there. We expect an IND filing in early 2022. And then finally, glioblastoma. Now, you must wonder, glioblastoma is not a support care condition, and you're absolutely right, but rather a chance to use what we have seen in anecdotal data to trial CBD in a combination therapy with the current standard of care. We're trialing this in an area where long-term survival rates are in the area of 10 to 12 months, as many of you know, with glioblastoma. And so we will learn very quickly if there is an ability to both extend but enhance the quality of life all at the same time, this can be a predicate to other cancers that are out there. We are working with the Rabin Institute in Tel Aviv in Israel with Dr. Tali Segal from the Hebrew University who is our primary investigator. We have had IRB approval on moving forward with a phase one, two trial. And we are currently waiting for Ministry of Health approval in Israel so that we can start enrollment in Q3 of 2021. Now, in addition to these three internal initiatives, we announced on February 25th, an agreement with Pureform Global. This is around a pharmaceutical grade CBD and soon to be CBG. And this agreement gives us an exclusive within the support care indications that we are going after. And so what does it do for us? Well, first it provides us with a proven consistent product 
for our upcoming clinical trials in a CGMP environment in facilities that are FDA approved here in the US and also in the United Kingdom. And second of all, their scientific robustness, if you will, allows us to collaborate with some of their formulators in looking at further development opportunities moving forward. And we've actually started that endeavor with some of their team. We couldn't be more happy with this. And again, this is a great example of, this is about a company that we are developing novel therapeutic solutions. We don't wanna be in the area of synthesizing compounds and building manufacturing facilities. We think it's much better to partner as we continue to build the company and move forward into getting products to the market and helping patients. And then on March 10th, we announced uh, a, a transaction with Diverse Biotech. And what we did is we acquired an exclusive perpetual license from Diverse for five molecules, four of them in the dermatology focused area and one that is in the pain area. All of them we think have a tremendous potential to move forward with conjugation of these molecules. It provides us with a new therapeutic option to address the needs of our patients who are suffering from these side effects of cancer therapy. And these are unique ways in which we can take linker molecules and link CBD together with these existing compounds to form what potentially could be a new class of drug. It, it's early on in, in the, in the uh, development and, and discovery stage, but we believe it provides us with a new therapeutic option. Today, we have cannabinoid formulations, we have combination therapies, and now we have the ability to conjugate all at the same time. And, you know, I like to think of this as it provides us with more shots on goal to de-risk the business, both in the number of indications we're going after and together with the number of therapeutic solutions to address these indications. And partnerships will continue to be a key thesis. We have them with St. George's University in their research labs in London. We have them with Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City at the Raven Medical Center in Israel, Takuna Lam, which really was the founding license to be the brainchild of an individual three years ago in bringing J Pharma, the successor or the private company prior to Enviric to market and the Sirocco Medical Center. And we will have many more together with Pureform, together with Diverse, and other relationships that we'll continue to build as we take the company forward. So what should you expect here over the rest of 2021? Well, first, a radiation dermatitis IND filing in the third quarter, a Ministry of Health approval by the end of the third quarter for glioblastoma, and then both in radioderm and glioblastoma, the initiation of phase one, two trials, where we will be in the clinic before the end of 2021. Now, I won't spend much time on this because for those of you who just listened to the panel, you heard about Jazz, uh, Jazz uh, buying uh, the can of, uh, GW Pharma. We talked a lot about it, but it is a beacon for this industry. I tell the story that I had an interview done with me about two weeks ago, and the final question was, if there was one headline when you woke up tomorrow morning that you'd like to see on the front of the New York Times or the Miami Herald or the Wall Street Journal, what would it like to be? And I said, you know, it already happened. The Jazz Farm transaction to purchase GW has created a beacon for all of us in the drug development space. And as long as we continue to move down the road of sophisticated leadership, good science and strong discipline financial management, we're going to be just fine as we continue to move forward. And why not? an ability to be able to drive that kind of value over the years. We believe it's possible, but it comes one step at a time as we move the company forward. It took GW 22 years to get there. I don't think it will take us that long, but we'll continue to put the building blocks in place as we move the company forward. So in Viric Biosciences, we are a patient-centric company. We do have a strong financial base with cash on hand, with no debt, with strong liquidity in the marketplace. We're developing unmet medical needs in extremely large markets. We have a number of ways we can win and we'll continue to build on those. And we look at these innovative scientific solutions, starting with cannabinoid therapy. We can now address that with conjugation, combination or novel 
uh, formulations. And who knows, as we look at things like uh, cancer-related distress, maybe areas of psychedelics fit into this model. Remember, we're not a cannabinoid company. We're a company that looks at natural occurring compounds to address the needs of supportive care. And whatever therapeutic option makes the most sense, that's the one that will help our patients. And if it helps our patients, it will help investors. And this is a relatively fast, affordable path to commercialization. Being able to execute it, I think, and believe strongly, we have a strong, successful team. 125 years of leadership success, a board of directors that we continue to leverage, and world-class researchers and scientists and clinicians within our scientific advisory board. And so that is in Viric Biosciences, and I'll pass this back to you, Patrick. Thank you very much, David. I really appreciate it. Uh, I know that I had some questions. I'll send them to you personally uh, and, and put them in the chat. I really appreciate you being here in Viric Biosciences, you guys, E-N-V-B is the ticker there. David, thank you for being with us. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it, Patrick. My pleasure. And my friends, we will keep this moving along. <clears throat> Next up, I get to introduce Dr. Jim DeMesa, the CEO of Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals. Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals a company that is no stranger to us uh, here at Benzinga. And uh, Dr. DeMesa, hello. You may be muted. I see your screen, which is great. But just a reminder to unmute yourself and, uh, and turn your video on. There we go. All right, I can hear you. When you and have a moment, grab your camera. Okay, got it. All right, we see you, we hear you, and we've got your slides. I'll let you go to it. All right, thank you very much. Pleasure. Well, before I start, let me just say that we, uh, I will be using some forward-looking statements during this presentation, and we are engaged at least for the next few days in a ongoing Regulation A offering. Uh, Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals, or EHP as we call it for short, is a private company clinical stage in phase two. I'll, I'll describe why that's an important phase for biotech if you don't know about it in just a few minutes. We're located in San Diego and we're developing a whole new class of molecules that can potentially modify and even reverse disease progression in people suffering from some devastating disease that current have, currently have uh, unmet medical needs, no cures, in other words. Now, our scientific and pharmaceutical approach is what we call the unique convergence of cannabinoids, science, and biology. And, and, and our strategy has been to create new, unique molecules derived from the non-psychoactive cannabinoids, specifically cannabidiol or CBD and cannabigerol or CBG, which they serve as the backbone, the starting material to be modified by science, by chemistry, to create new molecules that, that more broadly can treat diseases that the natural molecules can't do. And we have the expanded capability with these molecules to, to affect various biologic receptors and pathways in the body that are validated for the diseases that we're targeting. And, and because these are new molecules, unlike natural CBD or CBG, which can't be patented because they're natural molecules, ours can be patented, including with the very valuable, the most valuable composition of matter patents to create a strong IP portfolio. And we have, 20 granted patents internationally and 18 pending patents that cover a portfolio of 25 unique molecules, 14 of which are CBD derivatives and 11 of which are CBG derivatives. And this gives us the potential for multiple products, multiple indications and multiple opportunities. We're focused with our two lead molecules out of the 25 molecules, which we call EHP-101, which is a CBD derivative, and EHP-102, which is a CBG derivative. We're focused on just four initial indications, systemic sclerosis, which is a rare, uh, severe form of scleroderma. There are no drugs on the market to, to treat systemic sclerosis, and we've been granted orphan drug designation in both the US and the EU and fast track designation in the US by the FDA for systemic sclerosis with EHP-101. We're also focused on multiple sclerosis. A large number of people, over 2 million people have multiple sclerosis globally. Again, there's no treatment. EHP-102, a CBG derivative, is focused on Huntington's disease. Again, a rare 
orphan disease, which, which we've been granted orphan drug designation again in both the US and the EU, and Parkinson's disease. Over 10 million people in the world suffer from Parkinson's disease. The projected market for just these first four indications by 2026 is over $39 billion. So large opportunity. Let me talk about EHP 101 first. This is again a patented CBD derivative. You can see the molecule of CBD on the right at the top. And you can see our molecule in EHP 101 has the same basic architecture as CBD, but there's some important differences. In specifically, for example, this middle part is different. Uh, the, we call it a quinone group that allows our molecule to affect receptors and pathways in the body that CBD can't affect. And then there's this, what's called an amino side chain that CBD does not have. Again, allowing our molecule to do things and affect the body, the biology in ways that CBD can't do. We've created an oral, oral formulation. We've got preclinical proof of concept established. We completed a large phase one human clinical study and now phase two is underway for EHP 101. Systemic sclerosis, as I mentioned, is our first indication. We're already enrolling patients in a phase two study. It's a life-threatening disease, no specific drugs approved for this. Lung fibrosis or scarring of the tissues in the lungs is one of the leading causes of death. And again, our molecule focuses and affects the validated pathways and receptors in the body that are specific for systemic sclerosis. And we've demonstrated this in multiple validated animal models of scleroderma and systemic sclerosis, showing that it prevents this scarring in the skin and in the internal organs, including this lung fibrosis that is what kills many people with systemic sclerosis. Now, multiple sclerosis, as I mentioned, is a large number of people have multiple sclerosis, over 2 million people people around the world. It's a chronic degenerative disease called a demyelinating disease. There is a sheath around our nerve cells that is called myelin and multiple sclerosis affects that myelin sheath, damages that myelin sheath and causes the, the symptoms that you see there for multiple sclerosis. The current medications provide main, mainly symptomatic relief. There's nothing that can reverse that demyelinating process and there are no therapies that can actually remyelinate damaged nerves. Again, why multiple sclerosis? Because our molecule in EHP 101 affects the validated biologic receptors and pathways in the body that are specific for multiple sclerosis. And again, we've been able to show this in four validated multiple sclerosis models that shows significant improvement in the clinical scores, but not only that, stops that demyelination process and actually remyelinates the damaged neurons. So let me show you what that means in, in, a, in a video graphic presentation of, of these animal models. The way these work, and these are in mice for these models, they give these animals a, a substance that demyelinates their nerve cells. So it mimics multiple sclerosis in humans. They put one group of animals that are control animals that get no treatment. They just get this molecule, this, this, this substance that demyelinates their nerves. And then the other group of animals gets the substance that demyelinates their nerves, but also gets EHP 101, our molecule, as treatment. This is an example of one of the animals that has been its nerves demyelinated, but no treatment. It's a control animal. You can see it's dragging its hind limbs, not moving around very quickly, not standing up, probably can't stand up because its nerves are demyelinated. Basically has full blown, the equivalent of full blown MS in humans. This is an animal that has been given that substance to demyelinate its nerves, but it was also treated with EHP 101. You can see it's moving quickly, standing normally, not dragging its hind limbs, basically cured, so to speak, of multiple sclerosis. Our clinical advisors, which are key opinion leaders in the world in multiple sclerosis, have said, if we can prove this in humans, like we do in these animal models, it's a game changer for the treatment of MS. And we're doing that right now. We're in phase two with systemic sclerosis, already enrolling patients, and we're in, we're in the activation stage for initiating our multiple sclerosis phase two human study as we speak. So that's EHP 101, our lead product candidate, a CBD derivative. EHP 102 is our second product candidate out of those 25 molecules. It's a CBG derivative. Again, 
you can see that the molecule in our EHP 102 is very similar in structure to CBG, but again, some very important differences like this central quinone group and a different side chain that allows it to act in ways that CBG cannot act. Specifically, it, we're developing it for oral delivery. We've got preclinical proof of concept established, and we're now starting to do the clinical studies, the clinical enabling studies that allow us to get into human studies with this molecule. Again, based on targeted mechanism of action, we affect the receptors and biologic pathways in the body that are specific for various neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease. Like I mentioned, over 10 million people worldwide have Parkinson's disease. This is a disease where damaged nerves do not produce enough of a substance called dopamine. Dopamine is critical to help transmit nerve impulses from the brain to the muscles. And what we've been able to show in validated models of Parkinson's disease is not only, again, do we improve the clinical symptoms and scores, but it actually reduces the loss of these nerve cells that produce dopamine. Similarly, Huntington's disease, an orphan designation, but also our molecule targets the receptors and pathways in the body that can improve and even potentially reverse Huntington's disease. There's no cure for Huntington's disease to this point. Three different validated animal models of Huntington's disease, again, showing improvement in symptoms, but also not only protecting the nerves from damage, but actually producing new healthy nerves. So very exciting for patients with Huntington's disease. We have done a lot of work on the science our scientific founders and chief scientific officer is very well published. These are four examples of, of publications that we've put out uh, on one, one on each of the different disease indications we're targeting. We've got several publications exp exploring all the scientific validation of our science. Now, technology is great. We also have a great team, and that's important to, for success in bio. Tech. We've got every one of our senior leaders that you see here are experienced pharma and biotech managers. They've been in the industry for over 30 years, each of us. And as I mentioned, we've got clinical scientific advisors that are key opinion leaders globally, and they are part of our, our advisory boards. So we're very fortunate to have great team and, and, and great management and great, great advisors. So in summary, the key highlights, we have a unique mechanism of action. These are new chemical entities derived from cannabinoids using science and biology. We've got broad patent protection, including composition of matter, large market opportunities, opportunities. We're in the phase two clinical stage of development, which is very important. That's where great value can be created in biotech. And we've got this strong team of biotech executives and, and, and advisors. And we are currently in a financing, an offering under regulation A until March the 28th, so just three days from now. We've been very successful in our financing with this story, and we invite you to take a look. If you're interested in investing, you can go to www.emeraldpharma.life to learn more, or please contact our investor relations group at invest at emeraldpharma.life. Thank you very much for your time, your interest, and your attention. Look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. I appreciate that. And you guys take note. Let's leave this slide up, Jim, if you don't mind, while we're taking questions so people can get to the email address there. Um, and again, the website is emeraldpharma.life, you guys, for that Reg A offering. Um, now, now, Jim, here's a question from the chat uh, from Jeff here. Just curious, what motivated the alteration uh, of a very effective indigenous mo uh, molecule? Adding to the CBD is genius. Is it so you can patent it? Yeah, Jeff, great question. And our scientific founders were looking at all types of natural products to try and treat diseases. Our, our chief scientific officer is an MD, PhD, Eduardo Munoz. He, he was looking to treat diseases that currently couldn't be treated. And he found, they found that the cannabinoids with their health benefits, their anti-inflammatory, anti Dioxidative capabilities were great starting materials, but they needed to do more because they can't cure these diseases like multiple sclerosis and, and Parkinson's disease. So they, they tested thousands of different side chains and alterations to the molecule until they found that it 
one like this that, that, that changed CBD could affect the targets that were, 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 were physiologic validated targets for multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and others. So we're able to do things that the natural molecule cannot do. Well, let, let's talk about market share for a second. So what you, you received that orphan drug designation um, for, for uh, your, your candidates here. What does that mean for you and the trajectory of the company, the trajectory of those candidates individually as compared to what else may be out there uh, in development? Yeah, it's, it's a great advantage to have orphan drug designation, as you mentioned, mentioned Patrick, because it, number one, allows to get through the regulatory, the, the, the clinical development process with more efficiency and, and, and a little faster, including getting fast track designation from the FDA. But also, as you're talking about, is we, even though we have patents that protect our molecules, orphan designation gives seven years of market exclusivity in the US and 10 years of market exclusivity in Europe once the product is approved and commercialized. So great protection for our molecules, patents and orphan designation. Wow. Wow. Seven years in the U.S. and 10 years in the EU. That is insane. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and good for you guys. Um, OK, so uh, let's jump back. I just want to make sure I understood this correctly and that our audience says to the EHP 101, um, you are jumping into phase two clinical trials. Is that correct? That's correct. We, we've already started an enrolling patients in our phase two clinical trial of systemic sclerosis. We expect to start enrolling patients in our multiple sclerosis phase two trial in the second half of next of this year, this year. So just in the next few months. And then we'll have two phase two trials going on. And as I mentioned, that's where a great value can be created in biotech. Uh, we, we, we know of GW Pharma, for example, who just got bought out for, for about $7 billion. When they were in phase two, like we are starting now, they went from a few hundred million in value to over $2 billion once they started getting phase two data. And that was still seven years, six years before they were commercializing their products. So great value can be created at this time in a biotechnology life. Well, and, and Jim, I won't ask you to put your your clairvoyant cap on here, right? But but when it comes to and just remind us, right, in the biotech sector specifically, uh, time from from clinical development to commercialization, and and how much it costs to bring a drug into into the market, and that timeline, give us remind us of a sense of of what that looks like. Yeah, generally, it's about a 10 year process to go from animal studies to through the different phases of human clinical trials, which are phase one, phase two, and then phase three. And so it takes about 10 years to do that. And it, as you mentioned, Patrick, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars, which is one of the reasons we're raising money and as a pre IPO company right now, and we'll continue to, to, uh, to create value for our investors as we go through this development process. Great. Great. Well, listen, I, I wish you all the best, Jim. Uh, this, this sounds really cool. It seems like you guys are, are really cornering the market when it comes to some of these treatments and the candidates that you've got. So good luck. I'm Thank sure we'll you. see you soon, but I'm, I'm sure the next three days will be fun for you. So uh, enjoy we'll, yourself. We've got a lot of activity, a lot of people wanting to explore it. So we welcome anybody to, to check it out. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals, you guys, invest at emeraldpharma.life is that email address, uh, or uh, I believe it's emeraldpharma.life is, is the website there. So feel free to check that out if you're interested in that reggae offering. Okay. All right. Let's keep this rolling right along. Next, I get to introduce the moderator of our next panel. Uh, uh, some really cool folks on this panel, by the way. But this is Natan Ponyman. Natan, welcome back. Hey, Patrick. Thanks for having me. How are you? Oh, How are you? it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure, man. Um, and, and welcome. What, what are we going to be discussing today? Thank you. Oh, we're going to be discussing the stigma around psychedelics and uh, a new and exciting sector in biotech. And it's got a foot on cannabis, a foot on biotech, and it's sort of in the middle ground between these two wonderful words in investing that we, we deal with a lot in Benzinga. Um, Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I will get out of your way, my friend. Gentlemen, enjoy Thank the you. panel. Thanks, Patrick. Hi, how is everyone? Good. How are you, Nathan? Oh, I'm great. Okay, so as we were just introducing with Patrick, um, the idea of this panel is to discuss psychedelics in the context of biotech and investing. 
And uh, the last conference we had, uh, the last one I mean we had on psychedelics at Benzinga was in the cannabis conference we had in February. And in a way, I would say that cannabis investors are accustomed to investing in, in companies dealing with scheduled drugs, but other investors, maybe investors in biotech, uh, don't feel as comfortable. But this is a great sector and uh, it's exciting. There's a lot going on. So our, our idea here is to explain what is happening in the sector, all the progress that is being made, um, give a little context on what psychedelics uh, inspired medicines are or psychedelic therapies are or how these compounds that are scheduled but are being scheduled at the moment can be used to treat patients especially in the mental health aspect of things um so yeah let's just start um let's start introducing our panelists uh timothy would you like to introduce yourself and, and your company, MTL? Yeah, totally. I'm uh, Timothy. First of all, thank you for uh, hosting. Uh, Timothy, I'm the CEO of MTL Biomedical. Uh, we're developing uh, psychedelic uh, drugs for the treatment of addiction uh, utilizing DMT, uh, applied within a therapeutic context, of course, uh, administered intravenously. Um, and yeah, we're really trying to facilitate, I guess, an inversion of expectations that people have around addiction-related outcomes and uh, harnessing the transformational potential of DMT uh, to develop a very safe and effective way of treating uh, those issues. Amazing, thank you. Reed, would you like to continue? Sure, I'm Reed Robison, psychiatrist and chief <clears throat> medical officer at Nova Mind. Uh, at Nova Mind, we're building infrastructure for the psychedelic medicine industry within the mental health care system. So we have a network of clinics, research sites, and retreats uh, delivering ketamine-assisted psychotherapy and uh, um, doing research studies with uh, ketamine and other compounds. Um, I'm also working with MAPS on their eating disorder study of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy and uh, have been working with ketamine for about 10 years now. Good. Amazing. And Joseph, please. Thanks, uh, Natan, and nice to be here. Nice to see you again. Nice to see everybody else, Reed and Tim. Nice to see you guys. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Dr. Joseph Tucker. I'm the CEO of Magic Med Industries. And at Magic Med, what we're doing is uh, we're creating a, a whole new portfolio of new chemical entities, like uh, Jim DeMesa was just talking about. Um, but we're making a very large portfolio of new molecules, all based on the classic psychedelics. But the idea is that if we make a lot of new molecules, we might be able to come up with some, some new drug candidates that perform even better than the current classic psychedelics. And our goal is to partner with other companies, get as many of those drug candidates out going through the clinic and get them to patients as soon as possible. Cool, okay. Thank you all for that. So as we were saying, our idea here is to investors allow themselves to invest in psychedelics because it's a, it's a great sector to invest in. Um, so in order to do that, we thought we'd go around the history of psychedelic use. Uh, psychedelics have been used medicinally and uh, in a spiritual and shamanistic context by humankind for hundreds and maybe even thousands of years. Um, and it was only in the 20th century that they became scheduled and there was a, a prosecution in around the people who use them. So um, let's just start reviewing the history of Alex. Uh Maybe Tim, would you like to explain a little bit on how psychedelics were used by humans in the ancient times? And then maybe we can move on from there. Totally, um, no, thank you. Um, so I, there's, um, I guess, yeah. Uh, a way to frame this is that uh, psychedelics are often sort of viewed as this novel thing and like I guess a lot of the stigma and baggage is attached to the more recent over the last century usage of this but there is a whole wealth of historical um, evidence that these molecules and these substances have been used um, you know not just within the South American context but anthropological studies have indicated that people have used ergot uh, in sort of Greek Roman and Egyptian uh, traditions um, there's not a ton written about that, but it has been present there. 
uh, but then focusing on the South, South American as well as the um, indigenous North American utilization. There's the Shipibo tribes, and the Quechua tribes uh, that have utilized it within their actual system of medicine for that sort of spiritual, uh, spiritual, psychological and bodily health system. And so, um, yeah, there is a huge uh, history of successful and therapeutic use there. Um, so, yeah, to remedy these things that within a Westernized context, you know, we, we're in the sort of business of pathology, or that's how we, I guess, categorize these things. But uh, to use a different lexicon, different sort of language system, um, you know, psychedelics like such as ayahuasca and peyote have been utilized for, you know, the purposes of generating meaning for sort of dealing with existential confusion or a sense of um, I guess, uh, disconnectedness from each other. Um, and yeah, if you were to put that into a westernized context, I think a lot of the sort of disorders that we see do fit within the context of that, whether it's depression or addiction, uh, really stem from that place that is, you know, lexiconically different, but are we're very well treated by things like psychedelics. Yeah, yeah. And it's very interesting to note that for a long time in the history of humans, spirituality and medicine were not something that was separate. Um, for a long time, the spiritual leaders were also who served the role of maybe what we would call doctors today. Um, so in that context, psychedelics played a huge role in healing people's minds and bodies. Um, so Reed, would you like to continue and maybe let us know how psychedelic drugs and, and compounds got introduced into the Western world and started being studied by, by scientists in the 20th century? Sure, yeah, those are some fun stories. I'll give uh, a couple little snippets from my perspective, uh, perhaps on focused on LSD and MDMA. MDMA is actually uh, progressing uh, very well through the drug development pipeline um, via an organization you may be familiar with called MAPS uh, leading uh, MDMA assisted psychotherapy studies for PTSD and the results are quite striking but but rewinding a bit from there MDMA was uh, synthesized by Merck back in the early 1900s uh, it sat on the shelves for a long time for decades the first animal study was in the 50s and then uh, it became uh, used in therapy in the 70s um, some even called it it was interesting uh, uh, penicillin for the soul. It uh, was used in couples work and really MDMA is a unique uh, empathogen, not a classic psychedelic, but where it creates a safe container uh, where the individual uh, has more trust of themselves, uh, others, and is able to move through difficult memories and difficult emotional states. And uh, But then because it was used recreationally, because of the the political climate at the time and so many other factors it became a banned as a schedule one controlled substance um, and that's uh that's the crusade that maps has been on they got the green light in 2010 to uh, begin using mdma and research studies for ptsd uh, then the other one uh, i'll point out is that's really interesting is lsd um, because you know as a psychiatrist uh, the data is fascinating on these medicines back from the, the uh, 60s um, and 70s. There's a, you know, we don't always think about the fact that these aren't new. There's a lot of new research coming out that's exciting, but there's a lot of older research to build on. So LSD was synthesized by a chemist named Albert Hoffman. He accidentally dipped his finger in some uh, and uh, went on the uh, adventure of a lifetime uh, there's this this day commemorating it called Bible day um, where he had this radical shift in consciousness and uh, that really changed him and so he he became intrigued by it and the potential and they started sending lsd uh, for use in psychotherapy and uh, sending it to uh, psychiatrists, therapists, uh, other folks. And then uh, it was used for a while in that, uh, in that kind of setting. Um, there were a lot of studies, for example, there's this uh, psychiatrist named Humphrey Osmond, I think, who, uh, who started studying LSD for uh, 
alcohol abuse and the success rates, the the relapse prevention from L LSD psychotherapy at the time was was really uh, kind of blowing away treatment as usual, but there was such a stigma attached to it. And because of the, the all these factors we were talking about, it, it too, uh, along with all these other psychedelics for the most part, became uh, schedule one banned substances and went dark for, for years. So that that's, I'll end it there for now. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, I, I guess you can understand the position governments were in in the late 1960s and the early 70s when huge masses of people started taking these drugs um, for their own reason and, and for for exploring their own consciousness and even maybe even recreationally. And so it's understandable that the the people in positions of power felt the need to to prohibit all the substances just in case i guess it, it, it makes sense and there's a lot of social and cultural and and political aspects of the war on drugs that that we won't stop to discuss here but it, it it's understandable from from a, the perspective of the people in the government but it's also um interesting to know that we come to a moment in the in the history of, of humans and of the global governments that yeah, it's time to get these drugs out there again and maybe actually um, investigate and do the research to know how these drugs can help patients and how they can be used uh, in psychiatry. And so maybe, Joseph, you can let us know uh, from your point of view how these drugs are being researched now for, for psychiatric purposes. Well, I, th I think, you know, just as uh, uh, both uh, Tim and, and Reed mentioned, when looking at the history, I mean, these molecules, how they, how they function, the things they do ha have been fairly well, I guess, accepted societally, because this is how our cultures have been using them for a long time. We already have sort of a, a presupposition of, of what's going on. And I think, you know, before we completely leave the subject of what happened and why was there a shutdown, let's say, of the research on this field? You know, it was more than just a, say, a, a shifting cultural mores. There were also some mistakes being made. There were, there were, um, you know, there were clinical trials being run on people without proper, you know, notification of to the subjects of, of what was taking place. Um, you know, the, the government was doing things like MK Ultra. So there were a lot of um, things going on that that were inappropriate and and on top of that there was a real question then and this uh, this is the takeaway there was a real question then on how well the trials were being that were being run how well they were being run how well they were being controlled and it's a, it's a sticky question that i think you know we've advanced a lot since then but it is something we still have to be very very careful of is how do you control for these kinds of things when you're you're giving a patient something it's pretty obvious whether or not they got the placebo or or the actual drug. How do you control for that, right? It's one of those things that we have to pay close attention to, and it's probably at the sort of the core of one of the big outstanding questions right now, which is, you know, how much is the hallucination, how much is it required, right? Is it essential? Is it not essential? So that's going on right now, but what we are seeing, a lot of, a lot of you know, very high quality, uh, academics and institutions and, and now companies are really seeing basically proving out what society has been doing for a long time, just like Tim said, right? This is, these are great ways to uh, deal with your existential angst, let's say, if, for lack of a better term, and really helps you address things like PTSD, anxiety, depression, the whole host of things. You know, the, the data that we're seeing right now is very exciting, but I, you know, I want us to all remember that you know, what happened before, right? It, it wasn't just societal mores. There were some corners cut, let's say, or, or lack of rigor on the clinical trials. We've got to make sure we don't make that mistake again. Yes, yes, I agree with you. Um, would you all gentlemen like to tell us if you have a, in hand some hard numbers on the progress that is being made in research? Maybe specifically, we're going to talk about psilocybin for treatment, treatment persistent depression and MDMA for PTSD. Uh, and then team, if you want to speak on 
DMT for addiction and anything you can you can think of that that helps uh, shed some light on the progress that is being made in research. Sure. Would you like me to start? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. No, I think um, so. As was mentioned by Reed and Joseph, there's. Um, yeah, we're at a sort of, uh, I guess, a rekindling point about the sort of continuation of research that uh, was taking place in the 50s and 60s. Um, but yeah, I do think it's very um, correct what uh, Joseph said, that there is now a, in this opportune moment, there is a need for very rigorous uh, structuring of this so that we don't fall into that same pit of uh, sort of confusion and accusation being, you know, um, sort of appropriate for accusation um you know so but there is like i uh, just mentioned a ton of very promising research coming out right now and so i guess pertinent to us you know we are you know targeting the addiction space uh with dmt um and dmt in many ways is very similar to psilocybin just in terms of how that's dosed it does carry on that uh carry that same effect uh from the entropic perspective the dysregulation of the default mode network um, so one of the really um, interesting things that one of our advisors has done in the addiction space is um, with regard to nicotine addiction. And so much like in the same way that um, LSD, you know, at that stage of research proved super promising for the purposes of treating uh, alcoholism, uh, a study that Johns Hopkins put out recently showed that uh, smoking cessation uh, or smoking, uh, smoking reduction efficacy using uh, psilocybin was in the 70 percent range and that's head and shoulders above uh, any type of the interventions that currently exist and so um, we see there's a huge potential especially when it's premised on the idea that the underlying motivations for addiction aren't just exclusively due to some molecule uh, like such as nicotine or opiates but are underpinned by that very complex milieu of existential questions that psychosocial spiritual component um, yeah, that's, uh, it's, you know, the, the groundswell of interest is now fomenting into actual uh, empirical data, which is uh, super interesting. So I'll leave it to the others to uh, talk about um, MDMA and psilocybin. I think that's Reed's wheelhouse. Sure. Uh, I can uh, give a little uh, snippet on each as far as the data goes, the science coming out in this uh, renaissance that I think is one of the main uh, drivers, to be honest, in reducing the stigma is the science, uh, lending the credibility, uh, the safety, uh, the comfort around safety, and then uh, from there, the awareness spreading and acceptance. But uh, let's look at MDMA. Uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD specifically. So not only are these, these phase two studies from MAPS showing effectiveness, but also sustained effectiveness without even having to take a daily pill. So in the studies of severe PTSD, uh, approximately 70% of participants no longer even meet criteria for PTSD six or 12 months later at follow-up. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is quite striking uh, because there are no good uh, FDA approved treatment options that get at the root underlying cause, especially that aren't uh, daily um, medicines. This is a paradigm shift for psychiatry. And similarly, if you look at the psilocybin studies for treatment-resistant depression, uh, those who received just two doses of psilocybin plus therapy in the therapeutic setting um, had uh, not only rapid reduction in their depression symptoms, but this was sustained over time, even uh, 12 months later. So as a psychiatrist, again, two doses of of a medicine plus psychotherapy with that kind of result um, quicker than treatment as usual and sustained effectiveness without a daily medicine is uh, uh, is definitely encouraging a sign of hope for me uh, because of how many people are suffering from uh, serious mental health conditions. And what about ketamine and Spravato and those treatments which are actually legal in the US and Canada yeah. today? You know, interestingly, we've we've given uh, just thousands of doses of Spravato and thousands of doses of ketamine uh, assisted psychotherapy uh, in the last few years in clinic. It is legal. It's prescribable. It's been around for decades as in anesthesia and well known to us in terms of safety. And in low dose, it was discovered 
um, in the early 2000s that it happens to be a rapid antidepressant. So I started using it in 2011 um, after really, uh, you know, dissecting these studies and uh, realizing that we didn't have very many good options uh, for treating uh, severe depression, especially uh, when someone's in a crisis situation. So um, uh, I've been using it since uh, in research and clinical settings, but then in 2019, the FDA approved Spravato, which is S-ketamine, modified form of ketamine, in a nasal spray form for uh, treatment-resistant depression. And uh, then more recently, in the past few months, they approved uh, a second indication, which is suicidality with depression um, because of Spravato's rapid onset of action. And so ketamine, while not a classic psychedelic, does have psychedelic properties, it also uh, works really well as a rapid antidepressant. Response rates uh, upwards of 60 to 70 percent, uh, and that comes on board very quickly. And it's not, and again, it's not a daily um, pill that someone relies on, although it can, the effects can be temporary, especially without therapy tied to it. Good, good. That's all amazing. And Joseph, um, would you like to tell us about what next step for psychedelics? What's the future? What are the new molecules being developed? And, and how can these molecules be improved for better effect? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, we, I think we're seeing in the sector kind of, uh, I don't know, the Gen 1 and Gen 2, or, or maybe it's uh, um, a, a bifurcation, perhaps, of a segmentation of the market of the patient population. There are those, you know, where this looks like it's going to be a, a great approach Again, the you know the data is is mid stage now, phase twos, phase threes, looking very exciting, and I think for you know a fair number of patients that it's going to be uh, a great uh, a great product. But there's also still always the idea of can we improve upon this? Can we make better molecules? Can we make molecules with less side effects or just you know different characteristics? And I think that we're also seeing a move towards that. Quite a few companies are operating in that space. And, and really we're trying to, uh, you know, let's say down-regulate some, some of the side effects that might be associated with it. You know, there's a lot of things you, you can imagine on, on this side and, and also, you know, potentially just increase the, increase the potential benefits. So there's a lot going on there across the field. Many folks are doing the same thing that Magic Med is doing, which is trying to make new molecules that maybe have, maybe have better effects. Those are all, much earlier in the pipeline, of course, you know, one of the advantages of the classic, I call them the classic psychedelics, is they've been around so long, there's so much knowledge around, around them that even though there was, you know, quite a proscription on working on them, there's still a lot of, you know, anecdotal data, if nothing else, and a, and a lot of other data out there. So those molecules tend to be later stage, later phase, um, but there's also a, a lot of competition there. People are essentially working, a great number of entities are working with a small number of molecules. So I think there's certainly a place for both. Uh, you know, we've certainly seen, and I think Reed and Tim have both given great examples of the kinds of opportunities and the kinds of data being generated right now. There's also a lot of other patients out there that probably will benefit from improved molecules, molecules with lesser side effects. So that's kind of what I see in the sector right now is, is this two, this two-step approach, the classics, which are making a lot of headway right now, and then that next-gen improved molecules that are probably be a little further down, uh, you know, time-wise. Perfect. Thank you. And maybe I'll just stay with you, Joseph, for a second, and we can discuss, um, I mean, as we've been discussing, um, psychedelics carry a great baggage, a great cultural baggage, but the way they're being studied right now and put through clinical trials, are very similar to, to pharma development. However, there are certain differences. So what makes the psychedelic sector a sector in itself? And what are the differences that you find between the sector and biotech in general? What, what makes this sector special for you? Sure, yeah, well, so part of it is, as I just mentioned, you know, the, the fact that the molecules have been around for a long time, that they're generally speaking, 
generics and there's a lot of data. So you can start much later in the process. You can go more quickly, but it is more competitive. And at the end of the day, the, the regulatory agencies do have some knowledge of what they're dealing with. Um, but on the other hand, with the psychedelics, there's, you know, they have additional considerations, let's say, right, that have to be worked out. So there's always some risk, especially if you're talking about novel psychedelics of unknown activity, there's there's some risk of, for example, psychosis, right? The, the, we're talking about really important stuff going on in the brain here. So it's a higher risk area than many others. Um, so that, that's another area that really is going to take a lot of scrutiny from the regulatory agencies. And I know big pharma too. It's an area that gives them concern. Certainly the conversations I've had with, with folks in big pharma, they have some concern of, of, about the mechanism here. That's one of the other big challenges is the mechanism, this is something that people don't talk about, but the mechanism is really a black box right now. How, how this is working, is it really the 5-HT2A receptor? Is that the essential receptor? Because the 5-HT receptors, there's a whole, there's 14 of them. Uh, they're all serotonin receptors. There's promiscuity, which means a molecule that hits the 5-HT2A probably hits several other receptors. And those other receptors are, are our targets for the, the known anti-anxiety, antidepressive drugs that are out there right now. So, you know, whether there's a lot of mechanistic questions going on here and that really clouds the water when you're going through clinical trials and when you're dealing with the regulatory agencies. So that just, that makes it a, a lot more challenging, I think, with the unknown mechanism. You're on mute, Natan. You're on mute, Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Does anyone else want to follow up on that and maybe explain their views on what makes the psychedelic sector special? Or maybe we can jump to something else. Um, I, I just really uh, wouldn't want to say like that Joseph is making a ton of sense. There's, um, yeah, we see a lot of Gen 1 developments are carrying on the torch from that first generation. But I do think that some of these complex considerations about, you know, um, safety and how to make things you know, less adverse, fewer side effects are certainly things that we as an industry need to focus on. So I'm really encouraged by the work that uh, Magic Med is doing. But, you know, and in that similar, I guess, view of the space as it evolves, we're also working on means uh, development of technologies that allows for that, about taking a snapshot about the individual before they're prescribed anything. Um, because the reality is that, you know, with so much, not crowding in, but so much in uh, interest in the space with uh, sort of a land grab taking place with many people. The presumed reality five or 10 years from now is that there will be so many psychedelic molecules that potentially make their way through the approval process. So uh, physicians and therapists and practitioners that are ultimately armed with or, you know, tasked with the role of administering these things first on prescriptive, you know, making that prescriptive decision will have so many molecules potentially to work from. And so, um, you know, that's, that's a great thing, but ultimately, um, you know, we do, th I, I think that we do need to find out some means of determining, yeah, in the interest of increasing safety, what molecules are appropriate for which individuals. And so uh, some of the developments that we're um, undertaking are to, uh, you know, use genetics as well as neuroimaging to, you know, provide a, a more, a more, I guess, robust basis of assessment, because ultimately all of us in the sector are focused on you know, really amplifying positive effects from these treatments. And it's uh, it's really great that so many people are proposing novel treatments, but um, ultimately when it comes down to what the patient is going to be prescribed, I think it's great to have that sort of wealth of selection as well as a way to precisely uh, prescribe things. Yeah, yes. I think it's really interesting um, that a lot of the positive effect that comes from the consumption of psychedelics in a therapy context has to do with a subjective personal experience that a, a lot of times touches on the mystical. And so I think it's one of the first times in history that mainstream medicine and mainstream science and the scientific establishment has to actually make an effort to understand the mystical experience, which to me is just fascinating. Um, so I'd like to continue discussing the possible revenue avenues for the psychedelic sector, which is a very complex and, and widespread sector. And there are many possible ways of leveraging 
these drugs into revenue. So we can talk about patents, we can talk about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy clinics. Uh, there's a lot. So whoever wants to go first, maybe uh, read since you've been um, managing a successful clinic that works with psychedelics for, for many years now. You, you want to let us know how this? Sure. Yeah, it's, uh, I can certainly speak to uh, the psychedelic medicines that we use now clinically. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, ketamine has been prescribable for uh, quite a while, has been given to over a million people for various reasons. And, uh, and so we're seeing uh, increased uh, demand, increased support around it, increased evidence to back its use in psychiatry. And so there are revenue opportunities right now, clinically, um, and meaningful work uh, to come out of that by using these compounds in a you know a safe and therapeutic way. And then the addition of Spravato when FDA approved, um, it's a, a Janssen medicine, like I mentioned, for treatment resistant depression and also for suicidality. Uh, when that uh, came on the market, it became the first FDA approved psychedelic type medicine and therefore is uh, covered by most insurance plans if the individual meets criteria. So we've given it uh, nearly three, nearly 3,000 times in clinics since its approval, and every single one of those was covered by uh, insurance because it's an expensive medicine. Um, so, uh, and then what's coming, there's a huge demand for new tools for healing from trauma, for example, MDMA is coming, psilocybin moving down the pipeline for depression. And so this uh, trajectory that's already begun will continue and expand. Good. Thank you. Patrick, do you still have time? Or I'm here, my friends. I think we are right at time, right at time. But Natan, I really appreciate the discussion. Thank you. Dr. Robeson, I know we heard from, from Yaren earlier this morning, but thank you for being here. Uh, and then Tim and Dr. Tucker, we're going to see you guys very shortly. So stick around um, and, and investors know that that is what is coming up next. Again, Natan, thanks for the questions, man. No, thank you. And if I just can say something really quick, Go the for it. sector is it's on sale right now. Uh, the sector has come down from from a rise in the middle of February. So it's a good opportunity to invest in psychedelics today because I believe they're going to go up pretty soon. There we go. There we go. And now comes my disclaimer that we don't uh, provide investment advice. But of course, oh, so but, but but that's OK. That's OK. But of course, we, we want all of you to be interested in the sector um, and, because we are right. And, and obviously, we believe in it uh, because we're putting all of these wonderful speakers up here. So Natan, thank you. Gentlemen, thank you. We'll oh, see you, you very shortly. Thank you all. All right. So next up, my friends, we get to bring back uh, to our virtual stage here, the uh, CEO of Clever Leaves, Kyle Detweiler, and, uh, and our good friend, Tom Zuber, the managing partner of Zuber Lawler for a quick fireside chat. Clever Leaves, CLVR, again, is the ticker there. Super excited for this. Uh, Tom, Kyle, What's happening, fellas? Good to see you, Patrick. Uh, Good to see you. Here. Pleasure to Good. be with you always. And and you, my friend. Kyle, welcome back. I don't know that any of us can match Tom's really cool blue background there, so I'm going to turn off my camera. Go to it, guys. <laughs> Hi, Kyle. It's good to see you. How you been? Good afternoon, Tom. Great. So I'm excited to speak today. Uh, and. Um, First, uh, uh, for the audience members who don't know me, I'm Tom Zuber. I'm the managing partner of Zuber Lawler, and we've been in the cannabis space uh, for over 14 years, and we represent a large portion of the of the iconic brands of the of the global cannabis industry. Uh, and Kyle, uh, do you want to take a moment to introduce yourself? Most of the audience knows you, just for the few that don't, uh, and, and what you do at Clever Leafs. Sure. Um, so I'm Kyle Detweiler. I'm the CEO of Clever Leafs. Uh, Clever Leafs is one of the largest cannabis companies outside of North America. Uh, we're probably best known for our Colombian operation. We have about uh, 2 million square feet of cultivation down there. We have uh, you know, the continent's only EU GMP certified uh, production. And as a single country, they allocate the amount of THC which can be produced in Colombia. And you know, Cleverly's has approximately half of the country's allocation. 
Uh, we also have a uh, THC flower uh, operation uh, in, in Portugal, so one of the few uh, licensed cultivation businesses in, in Europe. Uh, we have two narcotics importation uh, investments in, uh, in Germany since uh, uh, cannabis is not uh, currently produced domestically there. Uh, and then uh, to open up the U.S., uh, we have a non-cannabis business, a, a nutraceutical business in, in Arizona that we acquired a couple of years ago. Great. Thanks, Kyle. Um, and uh, as a disclosure item, Zuber Lawler does represent Clever Leaves on matters here in the United States. Uh, Kyle, I'd like to open with, uh, well, something that's on everybody's mind, I think not just here in the U.S., but uh, perhaps uh, in other countries as well. Uh, the end of prohibition in the United States. What are your thoughts on that? Will it happen? Um, if it does, uh, when do you think that might be? Uh, and furthermore, more to the point, uh, what effect do you think the end of prohibition in the U.S. would have on cannabis import export activity throughout the world? Well, if I was a betting person, I would probably bet that the ship has sailed and cannabis legalization in the United States at the federal level is an inevitability. Um, you know, whether that means we're 12 months, uh, 24 months or some period longer, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I could certainly see a situation in which, uh, you know, in the next uh, in the next year, there is some ratification that the state operators are doing uh, doing so in compliance with federal law. Or I could also similarly see a path where the federal government says we are going to try a new system, a new structure, um, you know, federal DEA licenses or, you know, imports only like countries like Germany and Brazil have begun with. I'm, I'm not sure, uh, but I think something like that is is coming. And, you know, from a social perspective, you know, can't come soon enough. Right. You know, I don't think it's a great idea to have a state by state matrix where there's not okay. uniform regulation. Uh, you don't know what's coming in the quality standards in California when then you fly to Las Vegas and it's a totally different kind of ball game over there. I don't think that's great for the consumer. And if it's not good for the consumer, it's not great for the industry. Uh, so, you know, I hope that we have a system that allows for more competition, better innovation, hopefully lower pricing. And that's where I think actually where Clever Leaves kind of plays a, a potentially instrumental role because a lot of uh, states that have legalized have kind of complained that they have been unable to kind of root out, you know, the illicit market um, and regulated participants might complain about the tax burden that comes from that. But, you know, Cleverly's ethos is to cultivate where Mother Earth intended. And it just so happens that we also do so at a 90 percent cost reduction you know, to say our peers in Canada. So if we can bring lower product into the market that can create more jobs, more innovation, uh, and, 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 and more tax revenue, and it also can combat that sort of illicit market. So those are a couple of the paths um, that I think, you know, should be considered. And, you know, most most cannabis, uh, you know, industry conferences are focusing just on interstate commerce. You know, will California be able to export to Massachusetts? But, um, you know, I think about the alcohol industry, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in an alcohol store in Massachusetts, you can see Grey Goose from France, um, you know, uh, Jack Daniels, Tennessee from or uh, whiskey from Tennessee, um, and uh, you might even get lucky and get some Canadian beer in there. Uh, so I think that's kind of the way that the market will eventually evolve. Uh, just a question of time. Great, uh, and I do agree with your notion or the implication, at least, uh, that the end of prohibition here in the United States it could have uh, a, a dramatic impact on on the flow of biomass and products derived from biomass and money associated with those flows uh, throughout the world. And on that note. Uh, it seems to me that we really haven't seen the show yet uh, as far as, as interstate commerce relating to, to cannabis and, and the, the powerful, uh, I, I guess you could call them synergies or opportunities or, or just price differentials that exist between places like the United States, for instance, and places like Colombia. And, and obviously there's going to be a massive flow at some point uh, of, uh, from places with lower production costs uh, and, and frankly, perhaps even uh, some, some quality uh, control uh, benefits in terms of climate and, and, and favorability of growth and those sorts of things. Uh, and then, then obviously the nine, $9 out of every 10 uh, currently in cannabis are being spent in the United States. So to start to see that movement uh, from places like Colombia into places like the United States and, and Europe, which is the biggest market of 10 years from now. Um, so, so that's really, really exciting times. And on that notion, um, what are your plans to enter, Cleverleaf's plans to enter the United States if prohibition ends, uh, obviously that's going to look one way. And then uh, if prohibition doesn't end, and I, I agree with you fully, Kyle, I think that, that we're sort of on a path now and, and that path is, is, is just gonna become increasingly concrete toward a, a legal status, a full legal status here in the United States. But if it doesn't happen, um, what, what are your plans then relating to the United States? Sure, so we'll take, take the first one, you know, what if it does end? Um, yeah. I'd say the bull case, 
would be that regulation of cannabis in the United States looks very similar to how the FDA is starting to regulate CBD. Uh, in fact, maybe goes a little bit further because THC or most other forms of cannabis, unlike CBD, are, are psychoactive. Uh, so I think they're going to take a, a, a tighter touch to it. And just imagine a world where a dispensary isn't necessarily in that picture, but a, a common place where, you know, Americans today might buy other controlled substances, i.e. a pharmacy, becomes the point of distribution. So connect that back to Cleverleaves. What if Cleverleaves is providing, you know, EU GMP certified products, effectively the equivalent of an FDA inspected healthcare facility, which doesn't happen in the United States cannabis industry today, and it sells those products straight at a Walgreens. You know, there's no dispensary, there's no NSO, there's not even a cannabis brand that you've heard of that might be involved in that step. That would be sort of the absolute best, you know, structure for Cleverleaves. Might be the lowest probability. I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think there's other shades of this where, you know, we might partner up with the existing industry. You know, what if uh, an American cannabis operator or brand, you know, wants a large scale biomass or extract infusion? Well, Clever Leaves is very well suited to provide that product. Uh, maybe those companies will even start to think about the provenance of Colombia. You know, if you knew the coffee space well, uh, a lot of companies work very hard to import you know, coffee from the country of Colombia because, you know, the price premium for Colombian coffee is about 20% compared to global averages. So cannabis also has a history uh, in, uh, in Colombia. And so I could see Colombian uh, oriented brands that Cleverly's could uniquely open up for, for some of these operators. Now, what if we're wrong and, and legalization doesn't happen? Again, from a social perspective, I would be, I would be bothered. You know, I think cannabis has a power to, to help uh, a lot of people, both from a wellness perspective and a pharmaceutical perspective. But even if we, our dreams don't come true and uh, cannabis legalization does not happen here federally, uh, we've already seen major initiatives outside of the United States as a result of the change in the administration. So just a couple of weeks after Biden was declared the presumptive winner of the election, Israel announced its campaign to begin a recreational program in approximately one year. I personally, I don't think that would have happened under the Trump administration. Yeah. Also, yeah. Uh, after that, you know, we had the United Nations, which descheduled cannabis from its restrictive schedule four, you know, effectively where, where heroin sits. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a step forward. And, you know, just in the last couple of weeks, we've seen Mexico, you know, move forward yeah, with, yeah. with both on both fronts, both a medical a pharmaceutical kind of program, as well as a potential uh, recreational program. So, you know, if we can't sell in the United States, that's fine. I mean, I, it surprises most people when I cite the stat, but, you know, if you counted the population of Europe, where we sell today, and Brazil, uh, that's nearly a billion people if you count Russia. So there's a lot of opportunity outside the United States. Of course, it's earlier. Uh, you know, those markets haven't developed as much, but, you know, there are people in Europe and places like Israel that use, you know, as much cannabis as, you know, people in Colorado. So there, there are good opportunities out there. Uh, and, and on this note, and I, I want to ask you about the pharmaceutical industry and, and the uh, uh, ethyform matter uh, and, and how that impacts the industry. But what are your thoughts on Mexico and what's happening there? And how does that uh, influence your day? In, in other words, uh, thinking about the future, uh, of how does that impact Clever Leaves, uh, so on and so forth, uh, Mexico? Well, in any country beginning a cannabis program to me, again, from a social perspective is great. From a commercial opportunity you know, I, I think it is also positive for, for Clever Leaks. What we've begun to notice in internationally, outside of Canada and the United States, the pharmaceutical or medical side of these industries, and in Mexico, I, if I were a betting person, I think that will start first. They're looking a lot more pharmaceutical, right? The medical, quote, industry in the United States looks a little, little different. Um, you know, most of it could have started in a flower product, whereas, you know, if you go into a pharmacy to buy normal medicines, you don't, you know, combust and inhale uh, any of those, those medicines. So if you looked at Germany and you looked at Brazil, you know, a lot of the requirements have things like GMP certification, physician prescriptions. Um, you're going to have to have, you know, very robust uh, traceability standards, full drug dossiers in, in many cases, which are, you know, multi hundred page documents explaining a lot of the intricacies or components of the, of the product, how they were tested, you know, did the bottle, you know, survive under a stability test, a stress test, that kind of thing. And I think that's actually how the Mexican pharma space is going to work. And that's going to surprise a lot of people. I think people are going to think Mexico is going to have, you know, a low bar, low quality, it'll just be 
sort of like Southern California, I think what we're going to see is going to look a lot more stringent and look a lot more like the Brazilian or the, the, the German uh, market. Good points, Kyle. Um, we could spend some time on that, but but uh, since we do have a limited amount of time here, I'd like to ask you your thoughts on, on pharma and, and particularly, Kyle, why hasn't pharma entered cannabis with greater force? Well, I, I, in general, I think I completely agree with that statement. The, the biggest you know, entry, if you want to describe it, did happen just a couple of uh, months ago. And, you know, Jazz Pharmaceuticals uh, acquired a GW Pharma, you know, $7 billion transaction. If that's not enough zeros to show sign of entry, I'm not sure what, what, what could be. But, you know, beyond that, the list is a little bit, you know, low. Um, and I think a lot of that happens to deal with the industry structure. You know, if you went back and, you know, you, you kind of Google some of the biggest names in the cannabis sector, who were doing some of these deals with pharmaceutical companies, which generally were all Canadian-based or at least Canadian-initiated uh, businesses, those companies were really trying to get pharmaceutical companies to sell the cannabis companies' brands. Mm. They weren't saying to Pfizer or Merck, hey, we will design a product for you, and you're experts at downstream commercialization of pharmaceutical products, so you do your thing, We'll provide you the API. It's a, it's a valuable API. It's not easy to replicate this, but that didn't really exist um, until Cleverly's hit the, hit the scene, right? Our, our vision has always been to enable those companies, approach them and say, guys, it took us four years, a quarter of a billion of capital raised, and a lot of luck and hard work to get these licenses, to get United Nations quotas for you know, psychoactive substances, to build a GMP certified supply chain, you get all of that for free, and now we just provide you that ingredient. And that's what I think is so watershed about that FE Farm transaction that we announced a couple of weeks ago. This is a yeah. major European pharmaceutical company, you know, 1,500 employees in Europe. It's backed by a 20 plus billion dollar private equity firm in Europe called PIA Partners. This is the real deal. And, you know, out of all of the different op options, doing it themselves, partnering with the cannabis company, you know, they even had partnered with a cannabis company in the French experiment. Um, here they chose Cleverleaf. So I think our thesis is starting to play out just like, you know, 40, 50 years ago when these low cost generic drug companies began in Southeast Asia, I think people needed a couple of years to see that they could produce at high quality standards. And with this deal, I think that doubt is over. Very good. And, and Kyle, I want to ask a follow up question, but I, I think uh, Patrick may be coming on 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 the scene here to tell us we're out of time. That, that is true. If, if it's a brief follow up question, I'll allow it. But I'll also make reference to my background, which is now Tom. So take that. I, I appreciate that. Thank you for that, Patrick. Uh, Kyle, free. I actually want to ask you about uh, something else, just another bit of news. So, and, and also, Kyle, I want to say uh, congratulations to you and to Clever Leaves on, on the Ethi Farm uh, deal. So that is very exciting. And I think it's uh, well, uh, I, I guess disruptive in a sense. I really do think it's a sign of things to come. So, so kudos to you and kudos to Clever Leafs. Um, the Cure Leafs uh, uh, recent deals, nearly three hundred billion dollar, a million dollars uh, spent on the acquisition of, of EMAC Life Sciences. Uh, what's the significance of that to the future of, of uh, the international cannabis industry? And also, uh, does it impact uh, Clever Leafs? Uh, and if so, uh, uh, how is it impacting your view of things? Well, a couple things. You know, there are not many players in Europe that have licenses to produce cannabis. And in the last couple of months, two of the major producers in Portugal were acquired. You know, Tilray Afria are coming together, Cureleaf Emac, and arguably Cleverleaves is kind of the one of the three major producers there. So that creates a lot of interest. You know, our phone has been ringing a lot um, over the last couple of weeks over this. The other thing is it wasn't a pharmaceutical company that acquired, you know, Emac. Uh, it was an American MSO, which is arguably a little bit bent or biased towards a recreational market. You know, we haven't even gotten a chance to talk about the potential legalization of the recreational industry in Germany. Um, haven't talked about it in the Netherlands. It's going to come, right? I liked Boris's um, uh, earnings call. You know, he said this is like Cureleaf was back in 2017. You know, it's earlier stage. It's, it's going to be a little bit more opaque. A lot of people are going to be confused about the inter, uh, the various dynamics of, of, of Europe because they're different countries and different languages. But this is a really, really interesting opportunity. It's a chance to kind of, you know, catch that second wave of, of the cannabis industry's growth. Very good. Uh, Patrick, thank you for that. And, and thank you very I much. I love Kyle. that. Great to see you. Yeah.
Great. Tom, Kyle, thank you both so much. I really appreciate that. I'm glad I, I, I added time to that. That was a great answer, Kyle. So thank you, man. Gives us a little look into the future here. So fellas, thank you. We'll see you both again soon, I'm sure. And I'm sure we'll be following you. If, if there are questions in the chat, I'll get them both to you separately. So thanks. All right, my friends, moving onward, uh, we're going to welcome back Dr. Joseph Tucker, the CEO of Magic Med Industries. Magic Med Industries, of course, they do have an application in, uh, I'll let Dr. Tucker remind me, I think it's MGIC that will be the ticker, uh, not quite there yet, correct? Right, that's the ticker we have reserved, yes. Awesome. Awesome, Dr. Tucker. I'll let you take it away, my friend, and I'll be back. Excellent. Thank you. I'll jump straight to my presentation here. There we are. Excellent. Excellent. So hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see you again a few minutes later. Uh, I am Dr. Joseph Tucker, the CEO of Magic Med Industries. I'm uh, looking forward to telling you about uh, Magic Med. And, you know, we've heard a bit about the psychedelic space, uh, which really, you know, I think of it, you know, it's, it's easy to say psychedelic space, but really it's, this is a, a medical space, a psychedelic medicine. It's really about, it's really about focusing in on mental health. And I would say, you know, this is much more of a pharma space, a, a natural pharma space than cannabis ever was. So, you know, let's just take a look very quickly at some numbers here, right? Uh, on, on the mental health side, you know, some, some quick numbers, more than 250 billion is spent a year on North, in North America. Now that's, you know, the various different types of modalities psychotherapy, psychology, pharmacology that are used, but still it's a very, very large, you know, physical number. It's a large, it's a large dollar figure, but you know, it's, it's much more personal than that, right? And um, some more numbers on the slide here, one in five Canadians in any particular year will have, and I don't think it's just Canadians, by the way, um, will, will be experiencing some kind of a mental health challenge. And certainly I think all of us either in our life at some point, or if not ourselves, the friend, family member, very close to us, you know, it's very ubiquitous, very prevalent. And, and the, you know, the most disheartening statistic in all of it is that if you survey the people that are experiencing, experiencing such a challenge, more than half of them will tell you that what they're being treated with right now, the approach they're taking right now is insufficient. So there's, you know, there's a big need here, dollar size. And if you, if you wanna think about the dollars, you know, here's some numbers on the on this slide. You know, we've heard earlier today about this new paradigm that psychedelics is presenting, and it, it's very exciting. It's, you know, on the on the drug side, it's probably at least a fifty billion dollar market. We have to remember those numbers really are coming from, really they're coming from the the classic, the traditional paradigm of putting pills in a bottle and sending them home with a patient, and having the patient able to because there aren't a lot of side effects to be concerned about, the patient is able to self-administer, self-manage without completely disrupting their life. But when you look at the psychedelic sector right now, we're still really in, I would say, what I call the Gen 1, which is you know, the classic psychedelics, the, the LSD, the MDMA, the psilocybin, those classic psychedelics are being administered and, and some pretty exciting um, clinical trials going on right now, for sure, no question. But these require an in-clinic administration. They require you to come in to a specialized facility, have a, a companion psychotherapy session along with it, and really and control your set and setting so that you don't have a bad trip. And I, and I think that you know we would all recognize that as as compelling as those are, there's probably going to be a significant patient population that doesn't want to have that kind of experience that would be more comfortable. And not just the patients, by the way, but the doctors, you know, the prescribing physicians, the, the regulatory agencies are going to be more comfortable with that traditional, that traditional method of giving you a pill that doesn't cause such, such intense side effects that you need to take it in an in-clinic setting. So I think there's, there's definitely, a, and, and I guess I would call that the, the Gen 2, right? So, so how do you get to Gen 2? You can't do it with the molecules that you have right now you need to improve them. You need to modify them and change them into better, different drugs with different activities. And that's what Magic Med is totally focused on. We're totally focused on making the Gen 2 molecules. In order to do that, we have to bring technology to bear that, that really doesn't exist. It hasn't existed prior to that. Because of that, we work very closely with some academic institutions 
in particular the University of Calgary, where we have faculty of medicine, biology, chemistry, relationships that are all coming together. So let me just try to explain really quickly. I don't want to get all technical here, but it's important to understand what's going on. You know, when you, when you usually when you start with a molecule, say your classic psychedelic like psilocybin, and you want to modify it, generally big pharma will go to chemistry technology they use for 200 years. Ultimately, though, tech, you know, chemistry can only go so far until you run into reactions that are basically too difficult to do. And so you need to you need a new tool. And so that's what we're doing at MagicMed is we're bringing to bear, in addition to chemistry, we're bringing a new tool to bear, synthetic biology. So it's a big word. You probably heard it a few times at a few places. But in this context, the easy way to think about it is Look, life is life is a bunch of chemical reactions. When when Mother Nature runs into a chemical reaction that's challenging, Mother Nature doesn't get to throw up her hands and say, "I can't do it." She needs to solve it. You know, think of a piece of DNA. That's that's a really complicated chemical that you had to make. Nature had to make it and had to make it cheap and fast and all day long and every day. And so nature's come up with a thing called enzymes. Enzymes do difficult chemical reactions. So that's what we're doing at Magic Med. We're taking enzymes, we're combining them with chemistry, and together we're making many, many, many thousands of new molecules that you could never make before, that you, you couldn't make from chemistry, and nature never bothered to make. And we're putting that together in that portfolio of new molecules, of Gen 2 molecules, we call the Cybrate. So I just wanna try to explain, you, you know, the, the, the average person on the street doesn't really understand and you know why should they exactly what this what this means so a metaphor that i like to use when we're talking about creating new drugs is think about a drug as a key and every every indication has a receptor that you need to fit or you know, call it a lock that you need to fit that key in and so that drug it needs to be needs to be exactly the right shape just to fit in the lock you know the key to fit in the lock and then you need to have exactly the right teeth in order to be able to turn the key in the lock and get the outcome you're looking for. So in the psychedelic medicine space, you know, an example of that, say, key blank would be tryptamine, which is that molecule you see on the right-hand side. Tryptamine is the core molecule in psilocybin, in DMT, in a number of psychedelics. And the teeth are these little decorations that you can change on the outside of that core, that core key. So when you modify those, you can because you can make, you know, just like a key, you can make so many different uh, variations, you can make almost an unlimited number of possible keys. So when you get it right, when you dial it in perfectly, you can get that key to perfectly fit in the receptor, perfectly fit in the lock, and get the outcome you're looking for, which is exactly the right outcome with, say, reduced side effects, uh, increased potency, whatever it is you're looking for in a particular clinical indication. So at Magic Med, we think we've really kind of solved the first big issue, which, you know, frankly, the Gen 1 companies all have to, to struggle with, is they've got a handful, literally five or six molecules bequeathed to them by Nature or, or Albert Hoffman. Uh, you've got a small number of molecules that you're trying to, you know, open these different locks with. And we said, no, 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 you need a huge pile of keys. You need a huge pile of potential drug candidates to make sure you get exactly the right one for every indication. So Cybrary is we started with that, that tryptamine. We've moved on to mescaline, ibogaine, LSD. These are our core key blanks. And we're making literally, you know, we've made hundreds, hundreds and thousands of these molecules. We filed many patents so far and our patents cover literally more than a hundred million possible drugs, more than a hundred million possible keys to fit these locks. So, you know, we think we've solved the first problem, you know, good for us. We Now we've got this pile of keys and within that pile of keys is likely to be exactly the drug we're looking for. But in a way we outsmarted ourselves a little bit because when you can make a hundred million possible drugs, how do you screen them all? It takes that's, that's a lot of effort. And so we've had to come up with a new technology, the second part of our technology in order to pull out and think about this, for each mental health indication within the psychedelic medicine sector, you think there's gonna be a different ideal drug, a different ideal key. 
So how do you pull that one out? So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, proud to announce that we've recently launched the, the second half of our platform, which is like the Cyberry, we call this Sci AI, standing for Psychedelics Artificial Intelligence. Very clever, I know, but we started with that. So what we're doing is we start with the Cyberry, that big pile of keys, if you will, and we do something that no one's been able to do before. No one's been able to do this because nobody had hundreds and thousands of variants to work with of, of new keys. So we test all of these molecules in, well, not all of them, but hundreds of them in parallel across all the different serotonin, the different 5-HT receptors, a whole variety of things, animal models. And we gather this, we gather this data, which again, no one's been able to generate before and plug it into our own artificial intelligence tool that we're building. That allows us to ask some questions that you could never ask before. When you change a certain structure on a molecule, a decoration on a key, a tooth, a tooth on a key, what's the effect? You know, what's the next question? What are the best changes to make to get better effects or turn that around and say, if I wanted the ideal drug for a certain indication, a certain disease, what should I make the molecule look like? So you ask that question of your AI, you go back and you make some more molecules and you test it again and you ask the question again. And you can see that if you just do a few iterations where you're testing a few hundred or a few thousand each time, very quickly what you're going to do is it'll be as if you'll get the same answer as if you tested all 100 million molecules, but you've really only tested a few hundred or a few thousand. And we think by doing that, we're going to be able to design that Gen 2 molecule, that ideal drug for each of these different indications in the mental health sector and, and, and have that perfect drug for each, each different indication. So there's one, more, there's one more real benefit that you get in the pharmaceutical sector with the right artificial intelligence. And that is once you've designed these molecules and you've learned a lot of information about how they work, you're actually able to be predictive on how that drug is going to work in animal systems, in the human body, is it going to be toxic? What are the side effects going to be? And because you're able to predict that, you're able to cut out a lot of testing that you would otherwise need to do. And that allows you to save a lot of time and a lot of money and really de-risk each drug and move it much more rapidly and much more successfully through clinical trials. So you probably figured out here is that, you know, this combination of the Cyberry and the Sci AI, we think is gonna end up creating far more high value you know, Gen 2 psychedelic medicine drug candidates than we can possibly you know, efficiently move forward through clinical trials on our own. And, and we think that would, be, that would be tragic if we created 50 great drugs, but we only had the bandwidth to move forward one or two. So we have a, a different business model as a result. We don't want that to happen. So our business model is actually to license out these molecules to as many different partners as possible, as early as possible. We really think it's going to enable the whole industry and, and that's what we want to do. So when we do that, when we license out these molecules to as many partners as possible, as early as possible, a few things happen as a result of that. So, so one of them is unlike your, your typical biotech company, your typical drug development company, we don't need to raise hundreds of millions of dollars to take a drug through clinical trials. That's what the partners do. Another thing that falls out of this is the many shots on goal. Rather than have you know, the entire company the, the betting, betting everything on one or two molecules, you know, when anything can happen, we have multiple shots on goal. We have multiple molecules all running through the clinical trials with our partners. So a lot of risk reduction there. And then the third thing that happens is very interesting. Because we're partnering so early and we're working with our partners very early stage, with each one, we can tailor design, custom make the molecule they're looking for. So a company says, we're looking for something for OCD or we're looking for something for PTSD or we're looking for TBI. Um, we custom design the molecule and the testing for each one of those companies. 
And that enables us to charge the company because we're custom designing it just for them. That enables us to generate revenue in that R&D stage very early on, right at the beginning of our life cycle, which is very different from your typical biotech. Once that molecule with each individual partner is identified, this is a great molecule, we want to take it forward, then they license it, and then we start to receive milestone payments as it moves through clinical trials. And ultimately, we still stand to receive the royalties at the end. So three very different things about our business plan that, that come out of the Cyberry plus the Sci AI. So, you know, just briefly on the partners, as I mentioned, we kind of have, we kind of see two flavors really of partners here. There's the, the earlier stage biotech, uh, we call them internally, we call them development partners. Those, those companies that are happy to take a preclinical drug and take it through phase one and phase two, start into phase three. Um, and, and we think that's gonna be the bulk of our partners, at least for the first, um, first few years. But then down the road, the, you know, big pharma, big pharma is going to start to pay attention and big pharma, of course, you know, they're much more interested when you have a molecule in phase three or beyond. But the other thing that big pharma, you know, really has to have is when you've got, you know, an understanding that's, that's different from anybody else, that's, that's a head and shoulders above anybody else, that is, look, when you make this change to a drug candidate, say based on MDMA or psilocybin, you make that change, what's the outcome in a, in a patient, what's the physiological outcome in a patient in this particular indication? When you know that better than anybody else, and when you have the, the patents and the molecules themselves protected, that's the kind of thing that really gets a lot of attention from Big Pharma. So we think they'll be a little bit later, but we think we're gonna get some attention from them. Hi, Patrick, I see you. Hello, hello, um, Dr. Tucker. We have about a minute and a half left, my friend. Okay, no problem. Then I'll be very quick, thank you. Um, so on the team, there's myself, you see on the left, longtime uh, drug developer, been a CEO of biotech companies, because really this is all about drug development, been a CEO for most of the last 20 years and taken two companies public prior to this. Uh, but I've been working for the last eight years with Dr. Jill Hagel and Dr. Peter Ficini, exactly in this, this vein, exactly doing this kind of thing, under contract, working for other companies, creating new molecules using synthetic biology, and based on scheduled drugs from plants. So opiates, amphetamines, cannabinoids, our cannabinoid business, you may have heard of, we took public uh, Willow Biosciences two years ago. And now uh, in Magic Med, it's really just a continuation of the same thing, the, the class in the psychedelics. So maybe with that, Patrick, I do wanna be respectful of the amount of time we have left. Why don't I just stop right here and see if there's, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Awesome. So I know the one of the major ones was the business model, right? Especially with the addition of the Psi AI. I hope I'm saying that right, the Psi AI. Um, one of the most interesting things to me about that, and we've talked about this over the last day and a half of this conference, the addition of AI to the drug development process, right? And what that means for sustainability, cost reduction, speeding up the timeline, right? Which obviously we have a lot of investors on here and they care about catalysts. They care about, you know, what, what, what they can actually bank on in terms of real news and announcements, right? So waiting several years to, to have an announcement is, is, you have to be patient, right? So with Sci AI, the question that I have is, are you also licensing that out as a platform to these potential partners, the biotechs, the, the big pharma folks, or is it all internal? Uh, and of course, it's the molecules that you're licensing out inevitably. Yeah, so it, it is the molecules that we're licensing out, but the companies, the partners, they do get to benefit from the Psi AI. On the first hand, there is, you know, the, the much more rapid screening of all these exciting molecules to, you know, pick through 100 million possibilities to get to that ideal drug as soon as possible. But on the other hand, there's also the early part of clinical development, the preclinical part, which can take several years. And by mm -hmm. using Psi AI, on their behalf, we can really expedite that as well. So they, they totally stand to benefit from that um, as well by working with us. Awesome. Well, well, I'm afraid we're out of time, but I do have more questions. I'll send them to you directly uh, and we'll get some responses to our investors here. But thank you, Dr. Tucker. Always good to see you. Yeah, great to see you, Patrick. Thanks very much. All right. All right. Moving forward, my friends, we've got Timothy Coe joining us again, the CEO of Entheon 
Biomedical. Again, that ticker is ENTBF, ENTBF, or ENBI if you are in Canada on the CSE. Uh, Tim, welcome back. Wonderful. Uh, good to be back. I had time to eat a banana, so uh, refueled. <laughs> Here I am. Good, good, good. Well, I'll let you jump right into it, and, and maybe we'll have some questions at the end of this. Perfect. Okay, I will share my screen. Da, da, da. Give me one moment. Sure. All right. Wonderful. Okay, okay. Just want to make sure that works. Nope. Oh. I should have done this before. <clears throat> oh, okay, awesome. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, no, absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak here and just, uh, yeah, super fascinating stuff with uh, Dr. Joseph Tucker. And I think it really does um, you sort of highlight um, a sort of philosophy that's developing with us, too, where, you know, of course, you know, as the psychedelic industry uh, begins to expand, there are, I guess, renaissance moments that are targeted more towards. Um, ensuring that patients that are, you know, taking that brave step of getting help uh, do have the best molecules and the best treatment processes for uh, their, you know, maximizing the potential benefit of these uh, types of um, efforts. And so, you know, awesome. Um, so, yeah, Entheon, we're trying to usher in a new dimension in addiction treatment. Um, my apologies here. My slide is not working great. Oh. Okay, awesome. So yeah, just to give um, some framing to um, the scope of the problem, uh, this is just one metric, but um, there's an estimated uh, cost of drug abuse in the US, uh, sort of US's uh, market that we're targeting, uh, that you know, due to drug addiction in a variety of forms, there's an estimated loss of $740 billion per year. Uh, it's a massive societal cost and it covers things like healthcare, uh, sort of um, policing, as well as um, yeah, things like crime and the cost of, uh, dealing with a variety of things and lost productivity. So the situation is quite dire. Um, and if we dive into it, you can see that, you know, even globally, the magnitude of the problem is absolutely something that needs addressing that isn't adequately being addressed right now. So approximately 2% of the world's population suffer from some form of addiction, uh, whether it's alcohol or illicit drugs. So when you look at that in the 2% of, you know, approximately 7 billion, approximately 140, a million people suffer from some form. Um, and annually, about 11.4 million people die prematurely as a result of alcohol, tobacco, and illicit drug use. Um, so it's quite a massive problem. Um, and so focusing in again on the US, 21.2 million people um, have a ongoing form of substance use disorder. And the real sad part about that is only one in 10 of those people receives any form of treatment. So already you see this sort of framing of this massive need that's being unmet. And then when you look one tier deeper in terms of the efficacy, you see that it's uh, even further diminished in terms of the effects of the types of interventions that are offered. So again, uh, just not wanting to belabor the point too much, but uh, in the US, uh, there are these, the numbers that represent the uh, loss of life due to these substance use disorders. Um, and that's just one metric, um, you know, before a person becomes a death statistic, uh, they could live, you know, years, if not decades of, you know, suffering in silence and, you know, uh, having their families also suffer. So a high number of instances, so a large market opportunity as well as a large market need. Um, and then we dive into this, the actual percentage of people that receives any form of treatment um, with alcohol and opiates. Um, you see that it's not the entirety of people. And there are some questions around access that need to be addressed. Um, and so again, the economic impact is massive and it doesn't take into account the true cost of the human impact as well. But then we dive into some of the treatments that are available. Um, we see that a lot of the first line approaches really don't have the efficacy um, you know, warranted to even suggest that they should be frontline treatment. So residential treatment is often one of the types of things that are employed in dealing with people that have substance disorder issues. And the costs are, uh, costs associated with that form of treatment are very high, anywhere ranging from five to $30,000 per stay. And when you see that it's paired to an efficacy rating in the long term of less than 5% in some cases, um, you know, you can start to form a picture about what the sort of cost implications are um, and is the case, as, as was the case um, in my instance where I, I lost a brother to drug addiction in March of 2019. Um, and over the course of, you know, many, or many years, uh, two decades, my brother was into 
approximately seven or eight different drug treatment centers. Um, and so, you know, uh, families are willing to pay anything because ultimately for us, um, you know, the threat of losing a loved one to something that uh, should be preventable is uh, something that we're generally willing to pay. And so uh, my brother also did experience a lot of these other things, uh, of smoking cessation less relevant, but 12 step treatment, um, as well as medication assistant therapies like, so, um, like uh, methadone and suboxone. Um, and yeah, there is some there is some efficacy with med, uh, medication assisted therapy, but um, in reality, it doesn't target these sort of underlying issues that uh, underpins the addiction behavior, um, and rather is just a replacement therapy that, uh, for the duration of my brother's addiction, required him to take uh, an opioid replacement on a daily basis. Um, and so, some of the complexity of dealing with these issues is that it isn't a simple diagnosis, it's actually quite complex and develops over a lifetime in a lot of cases and is modified by things like trauma. Um, so the removal of the substance, like in the case of methadone or suboxone, alone could not guarantee abstinence because ultimately if you remove the thing that they're using to medicate a sense of distress, um, then that person is in that existential place where they need some form of relief. And so uh, to really uh, alleviate them of the addiction, you do need to target that very complex milieu of psychological and emotional uh, things that constitute their belief system, uh, because it isn't purely habitual. Uh, ultimately, habit is formed from belief. Um, and so, yeah, the solutions must be targeted at that. And so that's precisely um, what we're trying to do. So Entheon is powered by an unwavering commitment to significantly, significantly improve the odds of beating addiction. Um, and so just a statement here, um, when it comes to treating addiction, the rate of success is very low and we've been conditioned to uh, accept and even expect failure. Um, and so what we're doing is uh, focusing on the power of uh, DMT to um, you know, uh, invert the existing expectations that we have around the addiction recovery ratio and to turn the untreatable case and the lost cause uh, from the uh, norm to the exception. And the way that we're doing that is utilizing DMT. And so it's just as a for general background, DMT is a classic psychedelic. Um, it belongs in the same class as um, mescaline, LSD, and psilocybin. Uh, all operate on the 5-HT2A receptors. Um, and it is considered uh, one of the, if not the most classic, uh, powerful classic psychedelic. Um, so historical background, which I've touched on already, you know, centuries of use in traditional medicine, uh, ayahuasca, it's been studied since the 1950s. It's present in hundreds of different uh, plant species, uh, and it's thought to be you know, produced by the human body, meaning it's endogenous, and that we have a very strong uh, system of metabolizing that uh, to very uh, you know a safe degree, meaning that uh, you know we can deal with it. Us as humans can deal with it quite well and clear it from our bodies. And the other really key component is that it's short acting, something that we're seeking to leverage uh, through our specific utilization of DMT. So generally DMT creates uh, a, a psychedelic effect, um, sometimes characterizes, you know, having very vivid visuals as well as somatic effects. Um, and that's really important. It's that it's not just a, a sort of cognitive, cognitive um, experience, but rather it does have some bodily effects such as uh, feelings of mild euphoria, um, and yeah, individuals generally experience a wide range of powerful emotions um, and have a tendency to have a deep clarity into one's own life and their, you know, their own uh, sort of narrative. Um, and so what that results in is the dismantling of deeply held beliefs um, and the, it's sort of breakthrough clarity, which in the case of addiction sufferers um, is very important as a lot of the psychotherapeutic interventions that are tried to, um, you know, are applied to an addiction sufferer uh, really do try to get into that, the motivations, what the barriers are, what the relationship mechanisms are. And so DMT creates that opportunity to really break through some of those high barriers that people have. And following that process, there is generally a gravitational pull towards the positive or the constructive. Um, and this is thought to be governed by something called the default mode network. So in super lay terms, the default mode network is essentially your um, your basic default programming. So in the unafflicted populations, uh, you know, most people wake up and they have a general sense of um, optimism or dread related to going to work, encountering certain coworkers, you know, sort of mundane events that are not deleterious to them. Uh, but in these case of um, addiction suffer, 
um, often those um, that default programming, you know, that res uh, it's uh, governing things like their belief system, their value, their ethics, uh, their reactions to life as well, their habits. Um, that foundation can often be, uh, you know, towards the negative, and they may wake with a sense of dread, uh, and they might view the world as a, a source of pain or distress that requires medicating. And so the way that DMT and other psychedelics disrupt that, um, I'd like to point everyone to this uh, often overused graphic, but if you look at the top right corner, the standard brain activity is sort of represented here in terms of the default mode network governing a default patterning, very well-worn grooves, not a ton of new connections and rather, you know, sort of autopilot setting. DMT when introduced uh, through process of entropy really does recruit a whole bunch of brain area enabling uh, you know thought to exist outside of those generally well-worn patterns and for the creation of new experiences and new memories um, so that unlocks the opportunity in that plastic state to really form new belief systems it's a hugely potential state in which to examine things that may have been partitioned off due to trauma um, so yeah psychedelics are very fascinating and really effective in facilitating that really profound foundational shift uh, things like ayahuasca, psilocybin, and LSD are great, but, but there are some scaling issues related to them uh, due to their long duration. Uh, due to that long duration, there are scaling issues in terms of uh, actual practi uh, practitioner utilization, as often um, it is difficult to hold more than one session per day because of the time engagement. Um, the other limitation of that time window is that during that time, if there is a negative adverse reaction due to the profound nature of the experience, there is no way to stop that experience and so there is the potential for traumatization or for you know having a person just having a very distressing uh, type of experience um, and again because most of these things are orally ingested um, there is no way to really precisely control the dose once that dose is taken there's no way to reduce the impact of that dose if it proves to be too high dmt on the other hand is a uh, much shorter duration, uh, the molecule itself on single dosage is 15 minutes, um, after which point you are functionally sober. Um, and so that provides the opportunity to have a, a more flexible patient uh, throughput uh, schedules, allowing physicians to potentially generate more revenue, but also giving greater access to individuals that are seeking this type of treatment. Um, and if the situation becomes too intense, it gives them the ability to, the physician, the ability to end the session as to avoid uh, traumatization and because this is intravenously administered if the dose is too high and we're creating uh, tools and technologies to monitor that experience if the dose is too high or not high enough there is the opportunity to modulate that dosage to arrive at that target specified dose or therapeutic range <clears throat> so the handgun treatment i just uh, basically touched on already it is a continuous infusion of dmt over the course of time um, it's administered within a medical context that is tightly monitored and controlled. Um, so that's the drug experience. But, you know, the psychedelic paradigm exists within a more holistic approach that has a longer uh, preparatory phase, ultimately trying to maximize the potential of the psychedelic itself, as well as a post-psychedelic integration phase. And so we like to break that up into those three, uh, three opportunities for which we're trying to develop tools that will service that. But you know, really importantly in the preparation, you know, establishing trust, uh, identifying belief systems, traumas, fears, values, and past. These subjective types of reportings, uh, we're trying to make more robust uh, with utilization of things like genetics and EEG to provide a empirical basis of assessment uh, that could be uh, later uh, utilized for post-patient or post-event post tracking. Of course, the infusion takes place within that controlled environment. We're developing tools to monitor that uh, that experience to uh, indicate the physician if that person is in a therapeutically useful state. And then following in the integration, um, it's really important to take the realizations and profundities and reincorporate that into the worldview so that your actual foundational belief systems can change significantly uh, to serve as the foundation for new behaviors. Um, and we're working on tools to uh, track that and keep people engaged in that. So this um, foundational reordering that is the basis of you know, curing an addiction, we think can be applied to a variety of addictions. So of course, nicotine cessation, opioid use disorder and alcoholism, um, some of the major 
um, I guess mortality or some of the major killers in society. But we also see that uh, things derived of motivations and beliefs um, can also be treated uh, in the world of process addictions and behavioral addictions like food, gambling, and sex, um, as well as other mental health indications. Um, and so we see the opportunity for DMT to be expanded uh, beyond just uh, addiction. So of course we need to enter this into a rigorous clinical uh, trials framework, ultimately with the uh, hopes of uh, presenting to regulators. And so a general overview about uh, some of the immediate plans that we have, clinical trial uh, scheduled for Q4 of this year, as well as preclinical in, uh, in Israel, and then following that uh, follow-on studies uh, specific to different indications, alcohol and opiate use disorder, um, following the successful trials of the safety trial uh, happening in Q4 of this year. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we understand that the psychedelic patient journey is not an isolated event. It's not tied directly or exclusively to the drug event, but rather it is um, a, a, a holistic process. So we're developing tools to support all stages of the patient journey, uh, ultimately to increase safety, uh, deliver more precise dosing, and to personalize therapies uh, to deal with these non-monolithic populations because each individual is very unique. And so we need to determine tools that could uniquely assist those patients. Um, so for each of these uh, epochs of the treatment process, we're developing patient-centric and personalized systems of psychedelic medicine. In the preparation phase, uh, we're developing clinical tools to optimize the prescriptive uh, decision-making. So utilizing genetic biomarkers as well as EEG-based biomarkers to uh, really take a meaningful snapshot on the basis of data. Uh, intra experience, uh, we're working on the development of specific uh, drug drug models to uh, pull apart the therapeutic components of that and give physicians the ability to understand if the person was is within that target specified range of therapeutic uh, drug usage. And for the post therapy, um, on that basis of EEG, uh, tracking a person's state change over time from pre therapy to post therapy, and giving them a means of staying engaged with the wellness process. Um, so yeah, all of these things are combining into what we're working titling uh, the Amphion Intelligence Platform, which is a highly individualized diagnostic patient monitoring system that ventures to enhance safety and optimize outcomes at all stages of the patient journey. Um, to service this, we've made some recent acquisitions and partnerships. So Halogen Life Sciences recently acquired and the genetic space, creating uh, genetic uh, pre-screening tests to check for sensitivities as well as um, oh, I'm getting, uh, do I have a time warning? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to give you another minute or so since we started a little bit late, but go, go right gotcha. ahead. Gotcha. Okay. So um, in the genetic space, just seeing for um, individual variances in receptivity to certain drug classes. And this is signaling uh, some of our ambitions outside of just the DMT space. Uh, we ultimately want to provide tools that service the sort of uh, therapeutic infrastructure network as it's developing. So uh, developing a genetic basis to assess whether a person is more uh, appropriate to take ketamine versus psilocybin or other serotonergics. So working at identifying risk factors there. Uh, divergence, AI-based uh, predictive platform using EEG to determine a person's starting point across a phenotype model um, and also drug-based analysis to determine uh, sort of experience models to ensure that a person has a, a a data-focused data, uh, data uh, snapshot of uh, what the starting points are and the individual variances are. And then we recently invested into Having Health, a uh, great team there, uh, very smart people, Steve Levine, board member of Compass Pathways. Um, and yeah, we're working on some research projects there to validate the technology and ultimately, hopefully, have the honor of providing some uh, prescriptive diagnostic tools uh, to them to utilize in their ketamine practice. Um, team, bunch of cool people. Uh, very accomplished, big pharma, uh, real, real uh, sort of public markets experience, and the scientific advisory board, all star, uh, all star cast of players, and I think a lot of those names are very familiar to your viewers. And yeah, the sector is expected to grow quite rapidly, and these are some basic financials about uh, yeah when we started trading and uh, how many shares we have out there. Well, Tim, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And while we don't have time for questions, I, I do want to say that I'm, I'm sure we all have uh, a, a story not quite similar to yours, but close, where we've known someone who has had uh, either a struggle with addiction or has even lost their life to it. So um, obviously, I want to commend you for the work that you've done. Um, and especially, uh, you know, 
with with tragedy being uh, at the at the cornerstone of it. But I'm I'm sure your your brother would be proud of you uh, in, in terms of what you built in on his behalf. So thanks for joining us, man. Um, and those of you, I hope you're taking note. E N T B F and the work that they're doing. I'm sure that this is not the last time we'll be hearing from you, Tim. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. All right, my friends, one more to go. One more to go. Psy Biotherapeutics. Evan Levine, the CEO, is coming on to chat with us. The ticker here is PSYB. PSYB. Um, I, th I think that's the TSX ticker there. Um, we'll ask Evan here in a second. But hello. How are you? There I am. Hey, yeah. Patrick. Good to How's see it going? you. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Good to see you, my friend. Did I get the ticker correct? Uh, PSYB, we just listed on the Toronto Venture. Uh, today is our one month anniversary. Congratulations. All right. Well, I'll let you get into it. And maybe we'll have some questions for you in a second. Sure. Let me share my screen. Reminder, you folks in the chat, we are giving away some some uh, swag and I think a Benzinga Pro membership for questions asked. So please do throw those in there. And Evan, I'll let you get to it. Great. Thanks, Patrick. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, hosting me today. Very much appreciated. I'm Evan Levine. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Cybiotherapeutics. Uh, we are newly listed on the TX. At, uh, Toronto Venture Exchange, uh, recently under PSYB. We are really excited about that accomplishment. Um, we are working in the psychedelic space. However, we do go out of our way to demonstrate that uh, the psychedelic space is now encompassing myriad players doing different types of businesses. We're a drug development company. So we are a pure play biotechnology company that's developing these targeted psychoactive medications for neuropsychiatric issues and other neurological issues. Uh, before I jump into it, I'd like to refer you to our safe harbor statement. Uh, we are public now. I will be making forward-looking statements, so I caution you to review the, uh, the data on the screen. So to set the stage, I'll introduce myself first. Uh, Evan Levine, I've been working in on the periphery or directly in drug development most of my career. Start off in investment banking, doing uh, transactions within the biotechnology and technology space. And I morphed into portfolio management where I ran a half a billion dollars of uh, strategic money that was dedicated to investing directly in biotechnology and technology companies there. So I'd gone from a transaction based career to actually really understanding deep due diligence. And we had a team of PhDs and MDs that were working for me at this private equity firm doing very robust due diligence on the company that we we're investing in. We were a long only fund and we were for the long term. So understanding, you know, more than the transaction and the longevity and milestones of a company became expertise to me. Then when I sold my uh, my position out of the private equity company, I bought out an insolvent biotechnology company down in San Diego called Adventurex Pharmaceuticals. And there I did a full capital restructuring of it. Uh, I brought in my capital markets expertise. I, I replaced the management team. I put in a new board of directors, a venerated gentlemen that I had known that were public company CFO uh, industry uh, related entities that helped me reorganize the company. And together we built the company. I got in a very low valuation. I took it off the OTC, got it uplisted onto the American Stock Exchange. Uh, raised over $80 million while I was uh, CEO of that company for seven years, including a $20 million round led by Carl Icahn. Um, and we were covered by multiple institutional analysts who made a high tick of over half a billion dollars. However, more importantly, what I took away from that after being CEO of that company for seven years was started off bringing my you know, financial expertise to it for the restructuring and rebuilding. But for seven years, I've actually run, I've run phase three studies in the United States. I've run phase two B studies in Europe. I've run bioequivalence pharmacokinetic studies down in uh, South America. So I have extensive experience of hands-on drug development. Uh, I've worked extensively with the uh, Food and Drug Administration as well as the EMA. So I bring to this company a whole portfolio of skill sets and able to take advantage of this new paradigm uh, shift that we're working in in the treatment of mental illness. So uh, back in 2019, uh, young and young faculty member at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, he got published in journal Metabolic Engineering on a way that he devised to turn genetically modified bacteria into psilocybin. 
uh, we, we did a transaction with the university and our company, Side Biotherapeutics, in collaboration, built this company around this discovery that was made at Miami University. So together we built this company and Dr. Jones, the inventor, has created this platform technology. It started off with psilocybin, where Dr. Jones was able to take a recombinant host and convert it very efficiently into psilocybin, far more efficient than any other published methods. Um, from there, we took this to a platform technology where psilocybin for us is really just the first inning of Cybio. We're working in psilocybin, we're working in its intermediates, and we're working in a whole host of other um, plants, fungi, and non-natural products. So just the beginning, but the, the invention was very important and we had noticed it along with many other groups. Uh, well, after Dr. Jones was published, uh, he won 35 under 35 for American Institute of Chemical Engineers. Now, not a small organization. It's in over 110 countries with over 60,000 members. And this article was reprinted in over 60 publications. So there was a lot of international claim that went along with this discovery. It really was a research first. Nobody in history had ever been able to use a prokaryotic host and uh, result very efficiently in psilocybin. So our story is really threefold. Um, we are developing these drugs with the intention of putting into the clinic, with the intention of getting approved by healthcare regulatory bodies in conjunction with psycholytic therapy. So as I described, psilocybin really is the first inning for us. We have a very efficient patent pending methodology that we can create psilocybin. But part two is that we're working with the magic mushroom as a whole. We're studying these other analogs within this magic mushroom and they agonize in each other. And we're studying the different ratios and properties in order to make far more improved therapeutics with different properties and characteristics. So as far as we could see from the landscape right now, we're really um, one of the only groups that I could see that's actually working on developing drugs to take advantage of this entourage effect that we probably all know from cannabis, but exists in these other plants and fungi as well. Uh, with psilocybin, our, our value proposition here is we can make this far cheaper, far faster, far greener. It's our proprietary methodology to do this than any other published methods that we are aware of. So key investment highlights, we're building a whole portfolio of tryptamines and thelamines, uh, natural products, non-natural products, combinations. We have multiple patents that we file. We, um, I'll, I'll go through that. Uh, we filed on compositions of matter. We filed on methods to produce. We have multiple shots on goal. We have 20 people working up at Miami University in the chemical engineering departments and psychology departments, optimizing these techniques and finding improved strains. Uh, with psilocybin and these other derivatives, we have a protected cost advantage in, in an area that's clearly uh, resurging in, in as far as a research focus as we're all here today. Uh, multiple patents pending and we're constantly filing new intellectual property. But the whole point of this is to put these products into the clinic and we're targeting the clinic in 2022. We have a highly experienced team led by myself um, in drug development, capital markets, um, manufacturing, and we're taking advantage of all of that in order to build out Cybio Therapeutics. We're well capitalized. We just went out and uh, became public one month ago. We we're in it. Um, it was an oversubscribed round and we're now public on the uh, TSXV. And we are going to be looking at, at also in Germany. We're uh, now trading. So three parts, drug development, drug discovery, which goes on in our laboratories up in uh, Miami University, process development, manufacturing, which uh, we have now contracted out and two of our molecules are now in um, and in, now in contract manufacturing. And the goal is to put these in the clinic and that is slated for 2022. But specifically with psilocybin, why this invention is important and why the discovery of Dr. Jones being able to use genetically modified bacteria in order to result in psilocybin, just it's far more efficient than any process that's published that we're aware of. In the clinic right now, um, what is being used to dose psilocybin is a chemical synthetic. And it's a very expensive, arduous, difficult um, process to in, in, in order to result in the final metabolite. It takes five to 15 days. It's a long reaction time. You have multiple unstable intermediates there. You've got um, heavy metal catalysts that go into its solvents, reagents, so you have waste disposal issues. Uh, although this is the standard right now in psilocybin production. 
There's other groups out there that are studying in yeast. Yeast is certainly a, a valuable substrate to do it in. It will work. It's just that we're demonstrating that our titers are far higher than any yeast synthesis. And there's also groups, you know, with natural mushroom production and looking to do extraction. That's also a methodology to uh, result in psilocybin. We feel it's far more arduous, far more expensive. Uh, within batches of mushrooms, you get a tenfold variations within the same crop. Uh, you have all kinds of, you're, you're subject to force majeure, and, and it's actually very expensive and takes a long time to grow. With our method of producing psilocybin, environmentally friendly, it's GMP, we're making pharmaceutical grade psilocybin, it's extraordinarily uh, you know, highly stable. So in multiple temperatures, this has been tested. So thermal stability on our product is superior and it's extraordinarily inexpensive and efficient to make. We do this with an expression vector, introducing genetics into recombinant host and two to four days and a one pot autocatalytic process, it results in extracellular psilocybin. So it is far, it's a fraction of the cost of the chemical synthesis as far as published methods. But with psilocybin, as I demonstrated, this is the first inning for Cybio. We're also working with Norbeocystin, Beocystin, Aragonacin within the magic mushroom. And we're looking to optimize these ratios and make improved therapeutics. Not just working magic mushrooms, we're working in DMT as well. And it's analogs, NMT, TMT, 5-MeO DMT. You know, we're working all these areas and doing the same type of scientific discovery to make improved molecules off of these natural products. And we have undisclosed products we're working on. We're working on non-natural tryptamine derivatives as well by um, introducing different functional groups onto the molecules to, uh, to modulate their properties and characteristics. Uh, this is a very small snippet of data because we have this out for publishing right now. So it's just, this is basically just an aliquot of what we're going to introduce to the public in the short term. We're looking at these intermediates immediately in the magic mushroom because we feel that these analogs do have therapeutic properties, not necessarily on their own. And nobody really knows much about them because the study in them is really scant. At Cybiotherapeutics, we are studying these analogs and we're studying them in combination to see how we could more mimic the entourage of effect of mushroom and really adjust the cadence of the outcome of this uh, of the hallucinogenic experience. So what I'm showing you here is a small sample of our data with Norbeocystin. Norbeocystin in, in a magic mushroom, psilocybin is approximately 2% plus or minus somewhere in that area of the biomass of a magic mushroom. These other elements, aragonacin, biocystin, or biocystin are a small fraction of that. So an extraction method really would not be applicable to wanting to produce these type of materials. What we've done in this basic experiment here is we've taken norbeocystin alone, psilocybin alone, we've tested them in our rat models, and we show that in combining doses, which is a dramatic reduction of the amount of psilocybin, a dramatic increase amount of norbeocystin, we have a far more profound head twitch response, locomotion response, and it, which is leading us to believe that we have a far more efficacious opportunity by combining these. Now, over the coming months, we have a relationship with the psychology department, also Miami University. So we have our own pretty much dedicated vivarium to do these rat studies. So we could do dozens and dozens of studies on this type of optimization. And again, the point is to be putting this into the clinic in 2022. So at SideBio, we're engaging in new drug discovery in our laboratories, and we're expanding into Southern Florida and commercial laboratories as well. I've just demonstrated some very basic head twitch response data, which we filed um, multiple patents on, composition of matter on all of these different combinations and ratios. Uh, what we've done next is we moved into process development and tech transfer on two of our molecules. We're continuing to do uh, animal antidepressant efficacy testing and anxiolytic efficacy testing as well. And we're working on clinical candidate selection by the end of this year, in addition to psilocybin. As I said, along the way, we have filed uh, you know, five provisionals, one non-provisional now. We continue to constantly file new intellectual property as more and more data comes out of our laboratory and our uh, commercial manufacturing facilities. So we're, we're doing multiple activities at one time here. We've recently announced that we have hired Albany Molecular Research in upstate New York, their fermentation expertise, large contract manufacturer. There's over 3,000 employees in over 20 countries. Uh, they are scaling psilocybin for us commercially in that facility. 
We also just engaged uh, a division of the, of the Department of Energy and National Lab at Berkeley in California to start scaling our Norbeo system. So over the coming weeks and months, we're gonna be putting out a lot of information on how our scale manufacturing process is coming along. As well, uh, in sync, we're working on our IND development with the intention of having a pre-IND meeting uh, sometime in the next few months. We're working on our farm talks, we're working on our PKPD studies, and we're moving along in the manufacturing. Um, late last year, we engaged Eight Capital and Canaccord Genuity to raise, uh, raise additional funding for us to progress with our business plan. We set out to do a $5 million raise and we got subscriptions for over $17 million. These are Canadian dollars. We took 14.5 million of it. We now have $13 million of cash. 113 million shares outstanding. There's um, 11 million options warrants outstanding. And we uh, have about 42% institutional ownership. And that deal was about 75, 80% institutional, including some very strong um, you know, healthcare funds based in New York City. Again, our symbol on the Toronto venture is PSYB. Uh, we have a, this is just a small part of our team. Myself, I introduced Dr. Jones, the inventor. Dr. Matthew uh, McMurray does our neuropsychopharmacology in our animal testing up at Miami University. Dr. Joan Robbins does our translational research for us. We've worked together for many years. Joan was my right-hand person at Adventurix where we ran those phase three, phase two Bs and bioequivalent studies up around the globe. And we've, we've, we've hired consultants. We use essential regulatory consultants. We have farm talks and we have some new team members that will be coming on within the next few weeks to really build out our, uh, our strategy. Uh, I'm speaking quickly because I was given a very small amount of time here, but uh, my, my message here is that we believe we're dramatically undervalued compared to our peers. Um, again, we are, prime, we are a drug development company. We're biotechnology focused. We're not in any other service businesses. So there really are no perfect comps out there. Did my best here, but uh, hopefully I got it in. Thank you very much. And I'm open to questions, Patrick. Evan, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate that. Um, Just okay, so it, right? nailed it, nailed it. <laughs> Literally with 30 seconds left, you do really, really good job. Um, and I just have a couple of questions for you. So remind us the timing of these, uh, of sort of where you are in the clinical trials and and really in the near term. I know some of these things are going to stretch into 2022 and probably beyond, but but give me a sense of timing around around where you are right now. So in the near term, scaling psilocybin with all lean molecular, leading to clinical batches, scaling Norbeo cystin with Berkeley National Lab, leading to clinical batches. We are um, we are building our pre-IND package right now. We expect in the next few months we'll have our pre-IND meeting with the FDA. We're looking at we're looking at moving psilocybin forward as a monotherapy and the combination of these tryptamines as well. We haven't we've we've discussed cancer-related depression. We are following in the footsteps of giants. Compass is making it work. Usona is making it work. We are not going to exacerbate their protocols. We are going to follow in the footsteps because at the end of the day, psilocybin is psilocybin and nobody owns the natural molecule. So Compass owns their method of production on their chemical polymorph. We, own, we believe that we are highly protected in the bacterial synthesis space, that we filed enough intellectual property that nobody else will be able to use prokaryotic hosts in order to produce psilocybin, so we won't be interfered with there. And we hope by the end of this year, we'll be able to deliver this to the market. Um, after pre-ID meeting, we'll be making a lot of news on all of the optimization work going on in our laboratories. We'll be communicating to the markets on how our clinical protocol is shaping up, and we expect to be in the clinic in 2022. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. Clinical batches coming up this year, you guys. And then uh, sounds like you're hitting the market at some point soon. So we, we really appreciate that, Evan. Thank you so much. I'm sure there are other questions. I'll get them to you personally. And ideally, we can get our investors some answers. But this has been great. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks a bunch, Patrick. Have a good afternoon. Take, Take care. care, Evan. Bye -bye. All right. Evan Levine, again, from Psy Biotherapeutics. The, the ticker there, again, is PSYB on the Toronto Venture Exchange. My friends, thanks so much for joining me today. I am going to keep my closing remarks short. Please go to the other track. Please go to the other track. Right now, CTXR is presenting on the immunology and unmet medical needs track. Um, they'll, they'll be going for about another 15 or 20 minutes, and I'd love for all of you to catch that. So thanks for being here today. We covered a lot. 
Um, please reach out to events at benzinga.com with any questions, throw it in the chat, uh, and we'll be back to our regular scheduled programming tomorrow. Thanks very much, you guys. Have a great, great day.